Audiobook title, She Becomes a Passive Villainous Knot. Completed, by Halloween Godspell Part 02. This work belongs to author, Halloween Godspell. Kasimi, you are the crown prince of this empire. It's just acting as a tour guide. I'm sure Adira wouldn't mind. Although the king's words were a cause to be upset, Kasimi strangely didn't react to it and instead smiled. But she might. Father, you know how scary women are when they get jealous. I remember mother used to give you hell, right? Now, Kasimi's mother, the late empress of the empire, used to be the queen of the fairies. Their race were as secretive as they come and almost no one knew they existed. His mother, Celia, was a beauty above mere mortals even when she disguised herself as one. She was a first-class beauty that no one could match even within her race of rare beauties such as fairies, elves, and etc. And she hated humans above all else because of their cruelty and viciousness and well, human traits. And yet, she fell in love with one. A bastard as she calls him. Kasimi resembled Celia the most. He would most probably be what Celia would look like had she been a man. But Celia didn't have silver locks. Oh no. She had the most beautiful, silky and envy-worthy white golden locks that fell on her back like waterfalls. She was a cold icy beauty that captivated every man who laid eyes on her. But, Kasumi could only remember her motherly warmth that used to embrace and sing to him at night. Yes, your mother was indeed fierce and as bitter as the blizzard that paints the empire white. There was a small smile on Anastasia's aged face as he reminisced the times his wife would blow like an angry volcano whenever she was jealous. That anger was more mesmerizing than it was scary. But, of course, it was a hell lot scary. It was another story Kasimi will yet to tell. Adira will understand, my son. I'll talk to her. No, father. I'll be the one to tell my wife. He shamelessly claimed her as his with a very proud smile and bowed slightly as he excused himself. It's just being a tour guide. What can go wrong, right? A princess's escort? Are you kidding me? You think I'll just go ahead and say okay? I'm not a Saint Casimi. Adira angrily cried and stood indignantly while pacing around the room. Heisa, who watched the vexation his father caused his mother, also angrily growled at him. Well, for better or for worse, he was always on his mother's side. And one who angers his mother can only be an enemy in his eyes. No matter who it is. Adira, I'm only showing her around. You can also come if you want. And what? Show to everyone how I don't trust my prince and must monitor him 24-7. Casey, that princess is beautiful. And you are more. And she's a princess. Yes, and you are mine. Casey, what if she falls for you and you to her? What about me? Kasumi wanted nothing but Adira's heart. All his life, it was the only thing he wanted and he isn't as stupid as to exchange it for something that doesn't mean much to him. I mean, why would he let go of something he spent every ounce of his effort, patience, time and schemes just to tie her to him? He took her into his embrace and planted a kiss on her head. They stayed like that, silently, until Kasumi felt Adira relax in his arms and wrapped her arms around him in return. Why would I exchange this for something else? I have the most perfect and the only woman I want in my arms. Why would I look for more when I have the best? I'm a little lazy climbing out of this hole I created when I fell for you. So, I think I'll pass on that thought. Adira's rising temperature finally settled down as her hold on Kasumi tightened. She felt very threatened for the first time and she was panicking so much. This news came too suddenly it practically fell like a bomb. However, her fear wasn't just baseless jealousy, you know? Because from her past life, this particular princess actually came as close as being the one who actually got engaged to the first prince of the empire. The first princess of the Alinthi kingdom, northward of the Vesilis empire. Theorosalva bearer Alinthi widely known as the Winter's Rose, was a very beautiful and kind princess. The kind you would usually automatically categorize as the heroine of the story. Their kingdom, although experiencing winter almost all year round, was very prosperous and strong despite the unfavorable climate. Adira wasn't exactly sure when it happened, but this princess fell for the first prince, Prince Kasumi. 
and they got engaged. It was actually circulated around and although Adira could care less, it eventually reached her ears. It was also rumored that this princess originally came as a tribute to the empire and a means for her kingdom to further solidify their power through marriage. And the prince, also known to be uncaring and unmoving, didn't bother arguing nor rejecting the proposal. He let them decide his fate. His coldness was what captured this princess and she pursued him fervently. Until eventually, they got engaged. And everything started when the first prince agreed to be the princess's escort. She really is coming, huh? I admit I've been secretly hoping that she wouldn't since Casimir's bethroated was agreed to be me and so they will not entertain further talks of marriage with another kingdom. Can I even beat this winter's rose in terms of beauty? Or gracefulness? Do I have to marry Casey right now so he doesn't get stolen from me? Should I? Adira? What are you thinking? Kasumi snapped her out of her ridiculous thoughts as soon as he noticed the frown forming on her pretty little face and she whined while nuzzling against Kasumi's embrace. Case is gonna be stolen by some pretty princess and here I am practically offering him to her. I'm dying, okay? Gosh! Why are you threatened by some nameless princess? Cause she's pretty Kasumi. I'm sure of it. She's as pretty as those untouchable lilies at the edges of the cliff where no one could taint them. But I love the lilies that seem poisonous yet still brightly glows and blooms with the summer sun. Then if I tell you to marry me right here, right now, would you? With all due pleasure, my lady. Kasumi broke out into a grin after hearing Adira's suggestion born out of panic and invidiousness. It was weird but Kasumi felt she was still beautiful even when she's practically seconds away from incinerating everything within her line of sight. Is that normal? Notes. Kasumi's mother's name is pronounced as Kalia. Just to have a uniform pronunciation. Bother only me. Adira sighed before letting herself melt in Kasumi's embrace, finally letting his words penetrate her heart and calm the heck down. Any more and she might just burn a scar in him. Upon remembering her fire, Adira pushed herself out of Kasumi's arms in a newly formed panic and immediately checked him for burns. She had been too much of a green-eyed monster she forgot that she wasn't controlling her spiking temperatures all that well ever since that drugging incident. Kasumi, feeling greatly disturbed with Adira harshly pushing herself out of his embrace, studied her as she flustered about him, checking and searching for something on his body. What's wrong? I, I'm sorry. Did I perhaps burn you? I haven't been able to properly control my temperature lately so there are times when I unintentionally char something. Did I hurt you? Did I burn you? Speak Kasumi. Answer me. Stop staring at me. She panicked. Kasumi couldn't help himself when she shows him how worried she is about him while practically sitting on his lap and pecked her softly on her lips. He had pulled her to sit on him amidst the confusion and her tirade of complaints about how she was inferior to this princess he hasn't seen nor known. And she hasn't even noticed it yet. Well, not until now. Adira immediately stood up and burned bright red before running towards Hysa and hiding under his wings. Kasumi approached them but Hysa blocked him with his other wing. Hysa, I'm not gonna hurt your mother. I'm just gonna check on her. Please don't. Adira abashedly answered in a high-pitched voice and cleared her throat a few times before adding, Let me just, um, collect myself. Are you okay? Yes. Yes, I am. Heiss is the only one that can contain my heat so give me just a few seconds and I'll be fine. Ah. Is she worried I might get hurt? Let me through, Heissa. I won't hurt your mother and she won't hurt me. Kasumi reassured his son before the latter reluctantly retracted his wing and let him get close to the other. Kasumi pried his wing open to find his adorable little wife, sitting while trying to hide her red face and contain her overheating. He smiled before helping her up and into his arms again. He'll only ever be comfortable and relaxed when she's encased in his embrace. So it wasn't really only for Adira, but also for himself. It's fine. Your fire doesn't hurt me. It never will. I'm sorry. I haven't been controlling it properly lately which made me very edgy and more explosive. I must be a handful right now. I'm sorry, Casey. 
You can be as bothersome as you want and I wouldn't mind. You can only bother me though. Don't bother anyone else. And when I find the prick that used Leon as a mule, I will make sure they won't step anywhere near this empire ever again. He silently vowed in his heart and tightened his hold on Adira. He had noticed, way before that stunt she did with Hysa, how her temperature had been fluctuating. There were times she got too hot that it alarmed him if she was running a fever but she seemed fine so he remained silently observing her. And now, she had confirmed it herself. She's been having trouble holding it in. Um. You do know you're at my residence now, right? Adira murmured and Kasumi replied with a hum. Then you also know you're practically stealing kisses on my own territory where any minute my father could pop in here and rip you apart. Kasumi chuckled and agreed to her words. It didn't matter to Silfa whether he was a prince or not, cause once it involves his very lovely daughter, Hell would have to freeze over before anyone can stop him. After Kasumi, who had planned to stay the night, was thrown out by his father-in-law, he went back to the capital to arrange a few things for their guest. Although Adira had allowed him to tour this princess around the empire, for the sake of respect and publicity, he also just wanted her to selfishly ban him from seeing this woman at all. She should selfishly restrain me once in a while, although she isn't that kind of woman. He sighed and smiled. Roman, who came to fetch him after receiving an angry call from the Duke Silverus, just looked over to his prince in disbelief. A lot of times, he wondered how much of a schemer this man actually is to force his way into the lady's life like that. He could only shake his head to that thought. Your Highness, Alex had given his report about Leon's actions lately and said that the latter was behaving well. He also wasn't meeting up with someone or anyone for that matter at all. Lately, it seems he's been keeping to himself and pondering over his mistakes. I still do not think it was wise to leave him under Lady Adira's care when he once tried to harm her. Can't you think of a way to somehow convince the Lady Adira to relinquish him and let him rot in the dungeons as penance for his crime? Roman worriedly expressed his thoughts on the matter of Leon being Adira's, the future queen's, guard. He had a hard time digesting the information when Cassini briefed him about what Leon did and an even harder time when he learned that Adira made him her guard. Sooner or later that prick will initiate to contact Leon again. This time, I won't let them get away. What about the Latifolias? We'll deal with them as well. They've been too much of an eyesore just because I chose to ignore their daughter. Now that she's served her purpose, I don't need her anywhere near me anymore. Roman looked at the frost quickly covering the prince's countenance. He silently prayed for the poor souls of the Latifolias for what was about to come. Yes, yes, because the wife will hate it, right? Roman, trying a trick for the first time, mentioned Adira, and the frost just melted all by itself as spring took over his visage. Yes, because the wife hates it. Oh dear heavens, thank you for giving us Lady Adira to control this demon. Roman thanked the gods and silently clasped his hands together. Kasumi saw him do this action from the corner of his eye and raised a brow before asking him, What are you doing? Oh. Nothing, your highness. I just thought that Lady Adira's really lucky to have bumped into you that day. Roman tried feeding Kasumi's manly ego and praised him, feeling as if he got the ropes on how to pacify a great demon lord like him. Kasumi only scoffed after briefly looking away and turned back to Roman with a complex glint in his eyes before smiling slightly. No. I am. It seems Roman still had a long way to go to get to Adira's level of expertise on how to handle Kasumi. Princess of the Olynthi Kingdom, that is all, Roman. Kasumi finished his instructions on time before a servant of the palace knocked on his door and informed him that the king was requiring his presence. He was especially cold and stiff today that the servants wished the Lady Adira could have accompanied him today. He donned on his princely garb and followed the servant to the throne hall with Roman behind him as well. While he was walking towards the room, he happened to pass by a servant that carried teas and snacks. He paused on his steps and took some. Who made these? Oh. Um. It's. Th the head chef. Yo your highness. The servant answered nervously. It was the first time she has spoken with the crown prince of the empire, 
which would naturally explain her stuttering. Oh? Will you please tell your head chef I love her and thank you? Was all the prince said and walked away, leaving three confused heads before the other two followed after him. Did the prince just cheat with the Lady Adira? Did he just? Good heavens! Is this the end of the world? Roman was sweating so much but Casimir was smiling. The sweetness of the snack was still lingering on his tongue and he was already raring to go do work. Who wouldn't? If the wife cheers you on, wouldn't it be a lot easier to take on the world? La Lady S. Silver eyes. The panicking servant burst through the kitchen doors and immediately dove onto the lady's arms. Adira had purposely traveled far just to make Kasumi and his guests some snacks and also because the king summoned her. Something about making Kasumi more accepting and pleasing. She patted the poor servant girl's back before asking her, what happened? The, the prince is cheating on you. She suddenly burst in tears that floored Adira and the dough in her hands immediately turned to ashes. W.H. What? Can you please? Explain that properly. He asked me to tell our head chef that he loves her and thank you. The girl continued to sob. Adira raised a brow at this and asked her to recount all that happened from the top. She held her head in exasperation before smiling with a sigh and patted the servant girl comfortingly on her head. He isn't cheating on me. He most probably saw through our lie. It's okay. Let's just do a good job today, okay? Greetings, your majesty. Prince Kasumi is here. The servant, who fetched Kasumi, announced and stepped aside to allow this aloof and cold prince passage. After his shocking flirting a while earlier, the chills lessened a lot and he was actually a bit better to receive guests now. Kasumi walked in, bowed from his hips in respect and acknowledged the envoy from the Alinthi kingdom, who bears on their shoulders the snowflake crest of their kingdom. Greetings, father and princess of the Alinthi kingdom. Come, Kasumi. This is Princess Theorosalva of the Alinthi Kingdom. Princess, this is my son, Kasumi, the current next in line. The girl, who wore a blue sophisticated A-line skirt and beige upper blouse, turned to face Kasumi. Her hair was pulled up into a side ponytail as her big and elegant brown curls rested on her shoulders. She also had a small tilted turquoise hat decorated with large feathers sitting on her head that completed her look. The princess stood up and curtsied with royal finesse as she introduced herself in a gentle and sweet voice. I am the first princess of the Alinthi kingdom, Princess Theorosalva Beria Alinthi. It is my pleasure to finally meet the infamous crown prince of the empire. Horror stories, I fear. Kasumi replied and Thea giggled gracefully. Well, it is a man's reputation so I did not expect stories that told dances and tea parties, your highness. Anastasius, noticing Casimir's light mood, nodded his head solemnly and wanted to pat himself on the back. His choice to fetch Adira earlier was already showing its results and he couldn't be happier about his decision. He chose correctly this time. Then, I shall lead you around the capital as per the king's orders, your highness. Casimir said and extended his hand in a gesture to let Thea walk first. It shall be my pleasure, Prince Casimir. While Thea and her bodyguard were walking out the throne room, Kasumi turned back to his father with a smirk and meaningfully said, Well played, father. Before turning on his heel as well and following after the princess, Anastasius, who was left on the throne, just sighed and clicked his tongue. If it wasn't for Adira giving her permission and support, he greatly doubts Kasumi would even move this well. That girl really has a tight leash on you, son. Or did you tie it on yourself oh so willingly? Kasumi led the princess around the hot spots and tourist spots on the capital. However, most of the shops they went to were those that got Adira's seal of approval. I didn't peg you as a man with a sweet tooth, your highness. Thea mused while sipping on her afternoon tea, also by Kasumi's suggestion. It is not me, princess. Kasumi answered briefly and contrary to what she heard about him. He was not icy or cold or uncaring. He was actually very warm and gentle and amiable. Could they be mistaken? Is that so? How did you know about these delicacies then? These aren't even their best sellers but delicious nonetheless. It is my fiancé's favorites, princess. 
She really loves her sweets and teas so it kind of stuck to me. Is this fiancé of his the fabled goddess of the empire? The one whose beauty cannot be matched by mere mortals? Thea thought as she recalled the stories of this prince who was head over heels for his fiancée, the goddess that shocked everyone senseless on his very own birthday ball. She heard as much stories about this woman as she heard about the prince. It seems every time the prince was mentioned, she would always come up without fail, as if they were inseparable. And looking at the prince himself right now as he talks about this fiancée of his, his facial features grow softer and happier. His aura grows warmer and calmer like the welcoming spring breeze after the bitter nipping cold of winter and he feels more human than the last few hours they'd been, together. I would have loved to meet this fiancé of yours, your highness. I reckon she was a sight to behold. Yes, she is. It's really hard on my part. Thea giggled at Casimir's words as she understood what he implied. She didn't really expect this side of him. She, after all. Didn't hear stories about this Kasumi. Well, I'll be staying in the capital for a week anyway. I'm sure there'll come a chance when this goddess might grant me an audience. Yeah, but I really do not want you to meet her. Who knows whether your guards can contain themselves. Kasumi suddenly turned upset at his own thoughts and his features gradually returned to their iciness. Thea was already lucky enough to see a glimpse of sunshine peek through the storm clouds of winter covering this prince's beautiful countenance. After they were done taking a break in the shop, they went around a few shops more before they called it a day and Kasumi personally sent her to her temporary residence. This has been a very pleasant day, your highness. Thank you. She curtsied briefly and turned around without further ado. Kasumi also turned around without much thought and boarded his carriage to return to his palace. He was really tired after walking around a small fraction of the capital for a whole day without Adira. Ah, she should be home by now, right? It's already evening. I hope she got home fine. He thought before taking a short nap on the carriage. As soon as he arrived, he went up to his room to immediately retire unto the tempting softness of his bed when... As soon as he opened his door, a sweet fruity smell assaulted him and a tiny figure stood up from the couch and bolted towards him. She hopped and jumped into his arms like a little rabbit and he was stunned for a while. He didn't expect to see her. In his room of all places. How was it? Was it tiring? Was it fun? Did you eat a lot? Did you go to fun places? Did you play? Was she really indeed beautiful beyond words? Did you fall for her? Are you leaving me now? Wait. Why'd you go there? You weren't answering. Kasumi sighed as he kept her plastered against his chest while practically dangling from his neck. He was supporting her so it was fine. How's your day? She asked in a lively voice, although there was a hint of worry. It's better now. Kasumi said with a smile as he pecked her forehead. Although tonight might be a rare exception. It really feels good to return home and be greeted like this always. Notes. Thank you very much everyone for all your votes and comments. I love it. Ivona aka Iheim, hello dear. My friend sends her regards and thank you for your words. Everyone, let's keep this up. Banzai. To conquer him. Princess, the first prince's carriage is already here. A servant who came with her to visit the empire announced and watched the princess add light dabs of powder on her face before turning to her and nodding in. Acknowledgement. I bet I'll get to see that beauty today. She muttered with a slight smile and followed her out. Kasumi greeted Thea with a bow, same wintry coolness from yesterday, and helped her up the carriage. Where are we heading to today, Prince Kasumi? She asked to dispel the cold silence hanging awkwardly between them. To continue your tour, princess. We'll start from where we stopped yesterday. And he was still brief, concise and a killjoy. Millimeter. I noticed you didn't bring your little fiancé, my prince. Why is that? She asked with a slight raise of her brow and smiled slightly. She looked teasing and somewhat challenging Kasumi to answer her honestly. She's a bit busy today. She had a prior engagement so she extends her apology to you. The princess just nodded her head in understanding and fell silent after.
Kasumi wasn't exactly someone that talks much so it was a bit hard trying to communicate with him. There was not a time where she did not feel that he was here accompanying her purely just for his responsibility as the crown prince. It makes her want to conquer him. A hidden smack spread through her face as she turned to look at him also lost on his thoughts as he watched the shops and buildings they passed by. It was just after lunch when Kasumi and Thea came into a shop that sold sweets and snacks. The princess said she wanted to check it out and maybe carry some for later. The bells rang when Kasumi pushed it open for Thea and a bubbly cute boy came to greet them. Welcome eh? Millimeter? Thea hummed and raised a brow when the boy stopped prematurely on his greetings and stared at them. More so on the man beside her. Yo your highness and um. This is Princess Thea Rosalva Beria Alinthi, a guest of the Empire. Was it necessary to introduce me so formally to this shop helper? Hello. I am Thea and you are? I don't think knowing my name is worth the princess's time. Anyway, do you have a preference for sweets? The boy fluidly and smoothly smacked as flowers seemed to bloom behind him in the princess's eyes before he guided the both of them around the shop, spryly introducing the goods and gave his recommendations here and there. He was really pouring his everything to give justice to the sweets that he loved so much. Thea giggled endearingly at this charming boy. Had he been a prince or even a noble, she wouldn't have mind choosing him as her husband. She watched him with fluttering eyes as his love for sweets oozed out from every pore his very being. You must really love sweets, huh? Oh. Um. I guess. Say, you have a really good skin. What do you use? Thea, who noticed the boy's porcelain-like white skin, asked as she lightly pinched his soft and supple skin. Almost like a girl's. I, I don't particularly use anything, princess. I have a sensitive skin so I don't do well with powders. The boy replied while Thea kept on checking him out and touching his skin everywhere. Even poking his cheeks. Then you are too beautiful for a boy. Unfortunate. You would have been lovely had you been a girl. And perfect had you been even at least a baron. She complimented as she felt very envious of this boy's skin before going back to their business and chose one of his recommendations. Kasumi, who remained as silent and as still as the dead, opened the door for the princess chivalrous before saying that he wanted to take some for his fiancée as well and went back. Welco why are you back? Why are you here? And in those clothes? He crossed his arms across his chest and stared down at the boy, who was currently pouting his cheeks, as strictly as he could. It seems no amount of disguise can slip past this man's eyes, huh? I... I promised the owner of this shop I'd help him if he would let me be the first to try his new recipe. He muttered softly, his voice turning feminine. All these for a cake? It's not just any cake. It's chocolate cake with melted chocolate in between and chocolate sprinkles on top of them and chocolate frosting. It's a chocolate paradise. Adira cried excitedly as if she was a salesperson trying to sell her new product for a sponsor. Kasumi once again surrendering to his wife's antics, sighed and patted her on her head. Be careful, okay. And then he turned around to catch up to the princess waiting outside. Casey. He heard Adira call him and he was pulled down before he could turn and then felt soft warm lips kiss him on his cheeks. Don't cheat on me. She warned intimidatingly which failed miserably when she looks as adorable as that blushing and overheating so much you could practically see smoke rising up from her. And Kasumi was just speechless. Speechless and frozen on his spot. Adira had to push him out so he could get a move on and also to hide her blushing face. As soon as he heard the door slam behind him and snapped out of it, he straight away turned around and twisted the knob to get back inside. But apparently, his wife was hiding from him again and locked it from her side. Damn it, Adira. This is cheating. Your Highness. What's wrong? Kasumi heard a voice ask him from his back. A mischievous cat. Princess. I wanted to catch it but the shop helper said he'll deal with it himself. He replied, already back to his princely persona, before glancing briefly at the closed door and led the princess away. My love, you're distracting me too much. He thought as he felt his heart loudly drum inside his rib cages unceasingly. The butterflies were being festive inside while he was out here. 
dying from the slight taste of such tempting sweet delicacy only to be thrown out the next second. Walking back to the carriage, where the princess who walked ahead of him waited, Kasimi was too occupied and distracted with Adira's sudden actions that he failed to notice an inconspicuous arrow aimed at him. Adira, who walked out to hand Kasimi some snacks to eat, barely noticed when the arrow flew and wasn't able to think before her body moved automatically and shielded Kasimi from the attack. It didn't hit her anywhere near her vital spots but Kasimi, who turned after hearing hurried steps catching up to him, only saw his wife falling into his arms with an arrow stuck on her shoulder blade. Fury immediately exploded inside him as he willingly allowed anger to consume him and searched for the culprit that fired the arrow. It didn't take him long to find the person and quickly immobilized him with his ice a huge, gigantic, overkill, large sprouts of ice. Adira moaned painfully and bravely pulled out the arrow from her back before giving it to Kasumi to be identified. Adira, why the hell did you do that? Casey would do it for me. So why the hell am I not allowed to? She tried to smile although bearing down the pain and clenched Kasumi's arm as she did so. You idiot. A husband is the one who protects the wife, not the other way around. It works both ways, idiot. She breathed softly and heavily as she gradually felt her strength leave her. Kasumi felt gravely alarmed at this as he begged her not to close her eyes and bellowed out orders to capture the culprit and send him to the dungeon. He was going to deal with him later. Calm down, Casey. I'm fine. It's not a vital spot so. It'll be fine. You'll scare the people. I'm just really tired. So I want to sleep for a while. But who would have thought that as soon as she did, Kasumi would then miss those gleaming happy ash-like orbs that used to glance up to him and brighten his whole world. I'm glad I was nearby for your assassination, Casey. Smile at me, please. Did you manage to extract information from him? Kasumi immediately asked as soon as Roman came through the door, even as silently as he could and Kasumi wasn't even facing him. No, your highness. He remains adamant to keep his silence. Roman sorrowfully and wearily reported to Kasumi. He knew that out of everyone in their entire empire, it was Kasumi and the Silverus family who took a huge blow. They were practically teetering between insanity and murderous rage. Heiser, who was left back home, roared so loudly that it created panic back at the Silverus thief and fortunately Lifer was able to cover it up and sent Heiser off before. Soldiers came and inquired about the source of that mighty roar. No one, not even Kasumi, knew where he was right now. It was as cold as a snowstorm inside the first prince's room where he kept Adira's aching and weakening body. They had already called several doctors and healers in and all of them reached a consensus that his wife had been poisoned. And yet, not one of them could create an antidote against the poison. These imbeciles, good for nothing. I should decapitate them if they can't even use their uselessly big heads to save Adira. Kasumi recklessly decided and stood up before Roman hurriedly tried to talk him out of it. Yo your highness. You mustn't. WH who will make Lady Adira's antidote if you kill them all. WH who will protect her here or accompany her when she opens her eyes and you're gone. Your Highness, you must remain calm. We will do our best to get the man to cough out the antidote in any way we can. Just please stay here and be by Lady Adira's side. He ranted and spouted anything he could think of to somehow calm Kasumi down and save those poor healer's lives. The latter paused and seemed to ponder on his words before taking the frigid hand of his beloved and sitting back down. He brought her hands up to his lips and kissed them as he prayed for the gods to save Adira's life. He wasn't much of a believer but for once, he might actually try to call them to save his wife. Roman breathed a sigh of relief before he excused himself and gave his grieving prince a time alone with his beloved woman. You shouldn't have done that, you idiotic woman. What am I supposed to do if you leave me? Stop playing around and get up already. Burn me, nag at me. Punch me. Smile at me, please. Another wave of painful moans and tears came when the poison gradually crawled its way to her core and Kasumi was helpless. Unable to do anything to stop his wife's pain. Her painful cries were ringing very loudly in his ears, piercing, stabbing, 
ripping his heart apart a million times. It broke him to see her in this state. Adira. Please, wake up. Hysa is gone and I don't know where he is. I can't lose both my son and my wife. Don't leave me, I beg you. A knock interrupted him and it was William this time who came to fetch him. He bent down to his knees, even though Cassini didn't turn to him even so much as acknowledge him, and spoke. Your Highness, His Majesty requests your presence in the throne room. William was as sullen as everyone else in the empire and his heart broke watching Adira writhe in agony and his prince breaking apart like that. The woman, who was as bright as the sun, as lovely as the purest of lilies and beloved by everyone, didn't deserve to be in such a state. It took Kasumi a while, till Adira's pain finally subsided, before he made a move or even noticed the man who came for him. Call Alex over to accompany her while I'm gone. He ordered and didn't move away from Adira till he was sure Alexander had taken post. Kasumi followed William back to the throne hall where the king and the princess of the Olynthi kingdom were waiting for him. Anastasius was heartbroken watching his perfect son come undone with this tragedy that befell his beloved. He always knew that with this heart he found when he met Adira came along a fatal weakness that will tear him apart. While Thea watched how shaken and gaunt Kasumi was, which made him as human as everyone else. That omnipotent, almighty and insouciant man, who seemed as if he got everything figured out and under his control, was nowhere to be seen in his profile. Any woman who sees this vulnerability in him would want to reach out their hand and take him into their fold. I've decided. I'm sorry for what happened to your fiancé, your highness, Prince Kasumi. I shall return to my kingdom ahead of time and let you focus on your fiancé. For a clean farewell with her. Thank you, princess. Kasumi gave a slight and weak forlorn smile that nobbled the princess's heart unintentionally. Oh, um, yes. She meekly replied and turned to the king, curtsied low, and walked out by herself after she bid farewell. Anastasius looked at Kasumi and tried to find the appropriate words to gently ask about Adira's condition but he couldn't think of anything. How is she? Still suffering. Kasumi answered bluntly and honestly. He was not in his right mind to bother acting as the perfect and indifferent prince when his mind and heart was bleeding for his wife. We'll get through this my son. Just believe. But even as Anastasia said that, he knew no words could help Kasumi right now. He'd been there. He knows best what Kasumi is feeling right now. If there's nothing else, I shall take my leave, father. Kasumi bowed slightly and pivoted on his heel. William, who was waiting for him outside the hall, followed after him when he came out. But he didn't return to his room. Oh no. He marched towards the dungeons. It seems as if he needs to personally make his move to force the antidote out of the man. His aide, who had a vague idea as to what his prince was thinking, broke into a vicious grin as he mentally prepared how he was going to rip the man apart or tear a new hole in his body. He just summoned the great demon lord himself. Maybe I should go prepare a body bag or something. Notes. OMG. I was overwhelmed reading your comments when I woke up. Oh, I'm so sorry for putting your poor hearts into that misery. So here, whether it adds or eases your aching heart, I do not know. Thank you for the comments and the votes, am I lovelies? Banzai. Jasmine sent. Mistress. A lady servant gasping for breath, burst through Iris' doors while she was snipping Rose's stems and decorating it in a vase. Iris turned her head, annoyed from being interrupted in her alone time, and spat, what? My lady, the Lady Silveris. What's with that woman? Did she finally do me a favor and croaked? Iris sarcastically spoke before continuing her flower arrangement. She's... She got attacked and is currently unconscious. The servant enunciated and Iris immediately shot up from her seat. Is she really? What happened? She was shot down by an arrow, my lady, which was coated with a deadly poison. Rumors had it that she wouldn't last the week. The servant sounded very worried and scared as her hands trembled. Even if she was Iris' servant and was fed with lies every day, she couldn't find it in her heart to hate the beautiful and kind lady. It was a secret she kept from Iris but she often went out, back when they were still at the dorms, 
to visit the Lady Silverus crash course of making sweets. And in there, she couldn't see the monster her mistress painted her to be. She was nothing but a beautiful and brilliant soul. Help me get dressed. I shall go and send my deepest sympathies. She declared and left her unfinished flower arrangement. The servant followed as she was ordered and helped her mistress change. Maybe, she could also go and check the Lady Silverus condition. Goddesses, please help Lady Silverus. As soon as Iris arrived, she found Leon walking around the corridor beside the garden aimlessly. He seemed deep in his thoughts and his eyes looked glazed. Lord Ryona, she called. Leon jolted and turned to Iris distractedly before focus returned to his eyes and finally registered Iris in his drifting mind. Lady Latifolia. He bowed. Even as he talked to her, he didn't seem as enthusiastic as before. It seemed as if he was physically there but mentally somewhere. I've thought about what you said, my lord. I think that you're right. I should gather my courage to tell his highness what the lady has done to me. I only ask that Lord Ryona helps me get close to his highness. I don't know why but these days, it is especially hard to even see his highness let alone get close to him. Will you help me, my lord? She then looked up to him in a pitiful way with tears pulling at the corner of her eyes. She knew Leon always fell for this trick. No matter how many times. Lady Latifolia, what are you talking about? Haven't you heard what happened to Lady Adira? His Highness is very distressed right now. Precisely because I heard what happened to the Lady Silveris. Now is the time, my lord. Without her bewitching His Highness' mind, he'll be able to think objectively. Leon pondered for a while and stared at the determination flashing brightly on this lady's face. She was intransigent about her decision to go talk to the prince. He nodded his head after a while and relief and happiness broke out into Iris' face. He led her around the palace and to the prince's room where Adira lay. On the way, he suddenly asked her something. Lady Latifolia, do you remember the night of his highness' birthday, your hairpin was dirted and you asked me for help? Iris, completely focusing her attention on how to string her words perfectly to get the prince's attention while Adira was out, didn't think much and nodded her head. Yes, my lord. Do you perhaps still have that hair ornament? Oh? Pray tell why, my lord. Um, I would like to borrow it so I could ask a silversmith to make a copy of it. I thought it was very lovely and my mother would very much love it. Oh, forgive me, my lord. But I already threw it away. See, after the party, it got destroyed. Iris nonchalantly lied. While Leon briefly paused before continuing, I see. That's unfortunate. I just can't seem to forget the jasmine scent from that ornament, you see? He shrugged his shoulders and silently observed Iris' facial expression. She froze before her face morphed into nervousness as quickly and transient as it came. Iris didn't answer him back and remained silent. She only gave him a smile as he continued to lead her to Casimir's chambers. When they arrived, Leon saw Alexander standing guard outside the door. So he approached him. How is she? He worriedly asked. Alexander could only shake his head in reply. He was also heavily wounded with Adira's fall like this. If only he guarded her tightly that day and didn't allow her out of his sight. If only he wasn't as stupid as allowing her to slip past his guarding. If only he wasn't as useless. Then Adira wouldn't be on the prince's bed suffering from pain even when she's unconscious. The poison doesn't even let her rest at all. Leon could tell that Alexander was blaming himself. He knew that look too well. He's done that a million times more than him. How about his highness? His majesty called him. He hasn't returned. Who is she and why is she here? Alexander, who finally noticed the pink-haired woman standing behind Leon, frowned and sharply looked at her. At this time of unrest, he didn't trust anyone as easily as before. It was his job to be doubtful of everyone else now for the sake of his mistress' safety. After all, they still do not know the master of that assassin. Who knows when they'll secretly come and finish off the job? Oh. This is Lady Latifolia. You met her once when she came to the student council's office asking help to dispel um. 
Her rumors and gossips born from her friction with Lady Adira. It wasn't Lady Adira. Alexander firmly said that shocked both Leon and Iris when his words came out of nowhere. It was a simple statement of his confidence in his mistress Adira. Oh of course. Leon backed down and immediately changed the topic back to Cassini's location. Anyway, I think I shall go and find his highness. Lady Latifolia, can you wait here with Alex? Iris nodded her head softly and demurely. Just like a lady that cannot lift a hand against even an ant. So pure and innocent. Leon left to find Casimi and Iris sat down across Alexander. He refused to allow her inside and he wasn't talking at all so it was very boring and tiring. She tried opening topics to try and communicate with him but it always failed. Miserably. And she doesn't know why. But she's been having this bothering drumming in her heart and sweat running down her temples. There was also this unexplainable chill on her spine that she cannot help but feel nervous as she shifted uncomfortably on her seat. Lady Latifolia. She heard the spine-chilling low voice of the man everyone called the Great Demon Lord. She never once heard him use this voice so she always thought that people only called him that because he was cold and indifferent to everyone. But now, she felt very scared to turn around and meet this man's eyes because she knew she would only see one thing. Death. Notes. Hi. Due to time zone differences, my updates may not be the same as yours but I've been updating every day since chapter 1. There were also times I updated twice in one day. So sorry if you have to suffer in heartache for a while before I can update again. I'm always trying my best to make the story better and update fast. So just hang in there. Thank you so much for your words, votes and support everyone. I really love you dear readers. Banzai. SBAVN's already got 55k readers. Yay. Love you am I lovelies. Let's keep this up. Wolves ganging up a sheep. Yo yo. Your Highness. She answered and shakily curtsied low while deliberately avoiding eye contact. You wanted to see me? Um. Lady Latifolia, didn't you want to tell His Highness something about the Lady Adira? Leon piped up from beside Casimi and a chillier drop in temperature enveloped them at the mere mention of Adira's name. Not helping, idiot Leon. You're not helping right now. She screamed in her head as she kept still and did not answer Casimi. It might have been the worst time to approach the first prince indeed. Right now, one wrong move or word in your head will roll off the floor. That was the first prince's aura right now. Try as he might. He could not hide the fact that he was practically overflowing with a chilling rage that was making everyone shiver in fear. Lady Latifolia, do not be afraid. Didn't you say that now is the right time? Leon kept on egging her and she felt greatly annoyed with his antics right now. Damn it. Shut it, Leon. You idiot. Stop pushing me into the ice chamber. So what is it, Lady Latifolia? Casimi was already showcasing his annoyance and impatience but still, he didn't leave. Iris wondered why but she liked to think that maybe he was waiting for her to speak. Could this really be my chance? Is it really possible that His Highness is interested in me? Your Highness. I, I would like to report what Lady Adira did to me. She started and she could visibly see that everyone's attention was on her now. Even Alexander who acted as if she didn't exist, was listening and waiting for her to continue. Plus, there was William and Leon behind Casimi as well. So aside from Roman, who opted to remain and force out answers from the culprit, everyone that rose to power from their past lives were practically present. And as if these big bosses weren't enough, the biggest boss suddenly decided to strut in. What's going on here? The king asked when he saw the men all looking at the lady cowering under their intense and fiery gazes. Like wolves ganging up on a sheep. Your Majesty. Leon, William, Alexander and Iris all greeted him and knelt down in respect. All except Casimi who wouldn't tear his gaze away from Iris. And this piqued Anastasia's interest. It wasn't in Casimi's system to ever stare at girls ehem. Except maybe Fadira, so him staring at Iris as jellied as that could not bode well. What did the Latifolias do this time? Is he planning to move now? So? Care to answer me, Casimi? 
Anastasius tried to attract Cassini's attention and he did when Cassini answered, Lady Latifolia wanted to report something to me, father. However, the latter did not even spare his father a glance. He was just watching Iris and waiting for her to speak whatever she wanted to say so he can finally move. I'm waiting, Lady Latifolia. Iris gulped audibly as the frost continued to build up and coat his visage and he became even scarier than minutes ago. The Lady Adira. Adira? Casimir cut her as he repeated what she used to call his wife, disdain glinting so dangerously in his darkened pool of platinum orbs. La Lady Silverus. Iris quickly corrected herself and continued when Casimir remained silent. She. She hurt me, your highness. Her voice turned incredibly softer near the end of her sentence as she seemed to swallow most of her words when Casimir's fury once again bubbled inside him quietly. A silent yet cataclysmic furor. Really? Pray tell, Lady Latifolia. I want all the details on this event where Adira hurt you. There was no turning back now, even if Casimir's practically below freezing point already. She must believe and push through. Because... She was the fated maiden. Naturally, Kasumi should be hers, the crown princess title, the love of many, the promised future of rising to rule the Vasilis Empire and etc. Everything that Adira holds in her evil clutches now should be hers. And so, Iris spilled lies after lies and fabricated a whole new story. She spoke of how Adira pushed her down a flight of stairs spoke ill of her to other nobles behind everyone's back and ruined her reputation. She also emphasized how Adira had a very lofty attitude and used Kasumi and her status as the prince's fiancé to bully nobles like her who was lower in rank. Oh, she also added another lie about how Adira slapped her so hard she fell and knocked over a teacup and suffered gashes on her hands. She didn't, of course, forget to show her evidence and even dragged Leon in as a witness for this injury. However, what she didn't know was that Cassini had already cleared these issues out with Leon and well, hearing it again, he suddenly had an itching feeling to punch the man again. But maybe later. I see. Father, you are the supreme ruler so I will ask your permission right here, right now for me to take legal action about this. Anastasius, who already knew where this was going, could only sigh and hold his head in exasperation. His son was basically running berserk and fast-forwarding his plans because of what happened to his poor little wife. And yet, he can't do anything about it. He cannot hope to stop an enraged Kasumi if Adira doesn't wake up. If anyone can stop him when all he sees are red, there's no one but Adira. So he gave his permission, left the Latifolia's life to luck and fate and left them as he entered Kasumi's room to check on his daughter-in-law. He promised Silpha and Andrea to do whatever it took to save Adira while they also did their own investigation. Or else, he can only shiver as he imagined what Silpha would do if not. William, you go relieve Roman of his duty right now and summon him here. It's time we do something about this. And William couldn't be any happier with Casimir's orders. It was fun watching things unfold one by one but nothing still beats Tortu M interrogating a prisoner. Right away. Your Highness. He excitedly exclaimed and hurriedly went away to exchange with Roman and also pass a secret message. While Cassimi, Leon and Alexander were left with the confused and bothered Iris. However, she calmed herself down and readied herself for Cassimi proposing marriage to her after everything. Of course, she made sure Adira's reputation was ruined amongst the nobles so even if Cassimi went and investigated things. It will only incriminate Adira further and he cannot cover for her anymore. As for her alleged injury, Leon was enough as her witness. He was the prince's trusted aide, after all. Of course, he'll believe what his aides tell him. Else, what use does Leon have if not for that? A few minutes of waiting, Roman finally appeared but in his toe was a pair of Aelfin winter knights donned in their armor. The knight order that answers directly to the first prince of the empire, Prince Casimir Athanasius Rosen Vasilis. Your Highness, Roman reports. The Baron Latifolia has already been apprehended and the pharmacy that dispensed large quantities of jasmine aphrodisiac without proper prescription has also been taken into custody. 
At Roman's news, Iris' eyes widened in astonishment and in disbelief with this secretary's crazy talk. Why? What's happening? What the hell is happening? Notes. Hi. Thank you everyone for understanding and supporting me. I will still continue to update daily in my time zone so do pardon me if it's late in your zone. Thank you for the comments and votes as always. Let's keep it up. Banzai. She's not. W.A. Wait. Yo your highness. What's the meaning of this? Why are you seizing my father? Iris shrieked indignantly and shot up cutting Roman mid-report. He shot her a disagreeable look but didn't say anything. Casimir sat back on the couch languidly and uncaring as he waved at Iris to shut up and let Roman finish his report first. The purported nobles said to have been bullied by the Lady Adira claimed the rumors to be false and instead professed that the lady did nothing but help them every chance she gets. As for the Baron Latifolia's human trafficking dealings in the underground market, it has also been uprooted. The knights also reported back to have discovered a room with carvings on the wall that seemed to be dark magic, your highness. Kasimi held his hand up again and Roman immediately stopped before the former apathetically turned to the fuming iris. Does that answer your question? Miss Latifolia. Kasimi immediately stripped her of her title and leaned on his arm propped up on the couch psalm rest. He didn't want to bother waste his time against a person as trivial as this woman but she had to constantly attack and ruin Adira. A bug that incessant buzzes in his ears would soon grate on his nerves, awakening an urge to trample them down. So much so they wouldn't be able to get back up again. How dare you attack my woman? Now, it's your turn to answer my question, Miss Latifolia. Were you the one that ordered the attack on Adira? Kasimi asked, his words brisk and crisp. He didn't have any spare time to play games with this woman. More so to take pity at that obvious pitiable act. She should have known such acts don't work on someone like Kasimi that didn't have heart for anyone else. This is wrong. My father did no such acts. My father is a reputable man. You. You're doing this to indict my family. You framed him for what? For revenge in Adira's behalf? Why do you take her side? You know nothing of the real her. She's vile and cruel. She doesn't deserve to be your princess, your highness. And who should? Casimir's eyes were challenging and dangerous but Iris was too far in to be intimidated in a more plus she's far too shocked with the news of her family's state to even think properly. Me. She unflinchingly declared that garnered a mocking and derisive chuckle from Casimir. Surely, you jest. Your highness. You must believe me. It is only I who can lead you and this kingdom to a more prosperous future. You need to open your eyes. Adira's only bewitching you. She'll only cause destruction upon this kingdom. Miss Latifolia, I do not appreciate you calling my fiancé so casually like that. You need to remember, she's your future queen. Ah, yes. She's not. Cause you won't be here by then. Kasimi was full on raging now. Although the only expression he had on his face was a cold jeering smile with vitriolic platinum orbs. Your Highness. You're making a grave mistake right now. She wasn't able to finish her words when Kasimi waved his hands for the knights to pick her up and keep her in the dungeons for a while. She'll have her turn but for now, he needs to make that bastard cough out the antidote. Kasimi rose from his seat, as soon as Iris shrieks gradually vanished and momentarily lost his balance. Roman, Alexander, and Leon were alarmed as the former rushed to help Kasimi but it wasn't necessary as it was only momentary and he almost immediately found stability. Again, they were worried that Kasimi was pushing himself too much. It's been three days since the Lady Adira fell unconscious and hasn't woken up yet. And since then, he hasn't had proper rest yet nor a little shut-eye. Your Highness, I'm fine. Let's go. Casimir walked away and Roman followed suit. Leon and Alexander were left to guard Adira after all. He did give them to her. They should do their job. While walking back to the dungeons, Casimir thought back to what Leon did before he hurriedly went back to his room. Your Highness. Leon called when he found Casimir who just exited the throne hall along with William. The men turned to him and Casimir raised a questioning brow to Leon. 
This was not where he should be. Why are you here? Your Highness, I figured it out. The person who carried the aphrodisiac powder was the Lady Latifolia. She was also the one who told me that the Lady Adira injured her. She has come this time to feed you more lies. What should I do to her? Please give me your orders, your highness. At least, you're thinking now. Casimir's face was frigid as he regarded Leon's kneeling figure and started walking the opposite way as he passed by him. William, although unsure what the prince was thinking, just followed after him. He had a feeling he was about to see something fun. So why not, right? And so, on the way back to his room, Kasimi gave out orders to finally start his plan he had long conceived but put off cause he needed the girl to tie Adira to him, more. He had already started to doubt this Latifolia woman when she shed tears at the council's office that day. He always thought that she was just one of those fangirls that loved to do anything just to attract his attention. But he always had this nagging feeling that it wasn't only that. He could also see how she loathed Adira so much but he wasn't sure why. Was it because he chose Adira as his fiance, Or something else? William, is everything prepared? Everyone's already stationed, your highness. We only need your signal and we can nab him immediately, William reported. He nodded his head and finally saw the woman sitting on the couch with her back turned against him and Alexander standing in front of the door to his room where Adira was still sleeping. Now then, let's start. Notes. Hi. I'm sorry I wasn't able to update on time. I wasn't feeling well because of a message I read. I could be misunderstanding that person's words but I really felt insulted. Sorry for ranting here. I really didn't like how it sounded to me. Anyway, let's all be happy. Enjoy the chapter. Banzai. It was you. Still not saying anything. William asked the already beaten up man with a large gash that traversed through his left eye plus a mean looking face. The man glared up to William before spatting blood onto his face and still kept his mouth tightly sealed. Ah Tilda you're making this fun Tilda clench your jaws for me, brother. William manically smirked before swinging a strong punch towards the man's face. Only it wasn't just his fist, but also brass knuckles slipped onto his four fingers. How about now? Still no? William gleefully asked the dizzy man that hung his head a straight streak of blood dripping from his mouth all the way down to his soiled and wet pants. And yet, the man proved to be stubborn as he kept his silence. William was a lot more brutal than the first man that tortured him. This man was not holding back at all. And he was even enjoying it. Or Tilda I really love stubborn bastards like you. Makes the game worthwhile. He cheered excitedly and turned back to the table behind him littered with other torture devices. Ham. What should I choose next? Ah Tilda don't you have dirty nails? Should I help you clean them? Do you prefer the forceps or a wedge? I can work with both, you know? The man shivered in fear as he saw pure enjoyment shining in William's eyes while twisting and turning the object in his hands. Not answering. I'll choose the wedge then. The more painful the more fun, right? I wonder if I can hear your lovely scream. You know those are music to my ears. So please, do scream for me. William Barmy yacked and approached the man, who was trying real hard to back away although he knew damn well there was nowhere he could run. The former was about to hammer the wedge he slipped in the man's nail when the doors creaked open and a cold gust of air chilled them to their bones. William immediately retreated and stood straight while the man wished his torturer wouldn't change now and certainly not the great demon lord of the empire. I see you still haven't coughed out the antidote. A dark, bitter and hard voice spoke before Kasami came into full view. He was a terrifying sight to behold especially in the kind of setting everyone were in. He oddly fits so well in this dark and damned place. Who ordered you to attack Adira? Kasimi didn't waste time and immediately asked straight to the point very not nicely to boot. Although the man was practically regretting why he took this job, he still remained silent. There was so much to lose if he does spill. Where's the antidote to the poison you gave her? Kasimi asked again his chilliness dropping a few more degrees. And the man obstinately kept his lips sealed. I will ask you one more time. If you still do not answer me, 
I will hunt every last person of your kinwomen, child or elderly I will spare no one and kill them one by one in front of you. I will make you wish you never pushed your luck and make sure you will bear the weight of their lives forever. And with the sharp full glint in his platinum eyes enshrouded with the darkness of death, the man finally caved in as tears streamed down his face. Looking deep into that bottomless abyss in his eyes, it mystically made him see a vivid image of his family falling one by one in the hands of this cruel and malevolent demon hiding in the disguise of the first prince and it was all because of him. It. It wasn't the. The lady. The target. Was you, your highness. He finally croaked. An assassination. Someone still dares. The antidote? I. I don't know. Your highness. Your enemy has it. And that lady is in danger. You are in danger, your highness. He warned Kasumi and a sudden loud beat in his chest almost as if an alarm resounded inside him. He hurriedly turned on his heel and sprinted back to his room. He wasn't sure why but he felt like he needed to hurry up and return to Adira's side. He passed through countless cages on his way when he heard a female voice loudly call his name in the slightest chance that he might hear her. Your Highness, wait, I can save Adira. And just that made him pause. Back to Kasumi's room, a shadow of a man quietly approached the suffering lady clawing at the blankets that covered her. She was breathing heavily moaning painfully and crying miserably as she continued to hold on and endured the excruciating pain gnawing at her life. The unconscious king sprawled across the floor. Alexander also knocked unconscious and tied to a chair and stashed somewhere he could not be discovered, while the other guards that patrolled around outside remained clueless. The shadow crept closer to her and sat at her bedside. My love, I'm sorry but this empire needs to fall. He whispered softly as he caressed her beautiful face drenched with sweat. You almost made me want to give these all up. My ambition, my revenge, my hatred. I thought it might not be so bad to spend my days peacefully with you by my side. I thought I could give everything up if it meant I could be with you. I was more than ready to love you and you to love me. But, once again, he snatched everything away from me again. His family killed mine and stole everything I held dear. And now, he stole you away from me. I cannot accept that. I came here because I wanted to help ease your pain and see you for the last time. But I figured, if I die tonight, which is regrettably so, then you shall die with me. That way, even in death, you are mine. He finished expatiating and leaned down to lay a kiss on Adira's lips a farewell kiss before they are reunited after their deaths. I will see you soon, my love. I will wait for you, he whispered lovingly with a manic and obsessed smile. And he gently stood up, drew the gossamer curtains down to cover his most beloved woman before venturing out to find the subject of his immense hatred. A newfound hatred after having his beloved snatched away from him. Tonight, everything ends. Notes. I am very thankful for all the kind words of everyone that always supports me. You're all right. I shall think of all of you instead. My lovelies, Adira and Kasumi thanks you all as well. Banzar I, maiden of light, what did you say? Kasumi paused and turned to the woman with disheveled coral pink hair. I can save her. She repeated more calmly and softly. How? Your highness, I am the maiden of light. She revealed. The maiden of light. The prophesied queen that would bring about an absolute power to the empire or kingdom that possesses it strengthening it beyond measure where no invaders could hope to topple it, where walls can be easily won should they hope to start one or defend against one. It was the maiden most coveted by all the kingdoms and empires alike, the power that will tip the scales of the battlefield. It was the queen everyone had waited thousand of years for, and now, she stands before the king of the future generation. But, Kasumi wasn't hearing any of it nor cared one bit. All he wanted to know was how to save his wife. He slammed his fists against the iron barricades, making it ring so loudly in that desolate and hollow place, and growled dangerously low. Speak woman. How can you save Adira? Iris was flabbergasted, confused and in disbelief. Even after revealing her trump card, her identity, it still didn't matter to him. 
It was always Adira. Adira this. Adira that. Why does it always have to be her? Hatred filled her small heart to the brim as she heard the cracks creeping all so slowly and excruciatingly as she swallowed everything up just so she could escape this. Cage she was thrown in. I. I can heal her with my light. She reluctantly answered through clenched jaws. If anything, she'd rather that woman to die. Kasumi didn't waste more time as he ripped the doors from its hinges with his bare hands and let Iris out. But, of course, not after he gave her a parlous warning. Do anything funny and you die. If anything happens to her, you die. If she dies, then you better say your prayers because I won't allow you to die a peaceful and quick death. Do you understand? She audibly gulped the fear that lodged on her throat. It was very clear to her now the true face of the sinister demon lurking below the facade of the cold first prince. All this while, he was kept in check because Adira was there. But take her out and nothing could stop his rampage. If she's not around, then this demon will lay waste on the entirety of the empire till all that's left is a hollow shell of its former glory. Everyone will suffer under his rule. Everyone will forever live with fears in their hearts. Always worrying about the day when this demon might twist and break their necks. This first prince was the exact definition of a double-edged sword. He can lead the empire towards a time of peace and absolute dominance and a brighter future. And he can also very well be its bane. Every imaginable fear shall come to be if they lose Adira Silverius. Iris started to walk forward, back to Casimir's room. If worse comes to worst, she'll lose her head the second she does something he wouldn't like. Hurrying back to where Adira was, Kasumi and Iris came across Leon who was walking along the corridor that led to Kasumi's room. Your Highness, and Miss Latifolia, what are the two of you doing together? He asked, suspicious about seeing the both of them together. Did you let her go, Your Highness? Yes. Why, are you? Cheating on the Lady Adira. Is this it? Have you fallen prey to her lies as well? Snap out of it, your highness. Why are you doing this? Why are you hurting Lady Adira? Out of the way, Leon. I don't have enough time. She can help Adira. She can heal her with her light. Kasumi said and sidestepped Leon while harshly pulling Iris behind him by her arm. Leon paused briefly at the information he just heard. Light? What does he mean? What light, your highness? Leon asked as he walked to catch up with Kasumi, who wasn't stopping for anything. She claims that she's the maiden of light. The maiden of light. And you believe her? Leon cried in surprise and turned to the haggard lady, who was transported here and there harshly, not that he cared anymore. I already warned her. I'll kill her if something goes wrong. Kasumi repeated his threat and both Leon and Iris shivered in extreme terror. So? She really is the Maiden of Light? And you're staking everything on her? Leon asked as they paused in front of the door that will lead to Kasumi's room. Yes. Kasumi answered as he pushed the doors open to find the king, his father, unconscious and tied to a chair and Alexander missing. What happened here? He turned around to ask Leon but when he did... Both Leon and Iris were not in their supposed to be place now. They were also missing. What the hell is going on? He mused and ran to check if Adira was still there as he ripped the gossamer curtains open and breathed a sigh of relief to fortunately still see her there. Although she wasn't any better than she was hours ago. Kasumi turned around when he felt another's presence inside the room, one that brought with him the stench of death. He should know because he, as well had that same disgusting stench on him. A disgusting feeling he had hidden when Adira first smiled at him. An abhorrent side of him he had learned to accept to keep Adira out of harm's way. You wouldn't begin to imagine the countless hearts he stopped all these years because they either wanted Adira for themselves, the gruesome way, or they were ordered to attack her in the most atrocious way possible. Because the moment he took Adira as his bride and screamed it to the entirety of the empire, he had sealed her fate of being constantly targeted. So what better way to make up for it than to be her personal prince, knight and executioner? All of these were done without Adira's knowledge. He wanted to keep her out of this side of his world. He didn't want to give her that excuse if she leaves him. 
Hello, your highness. Please, step away from my beloved. He spoke peremptorily. Notes. Hi. I am very happy to read your supporting comments and everything. Thank you so much my darlings. Here I am giving back the love that I received from all of you. Love love love. Thanks for the votes, comments and support. Let's keep it up. Banzai. My lovely Adira. Kasimi felt very insulted and challenged with the man's assertion of his claim. His brows furrowed as he drew the curtains back to cover his wife and faced the man hiding under the hood. So brave to claim my wife as yours, yet too much of a coward to reveal yourself. Your taunts won't work on me, your highness. So please, step away from my woman now. Is this your work? Kasimi asked the thing that's been bothering him. I. I'm not proud of it since that imbecile's too stupid to actually hurt my beloved when he should be killing you. But then I thought doesn't this work out in the end? If you end up killing me, she'll die too. And then, even in death, she'll always be mine. Actually, she's very strong, my lovely Adira, that is. With the amount of poison I placed in the arrow, it should have killed her on the spot. But here she is, suffering for an extended three days. He laughed crazily as he flicked his hand and materialized a black sword out of thin air. Dark magic. Kasimi muttered. I, the prince really is a genius as everyone said. Yes, your highness, I'm a dark magic user and so is my beloved Adira. Kasimi froze and stared wide-eyed at the man who claimed his wife practiced the dark mystic arts. He cannot believe it. No. He refused to believe it. If she did, then she wouldn't shine as brightly as the sun and attract so many damn foolish Icarus. Well, it's okay if you don't believe it, she'll be mine soon anyway. The man shrugged his shoulders before he lurched forward and brandished his sword at Kasimi. The latter quickly drew his own sword and parried the attack. Pushing the man back, Kasimi chased after him with his own combination of attacks. And oddly enough, this man knew all of his patterns. Isn't it weird how I can predict your next move? Oh. I found a gift a while ago so I helped myself to it. You wanna see her? He laughed sarcastically and waved his other hand again before a black portal appeared and Iris was spitted out. Your Highness. Iris screamed and was about to run towards Kasimi when the man caught her by her hair and harshly pulled her back. Ah, Lady Latifolia, do you not miss me? We went through so much together as you chased his highness and I helped you, right? You were so stupidly running around spreading rumors about my woman to break them apart. I helped you because I thought maybe you might just do the trick. I really staked my bet on you to seduce his highness. But you failed. So I discarded you cause you've got no use. But then, what's this I hear? You can heal Adira. I can't let you do that, can I? So I'll send you off first. He suddenly stopped ranting and raised his hands up to pierce the sword at her heart when she glowed brightly enough to momentarily blind the man holding her by the neck and materialized countless blades from a separate space through a portal and abruptly pulled one out to stop the sword that was about to skewer her. The shockwave created from two opposing magic blew the both of them apart. Everything finally clicked inside Kasimi's brain as he watched the two of them duke it out and carefully studied the man's movements. The bastard finally lost it. His wife forgave his folly and this bastard dares again. Ah. This time, I'm not sparing you anymore. Whether Adira likes it or not, she'll move on and you'll just be a passing memory. She'll wake up and rule beside me for many years to come. She won't be done in by mere fools like you. Adira's stronger than you think she is. And she's mine. Kasimi announced before finally showing his fighting prowess and pushed the man back to the point he was forced to run away. But, oh no, Kasimi wasn't gonna let him get away this time. He'll make sure he never breathes again. Adira suddenly opened her eyes and noticed the gossamer curtains were drawn. And suddenly, she had this urge to get up which really proved to be difficult given that she had been laying down unconscious for who knows how long. It was like her body was in autopilot. She was aware and conscious but she didn't have full control over her actions. Hi sir, Confin Ekes Vec of Rack. Hi sir, come to me my child. 
a language she didn't know she knew spilled out of her lips. And the dragon, anxiously and sorrowfully waiting for his mother's call at the forest a little ways away from the castle, packed up and immediately flew off at the slightest sound of her voice. It was as if the wind carried her mother's weak voice speaking in the language of the dragons. He didn't care nor wonder why it was but his mother called him. No one, man, dragon or god can stop him from going to her side. A strong gust of wind and a loud flapping sound resounded outside the balcony and Adira stood up to walk towards there, all the while ignorant of the lady that sat there with mouth agape and eyes as wide as saucers at not only seeing Adira up and strutting as if nothing's wrong but also, witnessing that large blue-eyed black dragon hovering outside the balcony. Th that is a freaking dragon, Gethrisch, go. Adira commanded as soon as she rode atop the dragon's back and flew away, and left a fainted iris sprawled on the floor. High surrounded the castle once before flashes and ringing sounds of iron hitting iron reverberated on the area and Adira saw Kasumi facing off a man hidden under a hood. Sai am I Gethris Jivira, hi sir. I'm going down, hi sir. Was all she said before jumping down from the dragon's back waving her hands and materializing a sword forged with her fire, as she struck Casimir's enemy down. What, are you doing, Leon? She asked, angry and blazing. My love. He was shocked to see her standing and moving about all healthy and fine and that's when he remembered that he left Iris at Casimir's room. Did she do something to Adira? How dare you hurt what's mine? She suddenly raged and blazed hotly before launching a series of attacks one after another while Leon did what he could to fend off her onslaught of attacks. My love, please cease this. I do not want to hurt you. Don't you dare call me that. How could you love me when you helped Iris ruin me? I did it so Kasumi would cast you aside. I did it so you would be mine. You can only be mine, Adira. Only mine. Adira was suddenly pulled back before Kasumi took over and pushed Leon back. He just cannot sit back while his wife dukes it out with him and certainly not so after he heard what Leon said. Is that how you love her? By killing her. Kasumi spat when he cornered Leon. You. Your case is assassin? Adira asked in disbelief. All these time, the person she'd been trying to locate was hiding right under her nose. It wasn't me who shot her. It wasn't my fault. It's yours, Kasumi. You did this to her. And today, it won't only be Adira who dies because of you. Notes. So there you go. The traitor has been unmasked. Ha ha only one guessed it right. But don't worry, an explanation will come up soon. Stay tuned. Always had your heart. Adira then remembered Stefan and she pulled Kasumi back before whistling at Heiser to pick him up. Go to Stefan, Kasumi. Hi sir. Let me down. Adira. I won't leave you. Go hi sir. Adira ordered the dragon, who was also reluctant to leave his mother behind, before giving Kasumi a sad smile. You're not leaving me, Casey. Like hell I'm letting you leave me. I've always had your heart, right? Go save your brother, Casey. And she nodded at hi sir to take off and find Stefan. It wasn't that she didn't believe in Casimir's brother, but she feared Stefan might be in a bigger trouble than this man in front of them. And also, there was a secret she cannot let them know. I'll be fine. He won't hurt me. Now go. Heiser obeyed his mother and flew away against his will and, of course, against the unwilling Casimir. After making sure that Casimir and Heiser were nowhere to be seen now, Adira's knee suddenly buckled and she fell on the floor as she gasped for breath. It really was a lot of work trying to act okay. And it took all she had just to keep herself standing tall. My love. Stop that. You don't love me. Cause if you really did, you wouldn't have ruined me, you wouldn't have helped Iris to destroy me. Adira, my love, please believe me. I didn't have much choice. I wanted Kasumi to throw you away so then you could finally return to me. Didn't you promise me you'd be mine when we're older? My love, it was what kept me going aside from these intense feelings of revenge. Do you not remember? You were the only one standing between me and my revenge. I thought that with you by my side, I could give all of these up. But you went ahead and chose Kasumi. 
the son of the man who killed my family, so if you cannot be mine, then no one shall have you and this empire shall fall tonight. Leon's hatred was overflowing inside his poor battered heart, the heart he sacrificed in exchange for power, to wield the dark magic. He thought that he could never love again, but then Adira found him and she stole what little was left of his heart. She was that pure and bright sunshine lightening his murky world, giving it the color he had long forgotten. It was Adira who made him see the beauty of the world again. He had long known her way before Kasumi introduced her as his fiancé. He knew her way before Kasumi appeared as her escort for her coming of age. He knew her before Kasumi entered the picture and took her for himself. It was also Adira who saved him from the depression and pain of losing his family. She saved him from insanity. She was his only light, the only one that kept him grounded in reality. And from that fateful day, when he somehow stumbled into the Silverous Castle and ran into her, he had loved her. He was just an eleven-year-old dirty boy at that time and she was a sweet little ten-year-old girl. Adira spent what little strength she had mustered in the heat of the moment and let her body slump against a pillar. Her breathing labored and shallow her head glistening with large beads of sweat, and her face, too pale for comfort. She wasn't hearing any of Leon's banters now. All she thought about were Heisa and Kasimi. She purposely sent Kasimi and Heisa away so they wouldn't have to witness her falling apart like this. She wants to at least look perfect in their memories before she has to go. So in the end, I really cannot escape my death, huh? Ah, will Casey and Heisa be okay? That father and son pair doesn't always see eye to eye but they will be fine, right? At least now, Heiser won't be alone. Casey will be with him. There's Lifa as well. Adira's face smiled sadly as she surrendered to her fate of dying eventually. The difference this time was, she didn't grow up to be the queen and didn't end up killing thousands of citizens. And it was a hell lot earlier. This might be for the best. Adira, my love. Are you okay? Leon hurriedly approached her weakened figure and finally pieced the puzzle out, why when Kasumi and that big ass dragon left, she suddenly broke down. Adira was only acting as if she was fine. In truth, Iris wasn't able to heal her or most probably didn't. She probably was awakened when Iris light magic and his dark magic clashed and Leon repelled Iris light magic. She must have have resonated somehow. Leon, please stop this. Don't kill Casey or Stefan or anyone else. Just please. End this. Adira pleaded weakly. If this man decides to off her right then and there, she cannot hope to repel him anymore. She's far too weak to even raise her hand. No. I will not stop. They will all die with you. No, they will all die with us, my love. I have placed artifacts that act like bombs triggered with dark magic all around the palace and once they go off, everyone will be swallowed by the dark abyss. No one will ever escape. I shall be the one to end this empire with my own hands. And I will kill the man who dared to take you away from me with my own hands. Leon declared manically as he caressed Adira's pale face under his cold and large hands, slightly trembling. Gambling everything on that slim chance that maybe she can still change Leon's mind, Adira shakily reached out and held Leon's cold hands before speaking, Leon. You said, I was the one stopping you. From your revenge, Leon remained silent as he gazed at Adira softly closing her tired eyes and her head lolling onto his hands. She was breathing very shallowly now. Then, will you stop this? If I remained, no. If I went with you, the man looked surprised which gradually turned to absolute happiness. If she says she will willingly go with him and disappear from the empire forever, then of course, he will stop whatever it is that she wants him to stop. He will still give everything up for her. If she promises to be his, of course, my love, whatever you want. As long as you promise me that you will be mine for eternity. Okay. She quietly breathed out but it was enough for Leon. I won't hold out for long. So I will at least spare you from the pain of helplessly watching me die in your arms, Casey. Notes. Hi. Thank you so much for the loads of votes and comments I received.
really made me happy. Sorry if this took quite a while, I forgot to put this up and slept way too early. So sorry. Anyway, let's keep it rolling just like this. Banzai. Golden orbs. Leon picked Adira up in a princess carry and ran out of the palace through an exit he made at the garden beforehand. When he was still conflicted with himself and was wallowing in anguish when that imbecile mistakenly poisoned Adira. He facilitated his escape with her safely locked in his arms as his mind wandered back to all those years ago when this woman lying vulnerably and weakly in his arms, first found him. Their situation then was the exact opposite of them right now. Adira walked along the garden while watching the hurrying nights of her household in obvious confusion. There was so much unrest that she wondered if they were attacked or something. And why does this scene seem too familiar? While silently keeping to herself and strolling around, Adira passed by a bush that suddenly rustled. She stopped and turned to it, expecting an animal when she swiped the leaves away only to be greeted by golden-hued orbs staring back at her. There was an intense glare in this little boy's beautiful eyes as he bared his fangs at her like a cornered frightened animal. They were just staring at each other, wordlessly, till sounds of clanging armor grew louder and louder that Adira had to push him deeper inside the bush. Adira then promptly turned around when the knights reached her. Little lady, what are you doing here? It is not safe to be out right now. Please, head back inside. Why? What's wrong? She cocked her little head to the side and everyone were immediately worshipping her. It is nothing for you to concern yourself, little lady. It is but only a street rat that wandered in. We aren't sure if it is hostile or not so it is not safe yet. It might bite you, our little lady, and would rather die before that happens. Adira hummed in reply before nodding her head in understanding and she smiled brightly at these old and young men. Millimeter, Adira understands. I will head back inside once I find what I'm looking for. You can all go back to what you're doing now. The knights continued to adore this little angel's smile before their captain knocked each of them on their heads to make them move forward. Move on, you idiots. How dare you bother the little lady. Go. Patrol. He barked at them before the poor knights grumbled and reluctantly proceeded with their jobs. They had begged the Duke Silverus countless times every chance or opportunity that shows up to assign them as their little lady's knights only to be shot down every single time. They once wondered why. Wasn't it important to have at least one knight by the lady's side to protect her at all times? But the Duke would only answer them that there was no need. With his answer they inferred that the lady doesn't need it since she was basically kept inside the castle walls all the time. So she doesn't need one knight monopolizing her. She had an entire army ready to lay down their lives for her. While the captain, who watched his retreating subordinates, turned to Adira, his face immediately turning softer, and secretly handed her a pouch of snacks. Please play inside, little lady. Those guys are easily distracted when they see you. He coaxed her gently and Adira, having a mature mind, quickly understood before bobbing her head and smiled sweetly. The captain was gushing like a mindless puppy at her before feeling the sharp and betrayed glares directed at him. He turned around to find the men he drove away murdering him countless of times inside their bitter heads. He cleared his throat, corrected his posture and regained his strict face before finally leaving Adira alone. After making sure that those knights were already gone and no one was around, Adira finally breathed a sigh of relief. She turned again to the boy she stuffed inside the bushes and helped him up. He was still wearing his fiery and dark glare but Adira didn't mind it. Instead, she took his hands and surreptitiously crept inside and towards her room. She slammed her door shut after she pushed the boy inside. What are you doing? He finally spoke. What does it look like to you? Adira asked him back with the same coldness he displayed to her. But the boy only remained silent and glared at her. Feeling that it won't end with them glaring at each other like this, Adira sighed in defeat. Would you have rather I handed you over to them? I don't know what they'll do to you but I do know it won't be pretty. I can't just leave a boy like you alone in that situation, can I? Especially since the household you just trespassed happened to be a duke's. The boy looked her up and down before blurting out, You're only a girl and I think much younger than me. So, 
You ought to be calling me big brother or something and not boy. Really? You're complaining about that? Look, it doesn't really matter whether I call you big brother or whatever. But what were you doing? Why did you trespass a duke's house? Adira demanded answers from this angry boy that couldn't stop glaring at her. If you weren't cute, I wouldn't have covered for you. I ran away. He answered after a brief pause and his countenance turned darker than it already is. There was immense hatred in his eyes that Adira could only wonder what happened to a boy as young as him to have eyes like those the eyes of a killer. She should know. After all, she did slaughter a capital city from her past life. Who are you planning to kill? Adira asked without warning and completely off topic. She didn't like those eyes. She didn't want him falling into a path very much like her own destruction route. If she could, she wanted to save this poor boy. No one. You can't lie to me. I saved your life just now. I demand honesty from you at least. Notes. A little backstory for everyone. I made sure to update today before I unexpectedly fall asleep again. Also, I'm very happy to announce that we are almost 100k readers. Banzar I. So happy Tilda. Love you lots and lots my darlings. Let's keep it up. P.S. Hi. I decided to change his eye color. Sorry, her new butler. The boy looked melancholic as his eyes darkened even more lifeless and lost. Adira then promptly held his hands with a smack to snap him back to reality before he goes further down. You don't have to answer me. I'm sorry for asking you something like that. Anyway, let's get you cleaned up. The little boy with dirty chocolate locks was frozen while Adira dragged him towards the bath and pushed him in. He glared at her furiously but when he saw and heard her happy laugh, it just melted away. She was as warm as the bath prepared beforehand. He guessed it was supposed to be her since it smelled just like her strawberry and milk scent. It was a sweet and lovely scent. After this, wouldn't he smell just like her? Just the thought of it was enough to make him feel a bit better. I'm sorry. You might not like strawberries and milk but I love them. And this was supposed to be for me but it seems you need it more. Adira informed him as she squatted in front of him like a little puppy peering up at her owner from the edge of the tub. She was incredibly and irresistibly cute. I don't mind. He answered softly. He was gradually melting down and he didn't even notice it. This girl, who was as warm and as bright as sunshine, was unknowingly melting his heart. Days passed and the boy, who introduced himself as Reese, became Adira's butler. At first, it was a hard and difficult discussion to get his father to agree. But eventually, the Duke gave in and allowed Reese to serve Adira as a butler. But it really was more like she adopted him as a playmate. Reese was gradually falling deeper for the girl the more he stayed by her side. And he cannot allow that. He cannot allow anything to stand in between him and his revenge. So a few months after that, it was supposed to be another ordinary day for the both of them but Reese suddenly had something he wanted to tell Adira. Adira, if I asked you to marry me someday, will you? Adira was taken off guard with his sudden proposal and thinking that it didn't matter who she married as long as it wasn't Triton. She nonchalantly yet vaguely answered, I don't mind. But nobles can only marry another noble or a royal. Else, I'll have to forfeit my place as the silverous heir. Though that doesn't sound all that bad. Reese was silent before standing behind Adira and covered her eyes. He didn't want her to see his eyes when he speaks about his darkness. He didn't want to scare her. Reese, I'm an orphan. I lost my family in a battle. We were only farmers and we lived on the outskirts of the fief. There was a battle and we were caught in the middle of it. My father. Well, he picked up a sword to protect me and my mother. But a royal struck him down. They took everything from me. We, who lived peacefully in that land, were slaughtered and tossed aside like livestocks that amounted to nothing more but mere peebles blocking their path. Reese narrated while Adira listened to him silently. She didn't imagine the burden he's been carrying all along was as dark as this. She had no words to say. She cannot find anything that will somehow help him feel a bit better. Reese then finally took his hands off her eyes. So there you have it. That's my darkness. I don't. It's okay, Reese. I'm here. 
I'll always be here. I will always be your friend. I'll be here to listen and give you warmth whenever you need it. I'll pull you back every time you're lost. You don't have to be afraid. Adira cut him off as she engulfed him in a hug when she stood atop her chair and turned to him. Reese was just a child lost in a storm of rage, pain and hatred. She knew that he just needed someone to stay beside him through it all. She knew because she was once like that. But, she had a second chance and Reese didn't. So if she can, she wanted to help and let him see the sunlight again. Adira. You're leaving, aren't you? That's why you told me the pain you've been carrying all these time. Adira guessed and Reese remained silent. It was all she needed to know that she was indeed right. He was planning to leave her. Can you not leave? Adira asked again. If anything, she didn't want to worry about him constantly knowing that he could fall down the wrong path anytime. But even as she asked, Reese still kept his silence. She could only infer his answer as, I need to go. I need to if I want to take you as my wife. I'll come back for you, Adira. I'll come and fulfill this promise. If it's for you, then I can forego this hatred. We will meet again, Adira. He whispered and placed a kiss on her forehead when he gently parted away from her embrace. And when we meet again, I'll be taking you as my wife and give you the glory you deserve. The next day, after their talk, Reese vanished and left the Silverus Castle. Adira, who was staring outside her window dazed, heard the door push open and heard soft patters of footsteps drawing closer to her. It was familiar to her. Adira, I'm back. Casey. Since when did you return? Where were you? What the hell? You didn't tell me anything. I thought you hated me and didn't want to play with me anymore. She ranted, feeling alive and happy again. I went on a school exchange program sponsored by the royalty. How are you? I heard you have a butler. Where is he? Kasumi briefly explained and abruptly changed his question into his main concern. A boy just got close to his future wife. Of course he has to know. Millimeter. He left. Left. Yes. Yesterday. I don't know where he went but he said we will see each other again. Adira answered and the face she wore when he first entered returned to her face. Dazed and distracted. Is that why you're sad? Millimeter. He was like the brother I never had. I didn't want him to leave but he did. I wonder if everyone will eventually leave me in the end. Not everyone. There's me. Really? Then Casey won't leave me as well. You'll stay with me forever. Of course, if that's what you wish. Kasumi answered with a warm smile that was a stark contrast to his frozen face and Adira always loved seeing that. It was then that she thought, even if Case is a common folk, I wouldn't mind forfeiting my position to marry this beauty at all. While Roman on the sidelines thought, damn, this prince is so talkative when he's with this lady. So obvious, your highness. Notes. Hi. My darlings. We're on our way to 6k likes and 100k readers. Yay! Banzar I. Thank you so much for all your support and love. Let's keep it up. Love love love. A pair of monsters. Reese was then adopted into the Ryona household and was renamed as Leon A name befitting an heir of an owl's household. He was also made to dye his hair into a raven's color as his overall air drastically changed as well. It was no wonder Adira couldn't recognize him. There was not a shadow of the little Reese remaining in his self anymore. Leon had changed too much. Leon and Adira were already past the exit and through a loosely guarded path. Adira was still unconscious but in her sleep, she still softly and tearfully called for one name. Casey. Triton, who wanted to be alone to think about Adira's current condition, happened to be strolling along that pathway not frequented by people. He was so deep in his thoughts when he suddenly heard loud and hurrying footsteps drawing closer to his spot and that's when he saw Leon, Casimir's aide and heir of the Ryona household, carrying an unconscious Adira. Leon? He called and the person paused. It was unfortunate that he had to run into Triton of all people but he didn't know anything yet so he might be able to fool him still. Lord Dalriada, what are you doing? Where are you taking Adira? What happened to her? The lady has fallen gravely ill. 
His Highness ordered me to take her to the nearest healer immediately, so if you'll excuse me, my lord. Leon hurriedly stepped sideways and was about to pass by him when he was suddenly stopped by a hand on his arm. Since when did that jerk ever order someone else to touch Adira? What the hell are you doing, Leon? Triton was suspicious of this bastard ever since and even more so now. Kasumi ordering him to take Adira somewhere instead of himself really made no sense. Hell, that madman could drop anything else in the world except for anything that involved Adira. Figuring that Triton has seen through the weak lie he made up on the spot, Leon waved his hands and brandished the same black sword he manifested a while ago against Triton. He was a lot weaker than Kasumi but it didn't mean he was an easy opponent as well. It was even harder now since he was carrying Adira and making sure she wasn't caught in their fight. Kasumi was just a pure monster. No one could top that rabid beast. Do you really think you should be fighting me, Lord Dalriada? What happens if you mistakenly hurt Adira then? Wouldn't she hate you more? Leon tried attacking his psyche and it worked. Triton started to pause and hesitate before attacking and his moves were as plain as day. He even moved like a snail in Leon's eyes. Thank you. Leon graciously yet sarcastically thanked him before he waved a hard attack towards Triton that pushed the man back to a wall and he made a fast break to the garden maze. Triton chased after them but finally lost them in the maze. He felt angry and useless as he started slashing crazily at the tall bushes that made up the garden maze. Damn. Leon, do not do this. Kasumi will kill you if you go down this path. He tried approaching him the other way and tried to incite fear. He knew Leon was loyal to Kasumi and he feared him. But that was where he was wrong. Leon was never once loyal to Kasumi. He purposely acted like a loyal dog, gained his trust to stand by his side and got closer just so he could stand closer and see his beloved Adira always. The woman he chose all those years ago. The girl who promised her life with him. Although he did once or twice or a few times more genuinely feared Kasumi, it was still won over by his hatred towards him snatching his promised wife. And so he did what he did. I don't care, Triton. I'm not a coward like you who can't fight for the woman he loves. I'm different. I will kill whoever I must kill if it means I can have Adira for myself. Triton heard Leon's distant shout. His words struck him deep. Although it did occur to him once, he immediately brushed it off his mind as soon as he thought about it. It was a crime against the crown. And his family was sworn to serve the crown. How could he, a mere branch of the royal family, even dare go against Kasumi, the one true heir? I am not a coward. You are. Why are you taking Adira away and not fighting Kasumi for her in a fair fight? Because I am not stupid like you. The voice sounded more distant and Triton cursed himself. There was no way to find Leon without a height advantage. And just like on cue, a loud flapping of big strong wings with a loud angry roar reverberated and shook the whole palace. It sent cold terrifying shivers down everyone's spines. More so on Leon's. How could it not? He was damn sure the monster was hot on his trail. His back. He didn't even have time to look back as he quickened his steps. He was purely fueled by adrenaline now as he turned on alleys upon alleys just to hide from that pair of monster sapphire and platinum eyes. But no one can hide from Kasumi's and Heiser's combined eagle-like vision. Especially not the one who took their most precious person away. Upon spotting that raven hair speeding across alleys, Heiser swooped down and mirrored his movements. Leon suddenly saw that big looming shadow over him and felt his impending death. They cornered him towards the capital's edges that ended in a steep cliff. And true to his fears, the great demon lord did not think twice and leapt down from the dragon's back. He didn't have enough time to parry or evade Kasumi's attack when Kasumi swiped his sword and flung Leon's weapon away. Kasumi held him by the neck and forced him to drop Adira by tightening his hold around his neck. You should never have done this, Leon. I never really liked you but you were capable and wasn't a bootlicker. And now, you did the one thing I can never forgive you for, Leon Ryona. And with the end of his words for Leon, Kasumi drove his sword through him. There was not a shred of pity or anything in his platinum eyes. 
there was only a fearsome cold anger that will never be thawed. Notes. Hi. I am so happy to read all your lovely emotional comments and had a lot of fun. Thank you for the comments and votes like always, my darlings. And we are 100k readers and 6k votes now. Yay. Banzar I. Let's keep this up, lovelies. Not enough. Kasimi tossed Leon aside and bent down to pick his beloved wife and lock her close in his arms. It was just a short while yet she's here. Unconscious. Again. What the hell did you do, Leon? Why do you take her away from me? He spoke through gritted teeth as he gripped his sword tighter. Hi sir, guarding the only way out of that place, growled fiercely at the man coughing up blood while stumbling back. Leon only replied with a wicked and crazy laugh. It was also sarcastic and bitter that seeped through Casimir's flesh thoroughly. When the hell did I take her away from you? I am only claiming back what is mine. You are the one that stole her away from me. He hatefully spat at Casimir. Casimir didn't even get a word in when Heisa growled dangerously at Leon. He wasn't gonna let him speak like his mother is his possession. And most of all, his mother isn't some trophy to be possessed. Casimir's platinum eyes glinted coldly before bringing Adira closer to Heisa so his son could protect her. He had a business he needs to finish. Heisa covered his mother with his wings and protectively curled his tail around him. Nothing can ever hurt his mother. Not on his watch. They'll have to resign to their fates of turning to ashes should they attempt to hurt her. While Casimir, who stalked towards Leon's wounded figure excruciatingly and terrifyingly slow, picked up his sword again. Leon didn't fear the demon he kept inside him, so he shall etch it painfully well into his soul. Maybe in his next life he'll learn to fear what must be feared. You say you love her, yet you hurt her. Kasumi started and slashed Leon's flesh on his chest. I don't know if my guess is right, but you must be that butler who left her years ago, right? He asked while also carving another deep wound on Leon's skin. Oh, just these isn't enough to calm this blizzard inside of me. And this time, Kasumi kicked his wounds so hard it bled profusely. He alternated strong punches and kicks and didn't stop till Leon's face and body was beaten black and blue. Still not enough. The enraged prince drew his sword again and slowly buried it through Leon's thighs who finally let out a harrowing cry. Not enough. Kasumi did all manners of torture available to him at that moment and it still wasn't enough. His thirst wasn't quenched and the frost wasn't thawed. He couldn't feel anything. It is not enough. Kasumi was about to drive his sword through the poor tortured Leon when he heard Heisa whimpering sorrowfully. He had been keeping tabs on his mother's status while not caring what Kasumi did. And during that time, he had kept her warm. But she was growing colder by the second. Without waiting or even caring what Kasumi would think about his actions, Heisa accumulated blue fire in his chest, the hottest kind of fire dragons were able to use, and blew gently on his mother's cold sleeping profile. He nudged Adira with his snout but she remained unresponsive. His only consolation that it was somehow helping his mother was the color slowly returning to her cheeks. But it wasn't enough to put him at ease. Heisa continued to whimper as he nudged Adira. And Kasumi's heart broke more. He had felt relieved when he saw Adira up again but as soon as he left her even just a short while she fell apart again. Adira. Why are you sleeping again? Why are you turning cold? My wife, in a marriage, there should only be one person who's as cold as ice. And that spot's taken, my love. So please, open your eyes. Casimir's voice broke. Had he not met Roman on the way and sent him to Stefan's side instead, he wouldn't have caught up to Leon and Adira. He would have lost even her lifeless body. He wouldn't have seen her for the last time. But as he watched Heisa try to preserve and warm her, a small spark of hope ignited in his heart. He then thought of the forest's barrier she supplied with her own mana. If the barrier still stands, then Adira was most likely alive and just in a deep sleep. What if? Heisa's fire can burn the poison inside her. Kasumi entertained the crazy thought running through his mind as he watched his son curling around his mother like a protective fortress. And even as he blew gentle yet searing blue fire towards her, 
she wasn't the least bit burned. Even when her dress was ignited with fire, there were no traces of burnt marks on her skin. Fire. Cannot hurt her. Is this. Because of her being a dark magic user like Leon said. Or is it something else? Kasumi thought to himself and finally decided on his course of action. He picked Adira up in a princess carry and climbed up on Heisa's back. Heisa, to the great forest of Koth. Now. And drop that bastard where the guards can see him. I doubt he can still move in that state. The dragon spread his big wings and flew up while gingerly clutching Leon's unconscious form in his claws. He dropped him like what Kasumi said and then proceeded to the forest. Heisa was extra careful about flying while Kasumi took off his jacket and wrapped Adira in it. Her dress was tattered and burnt and he hoped it would provide her cover as well as give her a comforting warmth. It didn't take long before they reached the place. What used to take a whole day worth of travel took less than an hour for Heisa transportation service. He slowly landed and let Kasumi off his back gently. Well, if he wasn't carrying his mother, he would have treated him quite differently. Kasumi let his eyes roam around. He didn't have enough leeway to admire the place's beauty as his top concern was the integrity of the barrier. It was intact even if it was weak and that was a great relief for him. Adira wasn't dead. Just that was enough. The animals, as if talking to themselves, all scattered when they saw Kasumi holding Adira in his arms and Heisa watching them with blue mighty orbs. Maybe Heisa ordered them. Maybe they moved of their own accord. But they returned to the spot and started building a makeshift flower bed where Adira can rest peacefully and comfortably. The forest was a great place for recuperation. Heisa was here to guard her and the forest creatures were there to help. So Kasumi had no worries. He turned around and regarded his son with a small sad smile. I know you will protect your mother regardless of what I say so I can rest easy. I'll be back later. I just have to fix a few things back at the capital. He spoke to Heisa knowing he can understand even if the dragon refuses to show him anything. When his son was like that, he really was just like him. And somehow, that made him proud. Take care of her, my son. Notes. Hi. I'm sorry to inform everyone but from now on, I might be updating less frequently. It might be once a week or I don't know. I'm sorry. Classes had resumed and well, my time will be divided from now on. I hope everyone understands. I will still try to find time to update and do my best to at least do it weekly. Go Menasai. Please continue to support this book even when I'm updating a lot later now. P.S. The book is not yet ending and I hope not to discontinue it. Please continue to shower this book some love. P.P.S. Yes, it is a reference from Game of Thrones. Please tell me if you don't like it or what and I will think about changing it or not. But please, no violent reactions about that please. Love you. That dragon is my son. Kasumi fixed some issues he briefly left unattended while he was preoccupied with Adira. He checked the dungeons to see if Leon was rotting away like he wanted to but he was still unconscious. Stefan was indeed under attack by large numbers of skilled fighters and although he fought great himself, it was still a little too hard for Stefan to fend them off. Roman and a few knights under Kasumi arrived on time before he met an unfortunate end and he slumped down the floor in obvious relief. The king was fine since the palace guards immediately found him, as well as Alexander who was stashed inside a locked box. Well, he woke up and made a ruckus so would miss him, right? Iris was also found together with the king and was sent to a guest room to rest until further instructions. But that didn't mean it was unguarded. She was still under imprisonment for interrogation after all but since the guards didn't know about Kasumi stripping her of her title, they played safe. And lastly, about Heisa. He knew he could not hide Heisa's existence anymore. So he didn't deny anything. Although he made sure they were aware that Heisa was not hostile. However, it could never be as easy as that. About a third of the nobles, that came because of the terror they felt from Heisa's angry roar, refused to believe that the first prince had complete control of Heisa and that the beast would not harm anyone. If none of you tries to hurt anyone from the royal family, of course that dragon will not harm you. Your Highness, 
Please stop saying crazy things. That is a dragon, your highness. They cannot be tamed. That dragon will eventually go crazy and attack even you. And at the words of the brave noble, Kasumi flared together with the drop in temperature. He looked incredibly displeased and frightening. That dragon is my son. Anyone that tries to hurt him is a direct insult to the crown. To me. Don't you dare say he'll go crazy or I will cut your tongue. No one shall dare to hurt my family. He scolded the noble that couldn't help the jolt of terror course through his nerves as he stiffly stood in attention. Although he still wasn't convinced of Heiser's docility, he didn't want to push any more of Casimir's buttons. Regrets never came first, after all. So the noble chose to back down and submit to this berserking crown prince. They even wondered where the Lady Silveris was. Where was she when they needed her as a stopper for this beast? While on Adira and Heisa's side, the dragon was still little by little providing Adira warmth by breathing blue fire towards her and imparting back some of his mana to her. It was his chance to be the one to help his mother. He cannot fail her. Adira was slowly regaining her warmth and healthy color and she was also not squirming uncomfortably in pain anymore. She looked like she was only sleeping now. Heisa light beside her flower bed. He kept her sleeping figure company hoping that when she opens her eyes, he'll still be the first she sees. He behaved like a melancholic yearning son waiting for his mother to open her eyes and show him love again. Adira. The sleeping lady heard a voice call her and she bolted up before whipping her head around to scan the place. She was in a quiet green meadow with dandelions scattered around and a soft breeze blowing past her, making her hair flow like waves. It was a very peaceful place. There were no creatures around. She was alone. But she knew she heard a voice. Adira, my child. The voice came again and that made her jump up to her feet in fright. She continued to turn round and round, trying to find the owner of that cold yet soothing voice calling for her but she couldn't see her. It sounded sophisticated and lovely, like the soft tinkling of bells. It sounded divine. Who? Who's there? Adira risked asking the ghost why voice. She should be a ghost herself. So what's there to fear, right? Hello, sweet little girl. A woman, with elf-like pointy ears, white golden silky straight hair and smooth porcelain white skin with platinum eyes, appeared before her. The woman version of Kasimi. C.A. Casey. Casey is a girl. Oh goodness. Even in my dreams, am I fantasizing Casey as a woman? Well that sly handsome bastard is too beautiful for his own good. Why do you have to be such a beauty that can even trample a girl's beauty? What the heck is with that guy's level of attractiveness? Adira ranted on and on before she was cut by a giggle that rang like a soft happy melody. And she immediately fell in love. My son chose a fascinating one indeed. Son? She's Kasimi and Stefan's mother. What a beautiful person. Sweet child, would you please tell me how Kasimi's faring? Is he that same cute little crystal that shines with the morning sun? Madam, I think you're talking about a different Kasimi. He's dark all right. He's gloomy and cold. Although he's not with me. But he's still cold. Are you talking about the first Prince Kasimi? Adira asked, doubtful about the person she was describing. But she only knew one Kasimi in the entirety of the empire. Who else, dearest? Is my little crystal doing fine? How about my shy and silent Stefan? Shy? In which part of that idiotic prince is shy? And silent? Madam, he's as noisy as an ostrich. The second prince, Prince Stefan is very lively, sunny and bright. He's very popular with the noble ladies and he's very handsome. He's doing well on his duties as the empire's prince and there is nothing to worry about him. Casey um Prince Casimir's doing well too. He's a genius at various fields even beating specialists of their respective fields and very strong. He's... He's just the best. Adira's voice turned soft after speaking about Casimir. She misses him so much. She didn't regret how she selflessly sacrificed herself in his stead. What she did regret was how she didn't say goodbye to him properly nor tell him what she wasn't able to say to him sooner. 
she regretted how she can no longer see him and Heiser again. Celia, who noticed and figured out what Adira was feeling, smiled softly. Although her son was too forceful at scheming to tie her to him, he chose the right person. So she felt happy. She loved Adira almost immediately. She knew she would be a great wife and companion for her son, as well as grow to be the greatest empress someday. Dear child, it's about time you woke up. The people you've left behind. They're hurting so much. The pain is changing them for the worst. You cannot leave them, dear. Kasumi, your child, Heisa, your family, there's too many people who will break apart if you leave. So, wake up, were her parting words after she felt satisfied with finally meeting the woman that managed to capture both of her sons, and quite possibly a lot more. The woman who had nothing to say about them but good words. Even though she knew that it wasn't everything the sweet lady had to say. The woman who miraculously made the last divine dragon love her wholeheartedly. The woman who thought the frozen heart of her son that froze when she left them too soon. Listen dear. Listen to them calling you back. Adira heard her say and closed her eyes to focus her senses. It was then that she heard a soft poignant sob. She opened her eyes and saw a little raven-haired child with striking sapphire eyes marred with large beads of tears. He looked somewhere about five or six years old. He was bawling his eyes out as he cried for his mother. Adira didn't know why but his cries tugged painfully at her heartstrings as every sob reverberated loudly in her ears and clenched her heart tightly. He looked very heartbroken. Hi sir. Oh, my poor baby. Notes. Hi. Just dropping it here since I'm not yet too busy. Might as well grab the chance to update. Thank you for the words of support and love. You guys really are the best. Thank you for understanding. Love you guys a loot. Banzai. As long as it's you. Adira, it's a little messy in the palace so I opted to place you here. Here in the forest where you found our son, you'll be able to rest properly. Oh, Heisa is here protecting you so don't worry. I will also stay for a few days more before returning to the capital and finish some work. Did you know? Heisa turned into a child while trying to save you. I guess it's a coping mechanism to conserve his mana. He's very handsome. He's got your cute upturned eyes and butterfly-like long eyelashes. He has shiny raven hair. And he's aloof just like me. He really seems more like our child now that he turned into a boy. My wife, everything is my fault, isn't it? I mean, when I made you my fiancé, I knew these things would happen eventually. I knew I was placing you in grave danger. But I still selfishly chose what I wanted. I'm sorry. I cannot let you go. I cannot live without you. So please, come back to me. Kasimi, crestfallen, spoke to the sleeping Adira as he softly caressed and combed her long ash-like hair. As soon as he finished cleaning up some issues back at the capital, he hurried back to the forest. He didn't expect anything but he hoped to be there when she wakes up. And since the barrier was a little too weak because of Adira's unconscious state, it was a lot easier to come and go even without permission. So, that aspect was a little bit worrying him. Although he knew Heisa wouldn't allow any harm to come to Adira, he can't help but worry for her. He held her hand, brought it to his face and leaned on her touch that was fortunately warm again. He closed his eyes and savored the feeling, imagining that she was indeed holding him like that. If there is a god out there, can you please return her to me? Please don't take her away. I don't pray often nor believe any one of you exist, but please, hear me. He opened his eyes to gaze at the sleeping maiden before softly placing a kiss on her pink lips. He doesn't believe in fairy tales, but it was worth a try. Adira heard Kasumi's samba voice and even though she was desperate to hug him, comfort him, tell him that it wasn't his fault. She can't. She walked forward and forward, till eventually she ran and ran to follow his voice and return to his side. To his and Heisa's side. Casey, Casey, it's not your fault. It never was. I chose to protect you. I wanted to. So please don't blame yourself. Casey, Casey. A small voice rang so loud in Casimir's ears that jolted him back to focus and pulled away to find grey eyes look towards him with tears running down her beautiful face. 
Casey. She whined softly and raggedly when the man wasn't responding or anything. He just sat there, silently staring at her as if he was just dreaming. Adira. Adira. Are you? Are you really awake? Or is this just one of my dreams? Ah. Oh. I must have fallen asleep in my desk again. But. But this is just too good of a dream. Can I? Can I stay here with you a little while longer? Adira paused briefly as she stared at him. Asterisk there's nothing to cry for. I want you to know that. As long as it's you. This pain couldn't hurt me. So, there's no reason to blame yourself. Adira shakily reached out her hands and gently wiped the tears streaming down Kasumi's face, who didn't notice that he himself was crying. He held her hands tightly, afraid that if he let go then he'll wake up and find himself in his desk again. He had dreamed of scenes just like this, where he finally saw her beautiful ash-like eyes open and gaze back at him again. Please don't let me wake up. Let me remain here by your side. Let me stay where I can see you, hear you and feel you. Don't leave. I've never begged anyone for anything before but I am begging you now. Don't leave me please. Kasumi repeated and oh how Adira's heart ached at watching the strongest, coldest and most apathetic man in the empire break down in tears. How the proudest person had fallen to his knees and begged her fervently, repeatedly. Adira watched Kasumi's tears and Haisa, who was peeking behind Kasumi, and thought of how to make him believe she had woken up and it wasn't a dream anymore. He wasn't dreaming and she had found her way back to them. Casey. While I was sleeping, I didn't think you'd still pull for kisses. From me. She spoke lightly in a poor attempt of cracking a joke. The prince smiled weakly and sadly at this. Even in his dreams, his wife was still as quirky and happy as he remembered her to be. It made him not want to wake up from his dreams even more. This is a really great dream. You're joking and I'm smiling. You're alive and awake and I get to see your lovely eyes and hear your sweet voice. Let it last a little longer please. Kasumi closed his eyes as he snuggled against her warm palms. He was contented even if it was a dream. He was a little bit happy even though he knew it wouldn't last and he'll wake up to the bitter truth again. It has almost been a week now. Adira still wasn't waking up. Although she wasn't hurting anymore, she still wasn't opening her eyes so he still couldn't be rest assured. How many times have you dreamt of me waking up to eventually mix reality and dreams? What? Must I do? So you'll believe this is? Real? You don't have to do anything. Just stay by my side and look as beautiful as you do. That'll be perfect. He reiterated perfectly what she said to him all those months ago when those foolish and stupid nobles were talking behind her back because of Latifolia's daughters. Words. Adira's words were his truth and he remembered every single one of them by heart. Even what she told him when they first met, when she was only a pretty little six-year-old princess of the Silverus household. He could still remember as if it was yesterday. Of course. I'll always stay beside you, Casey. Like how I'll let you leave me. Adira said, pulled him down by his collars in one strong pull that had all the strength she briefly accumulated in that short time, and placed a searing kiss on his lips. Don't tell me even with that you still won't believe that all of these are real. Notes. Hi. Asterisk that part came from a song that I've been obsessed with lately. It's called Gallows Bell. If you have time please do have a listen to it. I just thought the words were beautiful and fit Adira perfectly. Thank you for the comments and votes like usual. Love you guys. My dearest, this dream. Feels too real. Seriously Casey. I'm running out of ideas how to prove that this. Is not your dream. Adira weakly complained and plopped back to her soft flower bed. Kasumi once again froze on his spot before a tiny child leapt past him, pushing him out of the way, and plopped on top of Adira. He nuzzled his teary face against her chest and bawled really hard. Adira was stunned for a while as her heart felt like it was being stabbed with large knives a thousand times and beaten with a steel hammer as she listened to the child's cries. She also felt the little boy was too familiar, especially with that beautiful clear sapphire eyes. Hi, sir. Baby, is that you? Adira asked. 
The little boy briefly looked up to her while the tears continued to flow unceasingly and nodded softly. Adira, then, didn't hold back and almost crushed the little boy in her embrace. Baby. Mommy is very sorry. Mommy hurt you so bad. Mommy made you cry. I'm so sorry. I couldn't do anything while watching you cry and my heart hurts so bad. Mommy is very sorry, baby. Please forgive mommy. Mommy is a very bad person who hurt her precious baby. Adira was now crying as well. She couldn't hug him in her arms as she heard and watched him cry in her dreams. No matter how she itched to embrace the poor little child, she couldn't and it frustrated her so much. She knew she needed to find her way back to them. Haisa, who had turned into a little boy, shook his head in response and hugged her tighter. He was trying to tell her that it wasn't her fault, that she wasn't a bad person at all, and that she was his beloved mother so, of course, he'll forgive her anytime and for whatever it was. Watching the woman, a bit young to be a mother, and the little child he saw guarding her, Kasumi finally snapped out of it and knew it wasn't a dream. Here was his wife, instinctively knowing that the child was her son while their son didn't even hesitate to push him, the father out of the way to get to his mother's embrace. What's with this difference in treatment, my son? But, that doesn't matter now. What matters is Adira's up. Adira has woken up. Adira. You're up. Adira. Adira. I'm here, Casey. I'm not going away again. Adira weakly smiled before opening up her other arm to invite the man, who was overtaken by his emotions, for the first time in forever to join their embrace and complete Heisa's family, and Kasumi hesitated no more. He opened up his arms and engulfed both his wife and son in his warm and tight embrace. They were complete again. They can finally be happy again. Thank you, God. Thank you however powerful being returned Adira to me. Thank you for giving me back my world. Kasumi murmured against Adira's hair as he nuzzled against her and breathed in her scent a mix of the flowers scent where she lay for a few days. Oh Casey, I'm so sorry. It isn't your fault, my dearest. The things that happened to me aren't yours to bear. I chose to protect you. Truthfully, had our roles been reversed, I might have gone crazy by now. What did you say? Seriously, Kasumi? I'm here pouring out my heart and you're not listening. Are you kidding me? No. No. What? Did you call me, my dearest? Adira replied nonchalantly and as calmly as she could, while Kasumi was practically rubbing his ears in case he was just hearing things. What? Adira sighed as she watched the man be stunned silly before cupping his face and, once again, placed a gentle kiss on his lips. I love you, Prince Kasumi Athanasius Rosen Vasilis. My dearest, so you cannot leave me or cheat on me or exchange me for someone else from now on. Or else, I will not hesitate to burn you and your mistress alive. Adira threatened and her fiery brilliance finally shone on her ash-gray orbs again and Kasumi couldn't be happier. He never even once thought about that but he loved her blazing possessiveness. He loved every part of her. Every part. Be it inside or outside. He loved her to death. I love you, my wife. I love you too. This is the happiest I've ever been. You cannot imagine how much your words have made me happy. Kasumi replied before raining kisses on Adira's lips, eyes, nose, cheeks, forehead, basically all over her face. Now, he finally knew where he stood in her life. He finally, ultimately, and successfully tied her to him. It was a long journey but it was worth it. Waiting and scheming and everything was worth it because it was Adira. Kasumi was still floating on cloud nine when he felt something claw at his chest and pushed him away while angrily pounding cute little fists on his chest. The little raven boy, Heisa in his child form, pouted indignantly and angrily. He was stealing his mother right in front of him. The audacity of his father, Mo. Mommy. Heisa too. Kiss Heisa too. He babbled and Adira just melted into a soft goo of motherly love, quickly forgetting her and Kasumi's declaration of their mutual love and raved about how Heisa called her mommy for the first time. She was just like a new mom finally hearing her baby's first words. 
C-A-C-A-K-C. Cassie, did you hear that? Hi sir. Hi sir called me mommy. He called me mommy. She screamed joyously and shook Kasumi vigorously. It was crystal clear how overjoyed she was. Baby, baby, call me mommy again. Adira enthusiastically blabbered and asked Heiser to repeat his words. Mommy tilde Heiser kiss, kiss, while the child continued to demand his long due kisses. Of course, with all due pleasure, mommy will kiss baby a whole loot tilde mommy loves baby Heiser the most tilde baby's the best. Adira cried while peppering kisses all over Heiser's little round face as well as tightly encasing him in a hug. She was going crazy from happiness. And of course, Heisa as well, while also sending smacks towards his father, speaking wordlessly, I'm the best. She loves me the most. Mommy said so. And the prince, who was over the moon, sat by the sidelines watching them, already forgotten. But it was fine. His wife and son were having fun. So it was damn fine. Notes. Here it is. Well apparently I still updated every day even then. But at least I have already informed you all about my circumstance and won't be shocked when I suddenly cannot update for a few days. Thank you for the comments and votes as usual. Let's keep this up. Banzai. Mommy's only baby. Kasumi laid beside Edira after the lady exhausted herself after her short burst of excitement. But technically not. You see, there exists a raven wall in between them that kept himself plastered against his wife. He looked like an abandoned husband with the wife focusing more on the child. Baby, how did you turn into a child? How long have you known how to do that? Why didn't I know about that? She interviewed the child snuggling perfectly and comfortably in her arms. He was a dragon my whole past life. He never once appeared as a boy in front of me. He cutely peered up to her with brilliant shining sapphire gems and answered, Heisa becomes what mommy wants most. So because I wanted power in my previous life, he remained a dragon. So why is he a boy right now? So you wanted a child? I can always give you one, you know? You only need to tell me. Kasumi interjected to remind them that he was still there and just lying beside them. Adira and Heisa both turned to him, each wearing an expression of their own. One was too red, she might set the flower bed on fire and one was burning in anger he might also set the flower bed on fire. What is this idiot father putting inside mommy's head? I am mommy's only baby. What the heck are you talking about? Casey, I didn't think you're as perverted as your brother. Adira whined while her voice sounded annoyed in an attempt to hide her embarrassment from his words. Wrongfully dragging Stefan again. How could he think that I wanted a child just because Heiser turned into a boy? Seriously this man... The moment he confirms my feelings, he suddenly moves forward by leaps and bounds. There's nothing to be embarrassed about, Lady Silverus. We'll soon be wed anyway. What's the difference? Kasumi, having fun with finally having the chance to tease and enjoy his wife's reaction, pushed further and moved a little bit closer to them when Heiser suddenly blocked his torso with his tiny feet. No. Heiser is mommy's only baby. Only Heiser. The dragon turned child whined jealously which melted Adira's heart. Artilda of course, my little baby. You are mommy's only baby. Adira cooed and cuddled the jealous child. And the latter just stuck a tongue out towards his father that planned to jeopardize his position as his mother's only child. Little Heisa, sooner or later you'll eventually have a younger sibling, you know. Their family stayed at the Great Forest of Koth for a few more days to allow Adira to recover completely, fix a few holes on the barrier and Kasumi infusing it with his own mana to shoulder half of the burden of Adira's mana consumption, so she could use it to replenish herself instead. Thus, the barrier gained another attribute to its composition. Not only was it composed of dark magic and phoenix fire, the ice dragon was now added to it. Oh. So you're a dragon as well, Casey? Adira's eyes gleamed as she studied the white dragon's mark wrapping around the red phoenix's mark while gently tracing it with her fingers. Kasumi briefly nodded at her with a smile before it morphed into a frown as he turned to the other mark as dark as onyx stones within the phoenix mark, as if it was protecting it. 
Is Adira truly a dark magic user? He turned to his wife, who was now playing and fussing on their child again, and arrived on a decision he knew would have been his answer whatever happened. Not that he wanted any other option. I'll always protect you. Whatever happens, I won't allow you to leave me again. He muttered while hugging Adira from behind. Adira smiled helplessly as she softly patted his arm wrapped around her waist tightly and his head buried on the nook of her neck, his silvery white hair tickling her. He was as clingy and as needy as a child like Heiser. You always have protected me in Heiser. At least, let me protect you as well. And I distinctly remember I told you that I am not leaving you and you also cannot leave me, right? She replied before turning around within his embrace and pecking him softly on his cheeks and blushed, she still wasn't used to showing much of her affection. That's not how you do it, my wife. This is how you do it. Kasumi smirked and lightly pushed her chin up before meeting her halfway and placing a lasting and fervent kiss on her delicious cherry red lips, which made her even more red. Adira still wasn't finished blushing before feeling a tug on her skirt and she looked down to an expecting, shining, and sparkling sapphire orbs, patiently waiting for his turn. She smiled happily before squatting down and gave the little guy a kiss on his forehead, nose, and cheeks, adding a tight hug into his package as well. Shall we go home? Adira asked and Heisa automatically changed into a dragon for faster transportation. Adira, who wasn't yet aware of the fact that Heisa's existence had been revealed, told him to land at the forest they once hid when they did that scary stunt and the latter obeyed. Together, they returned to the capital. Only difference now was, there was a child in between this beautiful couple. The people who knew them all had their jaws hanging open as their gazes followed them and unconsciously their feet as well. This attractive family were walking around and visiting various shops as they toured their child around while heading towards the palace. They came across this sweet stall that sold huge cotton candies and this family stopped. The old woman shopkeeper, who was as nosy as the old woman from the neighborhood, looked at them with very happy eyes before she commented, What a lovely family. You, young man, have a very beautiful wife and child. How lucky. Apparently. She didn't recognize Kasumi, the prince. Well, how could she? Aside from her eyesight not as well as during her prime, the man exuded a warm and happy aura and smiled every now and then. Especially when the woman beside him smiled at him. Too different from the cold-hearted prince they used to know. Indeed, madam. I am very, very lucky and blessed. He happily replied and paid a very huge amount for one cotton candy. The shopkeeper, confused, called out to them as they walked away and returned the extra money. Kasumi only smiled and pushed it back to her while saying, Please, keep it. And sped walk to catch up with his wife and child sharing the sweet candy. Notes. Hi. I'm back with an update again. I made it light and happy this time. In hopes that everyone is happy as well. Or if you're not. I hope this chapter influences you to be happy today. Thank you for the comments and votes as always. My lovelies tilde tilde you guys are the best tilde tilde let's keep this up always. Banzar. Adira. W-A-A-A-I-T. Who amongst you plan to take my child? Come out and fight me. Heisa is mine. My baby is mine. Kasumi. My wife. No one's taking Heisa away from you. Calm down. You're burning the author. Hi sir, I'm my mother's child. I'm sorry but I only love my mommy. Asterisk bow asterisk. Author. Yeah. I'm used to it. Anyway Tilda please don't take the little dragon away or hell will arise here. That'll be all. Banzai? Hi sir's family. The family continued on their stroll back to the palace. Adira and Hi sir walked hand in hand ahead of Kasumi while the latter carried whatever Adira bought for the child. Not that he minded it anyway. If anyone minded it, it would only be the onlookers. The citizens were just very shocked with the scene they were seeing. To live the day they would see their proud prince follow behind a lady like an assistant while carrying her things. Papa, up. Up. Kasumi heard a little voice cry excitedly before his father smiled and raised the child up high before letting him sit on his shoulders. 
It made him pause and stare. He wanted to try that as well. He hurried and caught up with his wife and son. He suddenly blocked their way and placed the bags down and crouched low. Do you want to ride on my shoulders? He suddenly asked Hysa. Adira and Hysa both blinked in confusion before one held a look of slight disgust and annoyance while the other glittered brightly. Yes, that's a good idea. Go baby, you should ride daddy's shoulders while you can. Adira beamed happily as she successfully attracted both of their attention. Hysa's face now had a firm reluctance and disapproval while the father's eyes brilliantly gleamed in happiness at hearing his wife call him the child's daddy. They felt more like a family even more now. Kasimi, pumped up and raring to go, hooked his arms under Hysa's armpits and picked him up before letting him sit on his shoulders without waiting nor warning the latter which startled his poor soul. He stiffly sat on Kasimi's broad shoulders and looked down to his mother with a panicked face which slowly melted away when he saw her happy, excited and beautiful smile. She was having so much fun. Fine. I'll endure this humiliation for now. If it makes mommy happy. Hysa resigned and grabbed a fistful of Kasimi's silver locks out of fear of falling but more on frustration. It was his fault he was being humiliated right now. He just had to suggest this kind of ignominy. He could reject his father but he didn't want to disappoint his mother so he'll endure it well. Adira was about to pick up the stuffs Kasimi placed down briefly when he bent down and picked it up before she could. Casey, I can bring some of the bags. You have Hysa on your shoulders so you need to support him so he doesn't fall. She said and held out her open palm to take the bags. Kasimi stared at her empty hand briefly before he transferred the bags on his other hand instead and let it hang off his elbows and used the hand he freed to hold hers. Let's go, was all he said and pulled her forward. What the hell? Who's giving this guy lessons on how to smoothly sweep a woman off her feet? I really need to give that person an award. Adira thought as she blushed furiously and hid her face with her hand which only made Kasimi smugly smile as he felt her rising heat being transmitted with their interlinked hands. Hysa was just watching these from up above and tightened his hold on Kasimi's hair in jealousy. He did this on purpose. So he gets to hold mommy's hand. That should be me. My son, I want to monopolize your mother as well, you know. The father and son duo understood each other's intentions too well. They didn't need to voice out their concerns. Well, the both of them were just throwing schemes against each other to monopolize Adira. And the people, that couldn't seem to tear their eyes from this sparkling family, was, as expected, fed dog food again. Well, they shall partake on it willingly this time. They soon arrived at the palace and the guards' jaws dropped at the sight presented before them unexpectedly. Not only was the Lady Silverish returning safe and sound, the both of them now had a new addition. They had a child. They must have hid this child judging by his age and only brought him back now when everything calmed down. Yo your highnesses Prince Kasimi and La Lady No, Princess Adira. The guards abruptly corrected themselves and rectified how they addressed Adira from now on. There was no doubt about it now. Their cold-hearted and scheming prince had secured his place as the lady's husband without wasting time. Kasimi, feeling jubilant and proud, presented a rare smile and nodded at the mere lowly gate guards. It was the rarest of rare events in their empire. Even rarer than the eclipse. What what what? PP princess. Adira sputtered. She had just recovered from her earlier embarrassment and now, she was blushing bright red again. Give me a break. Kasimi didn't linger on the gates and pulled Adira in, while Hysa worriedly glanced at his mother walking uncomfortably with her head bent down. Mommy Tilda he called in a cute little worried voice and Adira's head immediately snapped up to acknowledge him. Yes, baby, mommy's here. I want mommy Tilda he cooed cutely playing his cards right and roping Adira to tell his idiot father to let him down. Artilda mommy wants baby too. She happily replied which earned a big bright smile from the child before it froze when he heard what she said next. But stay on your father's shoulders for a while. We're still a little bit far from the palace and mommy doesn't want baby to be exhausted, okay. Kasimi smirked at this and felt the child's disappointment. It's still a little while before you can replace me yet. 
When they reached the palace, it was just in time for dinner to be served. So they ate dinner before retreating to their rooms. The king was currently away on business he was just actually on the silverous fief and discussing things with Silfa and Andrea about the status of their daughter that he occasionally gets from Kasimi and was unaware of their return. Since Kasimi and Adira were yet to be married, they had to follow rules and sleep separately. And, of course, it was a no-brainer on which room Heisa would sleep. He'd rather turn back to a dragon if his father won't allow him to sleep with his mother. Kasimi accompanied them to their room first and Adira sang Heisa a lullaby to lull him to sleep. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy, when skies are grey. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. A few more repeats of the short lullaby and Heisa was sound asleep tucked under the covers. Now, it was the bigger baby's turn to be tucked in. Do you want me to accompany you back to your room? She carefully asked to which the other just shook his head in reply. I just wanted to watch you. I'll go back now, Kasimi said and turned around. Adira at least accompanied him towards the door before he casted a brief glance towards Heisa who was now sleeping peacefully on Adira's bed, while the latter followed his gaze and smiled softly. You know what, Casey? I think I figured out why Heisa turned into a boy. She suddenly murmured and seized the man's attention, as if it ever left her. With a confused gaze on his face, Adira turned to him with a smile. I wanted us to become Heisa's family, a real family. Notes. Hey Tilda I'm here with your daily dose of updates and asterisk ehim asterisk dog food asterisk ehim asterisk again. Anyway, thank you so much for all the followers I suddenly got. It was so overwhelming when I opened my inbox. Thank you so much guys. It is such a great honor. And as usual, thank you for the comments and votes that you always give me. Thank you also for the overwhelming love. P.S. Adira Kasimi's not giving Heisa to anyone. The dragon would burn you if you force it. LOL. Love you Guis. Banzar I. Dragon or not. Kasimi gazed into the woman's warm and lovely eyes that held undeniable love for the child sleeping on her bed and felt himself fall in love with her all over again. This kind soul was too mesmerizing, too pure to be tainted and too beautiful that sometimes... It scared him that he might eventually break her. But she wasn't as fragile as he thought she was. His wife was one of the most bravest and strongest person he knew and he was damn proud of her. Drowning in his overflowing love for her, he dipped his head and placed a soft kiss on her lips and whispered, We are a family. We might not be tied by blood but is our son. No matter what anyone says, dragon or not, Heiser will always be our firstborn. Adira smiled at the reassuring and firm finality in Kasimi's voice and wrapped her arms around his torso as she whispered her gratitude. Meeting um bumping into him, getting engaged with him and falling in love with him were the best decisions Adira made in her second life. At first she was scared that she would eventually fall for Triton all over again and walk down the same life again. But Kasimi changed it all. From the moment she first met him to when she eventually fell for him, he had changed her life drastically. Thank you, Casey, for being Heisa's father and for being my fiancé. I'll ultimately be your husband though. So shouldn't you start calling me as one, my wife? Adira smiled sweetly and just when Kasimi was expecting her to give in to his teasing, she lightly kissed him on his lips and said, Maybe after we're married, your highness. So you'll have something to look forward to. The king, Anastasius, returned the next day and found Adira, of course with Kasimi beside her, and immediately felt joy overflow in his heart. The girl had become like his real daughter now, well, it eventually will give him that it's Kasimi we're talking about here. He approached them and the girl curtsied low in respect. Greetings, your majesty. She greeted before straightening her posture and was engulfed in a warm embrace. It's great to see you up already child. It really is great. Adira smiled warmly as she always felt the king resembled her father sometimes and thanked him wholeheartedly. Kasimi, reaching his limit of allowing anyone to touch his wife, pulled Adira back. Really, you don't change at all, Kasimi. Hello, father. He greeted briefly. Your Majesty. 
although you just came back, I'm sorry but I won't linger long. I want to return home as soon as possible. Adira expressed her regret about departing as soon as the king returned but she didn't have much choice. She and Kasimi already talked about it and the latter didn't argue. Oh. About that? There's nothing to worry about. Actually Anastasia started and halfway turned to point at something before he was interrupted by a child calling his mother and dashing towards their way. Mommy. Anastasia's eyes widened in surprise as he watched the child leap into the girl's arms while the latter automatically opened her arms to receive him naturally. And that's not all. Even his son, Kasimi, opened his and took him off the girl's arms and up to his shoulders. Mo mommy? What the hell? A man's surprised cry rang so loud and successfully attracted everyone's attention towards him. He was just a few steps away from the king and this is what he sees the moment he catches up to him. He learns his daughter and her bastard fiancé had a child. When? F.A. father. Adira exclaimed, completely oblivious of the man's rumbling dangerous aura, and dove into her father's arms. She really missed him too. My sweet angel. Welcome back. And just like with Kasimi, he abruptly cools down when she hugs him. Silpha returned Adira's embrace with a tight one. It had felt so long since he last saw her as healthy and as lively as this. He really feared that she might not ever wake up again but he believed in his strong and brave daughter. Dearest, this is just perfect. I've come to take you home and I'm annulling your engagement with the prince. Silpha suddenly announced that floored everyone present. Most especially Kasimi and Adira. Be you but father. Why? Just, are you my mommy's daddy? A tiny voice interrupted Silpha and he looked down to see cute sapphire orbs looking up to him with wonder and excitement. Yes baby, it's your grandfather. Father, this is Heisa. Adira informed Heisa the right way to call Silpha and introduce the child to her father while she was at it. Grandfather. Heisa cheered and grabbed the hard-hearted and cold Duke Silverus hand who couldn't resist the child's charms and immediately forgot what he wanted to say as he melted against Heisa's cuteness. Dear Lord, such a cute child Tilda Tilda Silva cooed and rubbed Heisa's cute chubby cheeks, drunk from Heisa's adorableness. Good job, son. Wow, Casey. Nice play. I didn't think you'd use Heisa like that. Adira whispered as she watched her father happily play with Heisa as he tossed the child lightly in the air and the latter giggled happily. And Kasimi just shrugged his shoulders nonchalantly. He'd do whatever it took to keep Adira and the family that she dreamed of in his hands. No one can ever take it away from him. Not even his own father or his soon-to-be father-in-law. Look at your cuteness. You really look like my baby girl when she was your age. Silpha rambled feeling extreme happiness coursing through his nerves and making him forget his gripe and his concern. And Heisa, who was complimented that he looked like his mother, couldn't be more happier while reddish tints coated his cheeks. It was, by far, the best compliment he received. While Anastasia stared at his firm and cold friend come undone as soon as the child called him grandfather. Really? He turns idiotic when it concerns his family. Anastasius grumbled inside his head as he looked at Silpha with mockery and scoffed. What's so good about a child that looked like Kasimi when he's silent? Heisa, who noticed the king didn't have a good impression of him when he met his eye as he reluctantly sat on his father's shoulders a while ago, turned to him with a beaming smile. And another heart fell prey to this sly dragon who knows how to play his cards right. It was better to be sure that no one tries to break his mother and father apart. Not that he really liked his father but his mother did, so he needs to keep him around. Then Anastasius joined Silpha in fussing and being an idiot over their grandchild. Wait. They do know I didn't give birth to Heisa, right? Notes. Hi. If he noticed, there was redundancy in one of the adjectives that described Adira and that was on purpose. LOL. I wanted to make it that Kasimi thought very highly of her. Hence, the redundancy. But anyway, thank you for the flood comments that I enjoyed so much and the votes. Oh. As well as those that followed me. Such a great honor guys. Love you so much. We are also a little ways to 9k. Yay.
Banza I. Saved Daddy's soul. So now that Adira didn't need to hurry home, Anastasius invited the Silverist father daughter over for a meal. Silpha, who didn't let go of Hysa, made the child sit on his shoulders and quite easily agreed to the king's invitations. Although this was unusual to everyone, since Silpha loved to contradict the king at everything, Adira knew it was because of Hysa and his newfound love for his grandchild. She couldn't help but giggle as she watched the relief on Casimir's face that was so stiff, cold, and empty a while ago. Dear baby, you just saved your daddy's soul. Good job. While Hysa was preoccupied with the king and the duke's attention and love poured all over him and Adira busying herself watching over the elders not to stress Hysa out too much, Kasumi took the chance to slip out for a while to get something. Adira noticed him leave from the corner of her eye and placed her tea cup down. They transferred to the garden to have tea after they finished their meal, which honestly took so much time due to the elders fussing over what and how much Hysa should eat. She also slipped away surreptitiously and followed Kasumi. As much as Kasumi wanted to have her for himself, she does too. It wasn't only him that wanted to monopolize the other. She always wanted Kasumi's time to be hers and hers only. After we confessed to each other, I got greedier, huh? Adira smiled warmly. Her greed didn't necessarily mean it was a bad thing, right? She just loves him that much. She saw Kasumi enter his study and followed after him when she briefly paused after hearing a girl's voice come from inside. It was the same voice that haunted her every day from her past life and also even now. Your Highness, I'm sorry for being here even though you don't want the lady to see me. Adira didn't need her to finish her sentence when she burst in and grabbed the woman's face. She was heating up and she was ready to explode marvelously in this leech's face. She didn't know why but seeing this kind of scene in front of her, with this woman looking lost and pitiful and innocent like that she couldn't help but be reminded of. Those times she used the same trick on her past fiancé, Triton, and even those when she tried to seduce Kasumi. Hey Adira, what are you going to do to me? What else can you do but burn? A fiery dangerous glint in her ashen eyes frightened Iris so much as she felt Adira's hands gradually warming up that it eventually felt searing. Stu stop. What are you doing? Help. Adira felt all of her pent-up frustrations bubbling up from the deepest pits of her core and slowly felt herself losing control. It was then that she felt strong and warm arms snake around her torso and lovingly pulled her closer to him before she felt him kiss her cheeks. That's enough, my wife. But when she heard that, she thought that her man was defending his mistress. Let go of me. I told you you're not allowed to cheat on me cause I will not hesitate to burn you and your woman. No can do. My woman cannot be burned. Fire doesn't work on her. We'll see about that. Let go of me, Kasumi. I can't. Cause then, you'll dirty your lovely hands. He said and slid his fingers on the spaces between hers and lifted it up to place a kiss on them. Instantaneously cooling down the raging volcano inside his wife, but really, he was also using a spell to cool her down. He loved to see her jealous but he didn't want to see her regret something from an impulse or from losing control of herself. My wife doesn't even need to lift her hands to deal against commoners. Commoner? I stripped her father of his title when the results of the investigation came in. She was also the one who used Leon to drug you. So you figured it out. Adira whispered softly and finally calmed down. Since Kasumi had dished out his punishment and stripped her of her title, any more would be her bullying the weak, right? I'm sorry. She apologized to Kasumi and hung her head in shame. She just went ballistic a while ago and showed him an ugly side to her. Not at all. I'm very happy, my wife. Kasumi comforted Adira and kissed her head with gentle happiness. It was the truth though. To see his wife attack a woman out of jealousy kind of made him happy even though it wasn't at all appropriate. He was finally seeing the results of his schemes. What the hell? Happy? I almost got burned and you say you're happy? Iris thought incredulously as she listened to Kasumi pacifying the enraged lady and telling her that he didn't mind it. Worst, he even told the damned woman not to dirty her hands. 
Do you mean to slap it to my face that I am dirty and am not worthy to be held? I am the fated maiden. I am the destined queen. I am the woman heaven has sent to aid you in your conquest. Why can't you see that? Unable to hold herself back, Iris indignantly cried to Cassimi. Miss Latifolia, I care not if you're who you say you are. I've never believed in heaven anyway, so why should I now? I only need my family by my side. They are the only people that I need to pursue my conquest. And Adira's heart thumped loudly at Casimir's words. Right in front of him was absolute power and by his side was his kingdom's harbinger of destruction, yet he still chose her regardless. Then, I will give you everything that your heart desires, be it this land or the whole world. Adira promised in her heart and held Casimir's hands interlinking their fingers that fit smugly, warming the cold iceberg almost instantly. Iris, I know you never really liked me and I never did like you as well. I also know about how you try to seduce Casimir every chance you get. I did think, even for a slight moment, that you really did hold love for him inside your jealous heart but I guess you don't. You want him because you hate me and that's not love. Iris was surprised with Adira's frank words that hit her straight to her core and was about to deny things when Adira continued. You may be the maiden of light but I am his princess, who will eventually become his queen, and that is not something absolute power can replace. Only I can stand by Casimir's side. She proudly exclaimed and stood tall against Iris' cowering form. She had planned to ignore her all the way but things have changed. She wasn't gonna let her worm her way in and take Casimir away from her, the same way she did with Triton. She had allowed her to do so with Triton's case but that was because she could see that Triton really did love her. But now that Casimir had proved to her that there can be no one else but her, Adira wasn't gonna sit idly on the sidelines anymore. Villainous, she may be but that's okay. She was not gonna be a passive villainous anymore. Notes. Hi. Thank you so much for all your fun comments and the new influx of votes and followers. So thankful for you guys. Let's keep this up, okay? Banzai? Not anymore. Kasumi was itching to claim the woman's lips right then and there but who was Iris to witness such blissful moment, right? So he held back and resorted to squeezing Adira's hand reassuringly. Iris, who couldn't take it anymore, burst out of the room, crying and feeling more hateful than ever, and ran out of their sight. Adira let out a heavy sigh as the heaviness inside her heart gradually alleviated. It was one of her bravest moments to face the woman who will eventually kill her head on and rile her up. I might have just sped up my impending death by rasping her. She thought to herself as she gingerly traced the shoulder that throbbed painfully while she faced Iris. Like it was reminding her of how she died from her past life. And yet, she didn't regret a single thing. She wanted to let Iris know where they each stood. She wanted Iris to understand that no matter what happens from now on, she won't allow her to steal Kasumi away from her. Not anymore. She turned to Kasumi, whose eyes glowed happily and brilliantly, and apologized again for losing her cool. When did his eyes ever glow like that anyway? Don't apologize. I am very, very happy so please don't apologize for something that made me this happy. He said and finally claimed the woman's lips. He could never get enough of them, of their softness, warmth and loveliness. Heiser went with Adira back to the Silverous Fief even though Anastasius did whatever he could such as bribe him and all those things to make him stay and said goodbye to his grandfather, the king, as well as to his father. He happily ran up to Adira and held her hand as they walked back to the carriage. He wanted to be with his mother and she needed to see hers, after all. After a few minutes or so, Heisa fell asleep on Adira's lap, and everything was peaceful. So Adira took this chance to explain some things to her father. Father, you do know that Heisa didn't really come from me, right? Silpha, who was silently watching the foliage outside, turned to her with a warm smile. Of course, dearest. I mean, I am not as much of an idiot to not figure that out. But... I don't care where that child came from or what his past is. As long as I can see that happiness shining brightly in your face, then I don't care. He is my grandson for all I care. Thank you, Daddy. Adira smiled and Silver wanted to cry then. 
It's been years since he last heard her call him that. It had been too long that he didn't notice he couldn't hold back and started to cry uglily. You 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 Tilda my daughter's become a mother now Tilda my cute, cute angel has her very own angel now Tilda, really now, father. Arriving at the Silverous Thief, everyone rejoiced to finally see their princess return healthy, safe and sound. Life aboard heavily as she greeted her mistress and thanked all the gods she could possibly enumerate. Andrea, also, cried as she came out to meet her husband but unexpectedly found her precious daughter had also returned. Oh my sweet dearest child, thank the gods for your recovery. I thought I'd die from the heartache after what happened to you. I could never live as well if you left us, my child. Mother, I'm sorry for making you worry. I'm fine now. Everything will be fine from now on. Adira comforted her mother, who enshrouded her in a tight embrace, and patted her back. She could really feel the fear and anxiety that ate her away while not knowing when her daughter would wake up or if she ever will. Lifa, who watched these beautiful pair of mother and daughter, felt her heart clench in happiness before feeling a tug on her skirt. She looked down to find a pair of sapphire eyes demanding her for food. It oddly reminded her of a certain dragon, which caused another wave of pain in her heart. She had failed to protect Hysa and keep him safe. Now she knows not where the dragon is and it was eating away at her conscience. Course she knew very well how much her mistress loved that dragon. Lifa. Cake. The child called her name and she was stunned. It was the first time she met him she was sure cause who would forget a child as cute as this one, right? But he knew her. Adira saw the intense confusion on Lifa's face and stifled a giggle from coming out. She then proceeded to introducing the child to all of them present. Mother, Lifa, everyone, this is Hysa. Hysa, that is your grandmother, your aunt and those are all your big sisters and big brothers. Say hello to them. Hello, I am Hysa. I am mommy's baby, Mo. Mommy, am I? My lady, is? Is this? Lifa stuttered as she pointed at Hysa shakily. Guess she can't believe it, huh? Yes, Lifa. Adira answered her with an easygoing smile. Well, she can't blame Lifa. I mean, how many dragons were able to change into a child anyway? Moreover, how many dragons were there that they knew of? Hysa might be the only one. So? So that's why he knew me. Lifa murmured under her breath, while Andrea just stood there staring at Hysa and Adira alternatively. Everything then just clicked into place. After all, mother knows best. Hello, little Hysa. Come give grandmother a hug. Andrea sweetly said and opened up her arms to receive the child. At first, Hysa was reluctant as he refused to let go of Adira's hands and leave her side. But the latter urged him to go so he tottered towards her as cutely as possible to make sure she was on his side as well. For the time being, he'll just recruit his grandmother onto his side cause he might need this woman's help as well. Hello, grandmother. He greeted with a cute bow and everyone gushed at his cuteness. Atilda and other territory successfully claimed. Heiser thought happily as he continued to expand his reach through his charms and cuteness. Notes. I'm updating earlier since I might forget later. Thank you for the support guys. Please keep supporting me so I'm always motivated. Love you a loot. Till tomorrow Tilda. Banzai. P.S. The character I based Heiser on is the child version of Mikazuki from Churan. I'm telling mommy. Kasumi, we can't let that child go. Father, you know you can't force me into anything. The king sighed when he said that cause he knew it was true. Hell would have to freeze over before he can force Kasumi into anything that he didn't like, most especially because it involved Adira. I can't believe you chose to chase out the absolute power handed over to you on a silver platter. No power can best Adira's importance to me and you know that well, father. Don't forget. I know what you did to have mother. Kasumi's platinum eyes glinted sharply to wordlessly warn his father to drop it because nothing can ever change the fact that he will choose Adira a million times over a power that he doesn't want. Besides, he was plenty capable enough to raise the Empire's might through his own means. He needs no deity's power to aid him with that. 
Iris, who dazedly sat on a salon at one of the tea shops on their land used to be, turned the teaspoon round and round as she stared at the unbroken swirls threatening to spill out of the cup. She didn't know when that person had decided to sit behind her or what but she suddenly heard a voice come from her back and said, Hello, Lady Latifolia. I've come to give you a solution to your problems. Iris back tensed like taut bowstrings and turned around but the head of the person speaking to her was covered with a hood and turned his, her back against her. Please, don't turn around here. You really don't know how to be covert at all. The person judged and mocked her with a low chuckle that although she was mad, she decided to let it go. It didn't matter to her anymore. Now that she had lost her title, her place in high society even the prince's favor nothing mattered now. Well, do you want to cleanse your slate clean and get close to his highness once again? After hearing such preposterous question, Iris just scoffed, unladylike and was about to get the hell out away from this bastard that continued to mock her when suddenly everything turned black and a floating light gently descended to her. This is a one-time deal, Iris Amaryllis Calmia Latifolia. With this chance, use whatever means you can use to attract the prince away from Adira Silveris, was the last she heard that reverberated in the space she was in before it dissolved and she was back at the shop with the swirls in her tea still unbroken. She whipped her head towards the seat behind her but found not a soul there, nor even a trace of that person that suddenly approached her. Thinking that the stress was catching up to her and made her delirious, she chuckled derisively and held her head as she bent slightly forward and that's when she saw the white gem-like pendant hanging loosely on her neck. Dear Lord, it was real? I wasn't going crazy, this. Can help me start over again, really? She doubtfully thought and held the pendant against the bright sun. It wasn't a stone nor was it a gem. Inside was just a hazy swell of gas-like substance. But she wasn't entirely sure exactly what it was. But, if this can help me, I mean, I've got nothing more to lose, right? Might as well just do this. Iris decided and abruptly stood up and left her unfinished tea. A means, an opportunity. A chance was presented to her. She'd be an idiot if she didn't use it well. Come on, Adira. It's time for a rematch. Peaceful days passed in the Silverous Castle with Adira spending her days mostly playing with Heiser. Every day, Kasimi dropped by and accompanied them. Most of the time, he even brought his work over. Adira made the both of them tea and snacks and everyone just melted and were blinded with their picture-perfect family. Even the elders were watching over them. Rame, who was now more or less running half of the fief now, also spent most of his time at home now that Adira's home and walked close to them and sat in front of Kasumi also dropping his work on the table. When Adira first introduced Heisa to him as her child, he was so stunned he felt like fainting. He didn't like how Heisa gave him the stink eye since it greatly reminded him of the old prince, Kasumi. But then, he looked incredibly adorable, like Adira, when he smiles at her or his mother and father. This kid. Sharp one, isn't he? So they reached a stalemate and decided to be civil for the meantime, at least when in the presence of Adira and their parents. But when was Heisa ever not beside Adira, right? So they had no choice really but to stow their differences away for the time being. What are you doing here? Again. Rame asked the stoic man, who briefly looked up to him before turning back to his paperworks, and eyed him disdainfully. My family is here, Kasumi stated matter-of-factly. And this irked Ramir more. Who the hell is your family? To which Kasumi just replied with a look that said, Seriously? Ramir cleared his throat when Heisa came close to them and gave them the cookies Adira just baked before warning them in a very cute childish voice. If you two don't stop, I'm telling mommy. And that was enough to shut both of these men up and return to each of their business. No one can defeat the most favored child. Since Adira believes anything that comes out of this little brat's mouth. Adira followed suit after Heisa and wondered what happened to make both men submit to the child with bowed heads, burying themselves in their work, while the boy looked victorious. Hmm. Did Heisa just successfully trample these prideful men all on his own? Wow. My baby's just the best, indeed.
she cooed when she came close and dipped her head low to place a kiss on the child's forehead before giving the men their teas. Notes. Hi. I'm so happy to read that you all enjoy the story. Truly. Thank you very much. I hope I can continue to make you feel the emotions our characters are feeling. I'm updating a little bit earlier. Got a patient to take care. P.S. Why I still write despite being busy. Will Tilda you guys motivate me to write more? As long as I know a lot of you are looking forward for more, I will happily write you a new chapter. That's how much I love you guys. So I hope we keep this up. Banzo Ai. What can you give? A few days after, Adira was called to the palace at the behest of the king, unbeknownst to anyone else even Kasumi or Silfa. She walked inside his office when she heard him grant her permission after she knocked on his door thrice. Anastasia smiled warmly and Adira relaxed instantaneously. She knew that there was no reason to be nervous in his presence but she still cannot help it. He was the king. The freaking king. Good day, your majesty. She curtsied and stayed still before Anastasius gave her permission to do otherwise. Child, come here. He spoke in his ragged and old voice as he gestured for her to walk closer to him and she did. She stopped just a few feet in front of his desk when he suddenly asked her, There is something I would like to ask you. Now, I don't know the extent of your feelings for Kasumi, but, this, I need to ask. What can you give Kasumi that's worth him rejecting the absolute power Iris Latifolia offers him? Adira was on her carriage on her way back to her home as His Majesty's words replayed endlessly in her head. She had been too shocked to give him a suitable answer so she stood there in front of him, silent and frozen. She didn't know what would have been the perfect answer and she didn't even expect herself to answer the way she did. Sir Thomas, can you please stop the carriage for a while? Adira suddenly called out to her coachman and the latter obeyed immediately. They were near one of the small lakes on Baron Niveria's land, as she had to pass there to get to her own fief, and got off. Thomas wanted to accompany her but she shook her head and spoke softly. Can I please be left alone for a while? Since Adira had left without informing anyone, of course except for this coachman, she had no guards or Heiser or Kasumi with her. There was only her lonesome self. She sauntered close to the lake and let the gentle breeze blow past her. If I had to analyze what case his father wants, that would be for me to give up my position as his fiancé to Iris, right? Because, she is the maiden of light. Of course, the logical thing to do would be to tie the next king to this power through marriage. But, will I be able to let go of him? What about the family that I dreamed for Hysa? What about my heart? Do I choose the kingdom? Or do I selfishly choose myself again? There were many thoughts clouding her mind, ranging from worrying about how the same event from her past life, where she burnt the capital down, might happen again should she choose to be selfish again to what would happen if she chose the kingdom and left Kasumi. What can I even offer Kasumi that can top the power to dominate the kingdoms? Sure, I did talk big and made a promise to myself that I would give him the world if he wanted it. But can I really? Adira was walking deeper and deeper into the spot where the road split. And she was more confused the more she thought about it. While on Triton's side, he was walking aimlessly around the Dalriada's castle's garden. The roses were already blooming and staring at them, his reminded of Adira's beautiful visage. Ever since Leon's words and Kasumi swooping in to rescue Adira, he has felt more useless than ever. What do I have to do so Adira would at least look at me or love me? He thought to himself while mindlessly picking the rose and snipping it off its stem. Well, why don't you replace his highness? Literally. A voice suddenly came from above him and Triton fluidly pulled his sword out, immediately on guard against this intruder that he didn't notice, and crushed the rose on his hand on the process. Please, I'm not here to pick a fight with you, Lord Dalriada. In fact, I am here to help you solve your problems. You want the Lady Silverus? No. The hooded figure, who languidly swung his leg as he was perched up on a tree branch, said and chuckled. Try as he might, Triton couldn't hide the interest that showed on his face. He didn't want to blatantly oppose the crown, all he wanted was Adira and be married to her. 
but she unfortunately became tied to it by being engaged to the first prince, Prince Kasimi. I will be providing you an opportunity, my lord. It is up to you whether you will take it or not. What is it? Triton, finally giving in to the idea of a chance to snatch Hadira for himself, asked although still doubtful of this person's credibility. On the eve, a fortnight from now, it'll be the lady's seventeenth birthday. On that same night, a lunar eclipse will occur. You only need to make sure that before the eclipse ends and the night clears, you are the first person she sees, hears, and touches. You will see what happens then. The mysterious person said before a strong gust of wind forced Triton to close his eyes involuntarily. The moment he opened his eyes, the person had already vanished and left no trace of him of how he infiltrated nor how he left. It left Triton to wonder why exactly that person came to him in the first place and what he wanted to achieve, but it was eventually drowned with his want to see what will happen on that night. Would I be given the chance to love her and be loved in return? If so, that would be the absolute happiness. Adira, I'm sorry but I love you too much. I still can't let you go. He thought as he let the crumpled rose fall, petal by petal, from his hands. He had decided and he was gonna see it through. He was done standing aside and forcing himself to let go of her because of his family's loyalty. Should Kasumi choose to fight it out with him and he will, he'll just have to snatch the woman and the throne from him. I'm sorry Kasumi, but I choose Adira over my family's loyalty to the crown. All of it is yours. A day before Adira's birthday, Kasumi took her out without Heisa. He was left in the care of the Silverous parents and Lifer. Although Heiser didn't want to part with his mother cause even though she seemed normal, he could feel that there was something wrong with her, but decided against it, thinking that there was something important his parents needed to talk about. Kasumi led her around the plaza and let the lady have her fill of fun. Adira also took the chance to bring Kasumi to her second family and introduced him to Peter. Hyacinth and even Owen, which oddly incited ambiguous irritation from the boy. Before the latter thought of something and brought him to her favorite place in their fief, a cliff that overlooked the bustling and luminous plaza with the silverous castle on the background, that overlooked a fraction of the people she needed to protect at all costs, even at the cost her own happiness. Besides, she's had plenty of it it'll last her a whole lifetime ever since she met Kasumi and Heiser. I always come here to think about things or relax. I love watching over everyone live their lives desperately yet happily. Adira spoke and had this far-off look in her dark grey orbs with dully glowing galaxies of stars. Casey. If I, if I told you. To take me right here, right now. Would you? She bashfully asked and slightly craned her head towards the frozen stoic man, his expression clearly showing how surprised he was with her words. Even more so when she started to unbutton her clothes. Eadira! Kasumi exclaimed and quickly seized her hands to make her stop. Any more than that and his heart might just burst out of its cages. Please! Spare me from these type of jokes. You! Do you not want me, Casey? She asked with a lonely expression on her face that was further arousing and inciting the poor locked-up beast. What the hell? Do you know how much I want you? You cannot even fathom how long I've been patiently waiting for you. I've never been as patient as this for anything at all. And you doubt if I want you? That's why? I'm giving myself to you, Casey. That's what you want, right? She then returned to unbuttoning her clothes when Kasumi grunted and caught her hands mid-action a bit too strong and accidentally pushed her down with her arms raised, above her. Are you kidding me right now? You think I only want your body? Is that it? What I want most is your heart. Do you still not get it after all these time? Kasumi was getting angry after he heard what the woman said and could barely keep himself under control as thin layers of ice started to coat Adira's wrist. You have my heart, Casey. All of it is yours. She briefly told him, not explaining anything any further, before she initiated the kiss and kissed him deeply and clumsily. Kasumi, who was on his last straw of self-control, responded to her kisses and hungrily claimed her cherry red lips. Tasting. Devouring. Taking what was offered to him willingly. 
He briefly parted with her and watched her breathe heavily from his kisses, all flushed and breathless, and felt for the first time since he noticed he had loved her and maintained perfect self-control, that building heat overflow all at once. It was driving him insane. Lovely. Crazy. Beautiful. Divine. But something was bothering him. Damn it, Adira. I don't want it to be like this. He grunted as he shut his eyes tight and buried his head on her exposed white neck all the way down to her upper chest exposing a little bit too much of her snow white skin. I want to marry you. I want to follow the proper order. I do not want this. And Adira's heart clenched painfully. She had been resolved to give her everything to Kasumi. And then give him up. But seeing him like this was making it hard. Excruciatingly and heartbreakingly hard. I'm sorry for pushing you, Casey. She apologized and kissed his head before wrapping him in a warm embrace. I just wanted to let you know how much I love you. You don't have to do that. No matter if your love amounted to even just a little bit of mine, I will still love you regardless. I love you too, Casey. So wait for me. I'll give you this world. That should make all those people shut up. Adira whispered before peppering the man's tensed face little and light kisses. Kasumi stopped briefly and figured that Adira must have known how the council had been forcing him to make Iris Latifolia his queen instead of Adira. If you must know how they knew about it, then it's a desperate attempt the Latifolias did to restore the status Kasumi stripped from them. It must be why she suddenly acted like this. You don't need to give me anything. I'll do it. I'll acquire the world for you. I'll conquer it and offer it to you. Just stay beside me always, please. I beg you. Promise me that you'll stay beside me for always. If only things were as simple as that. But what about your people, Casey? Are you going to abandon them for me? Will you do the same as I did for Triton then? Will you kill them all for me? Because Casey, I think that the only way that you can acquire the world is if you kill them all. However, I won't let you do that. I won't allow you to. I love you, Kasumi Athanasius Rosen Vasilis. Remember that. In this life, you are the only husband that I will take. Adira sealed her vow with a kiss. It could only be Kasumi but at that moment he felt as if Adira was saying her goodbyes, that if they parted tonight, then he'll never see her ever again. It was filling him with numbing anxiety, slowly gnawing and tearing him apart although he doesn't know why but he could feel it. He was panicking. He deepened the kiss, desperately seeking something that will otherwise calm him down. To calm the inner storm raging inside of him, he needed something that will reassure him that Adira won't go away after tonight. So he said, Adira, the day after your birthday, marry me. The lady could only give him a soft and warm happy smile with tears threatening to spill down her eyes. Please. Just this time. Just once. Don't see through me. Yes. Notes. Hi. Since I will be on duty tonight and might not find time to update, also since I finished this miraculously early, I decided to post this now. I'm also giving you guys a heads up that I might not be updating for the whole week of next week since I have a week-long exams on that week. So please bear with me for depriving you of updates for a week. P.S. For those that wanted steamy scenes, I don't know how far I can go with those kind of scenes without feeling uncomfortable or awkward, but please make do with this for now. That is all. Thank you. Banzo Ai. Our son. Adira greeted people left and right, smiling for them oh so happily and beautifully. She wore this very pretty grey gradient cocktail dress, with two straps overlapping each other as they crossed over to the other shoulder and another pair that went. Straight to her back, it was littered with feathers across her torso and the skirt and snowflake patterns all over the skirt. Almost all noble family came, hoping to establish some kind of connection with the Silverus family or even the lady herself. It showed how influential and powerful this ducal family was who ranked next to the royalty. However, what made Adira's banquet different from what all these noble families threw wasn't the complete attendance of these noble blood but the attendance of even commoner families that wanted to celebrate their beautiful and kind lady's name day. Even Peter's family was there. Happy birthday, big sister. I knew you weren't a simple person, 
but I didn't imagine you were the legendary Lady Silverus, blabbered Owen excitedly and animatedly. Adira giggled happily at this lively troll, who grew another couple more centimeters and was almost catching up to her now. He really was just like her real little brother. He had no filter when he faced her and she loved that. Thank you, Owen. However, I'm still your big sister Adira, and that will never change. Adira said and planted a quick peck on the boy's forehead that immediately made him blush. Kasumi then promptly snatched the lady's hand as his other arm snaked possessively around her waist. Hello, little Owen. Kasumi greeted with a strong emphasis on the adjective he used on the boy. He snarled at Kasumi and Adira could only sigh helplessly as she could almost palpate the rising tension between the two of them. Seriously, Casey, that's a boy you're picking a fight with. Kasumi then shifted his gaze, as it turned more formal and serious, and bowed his head towards Adira's second parents. Sir Peter, Madam Hyacinth, I am here to formally inform you of our wedding ceremony to be held tomorrow. I know it is a bit rushed but I've long been planning to marry her ever since God knows when. We hope you could celebrate with us then. Peter and Hyacinth were taken aback, not only because they were invited to a royal's wedding even though they were of common blood, but also because the crown prince himself extended the invitation to a family as humble as them. He even bowed his head towards them. They didn't deserve such honor. Yo your highness, please raise your head. W we are not worth you bowing your head to us, no. Adira acknowledged the both of you as her second parents, therefore, I need to show you my respect as well. Peter and Hyacinth's hearts warmed at their crown prince's words. The rumors they heard about how he was a cold-blooded, heartless demon and so much more seemed too far-fetched now. With the real deal in front of them, who was as gentle and warm like their lady Adira, the rumors all seem too outrageous. Of course, your highness, we will be there. Hyacinth replied and looked over to her husband, who finished her sentence for her. We wouldn't miss it for the world. Kasumi graced them a rare smile and several clanging sounds of utensils reverberated across the hall. It made Adira laugh jovially. Truly, if you aren't used to it, that would really be your reaction. Now, Adira's guest list didn't stop there yet. Even the princess of the Linthai kingdom came as soon as she heard about Adira's name day celebration. She walked, all poised, tall and mighty, towards the so-called goddess of the empire and greeted her a happy birthday. Thank you, your highness. It is such an honor to have your presence here. Adira routinely yet politely thanked her and curtsied gracefully. Somehow, Thea couldn't find a flaw she could exploit and tug open so she was getting annoyed at Adira. Well, I've heard lots of stories about the goddess. It's such a waste if I didn't attend your party and finally see this goddess with my own eyes. Thea replied, still up her high horse and didn't forget to slip in her derision and annoyance at this woman clinging tightly on the crown prince. However, if you really looked at it, it was Kasumi, who was keeping Adira locked in his hold, as he kept a hand over the girl's hand that clung to his arm. My, I'm afraid to have disappointed you, your highness. Those are only rumors people exaggerated along the way. Adira bashfully denied the title people dubbed on her, to which Kasumi strongly objected. Of course not. And as concisely as that, he successfully pointed out to his wife and the princess that there was nothing wrong to those rumors, in fact, those were nothing but facts. Utilda, the great demon lord's flirting is coming in strong. They are littering dog food all over the place again. The noble gallery, who eventually got used to them spreading dog food each and every chance they got, watched the drama unfold with great interest. And they even got free dog food for their poor hearts. Mommy, I'm hungry. Mommy? Thea, who was closest to them, finally noticed the cute little raven-haired child peeking from behind Adira's back, his beautiful sapphire orbs looking up to her with. Love and devotion. Oh, I'm sorry, baby. Why don't you go with daddy to get food? The lady of the night, Adira, softly coaxed the child to go with his father while she entertained her guest. No tilde I want mommy. My. This is. Thea, who couldn't hold her curiosity, asked. Oh. I forgot to introduce him to you. 
This is Haisa, our son. Adira happily announced and beamed a bright smile before placing Haisa in between her and Kasumi. Our, Thea, who was still in denial, repeated in a doubtful voice before shifting her gaze towards the frozen man, who suddenly showed a very warm and beautiful rare smile. Yes, our. He answered and patted the little boy's head. Thea wasn't sure how she was able to remove herself from their presence as she was overcome with shock. She did not hear this. She didn't know they had a child. And because she was too shocked, of course, she couldn't have thought about the difference in the supposed to be parents' age to the child. So the night went on with Kasumi and Adira, as well as Haisa, greeting several guests and exchanging talks about random things. The king, who sat above the others, with Silfa and Andrea, could see how well loved the woman was and thought back to the words she spoke. Back when he asked her at his office to how she spoke of something as if she was so sure of what will happen in the future. I. I am not worthy to be this empire's empress, your majesty. The chaos and destruction that I will bring upon this land is something so horrendous you will want to kill me yourself. But, I love your son more than I expected more than I thought I was capable of. I love him more than my own life and my own heart. So if by giving him up to Iris, will save him and this kingdom from me, then I do not mind wrenching my heart apart one more time. I cannot give him anything that is better than Iris' power and status as the Maiden of Light. There is only me, my heart and my life. There is only our son and our family. So please, I ask you, your majesty, Give me until my birthday to spend it with them. After then, I promise to give him up and disappear forever. He clenched his fists as he watched that happiness glowing brightly on his son's face, a joy that only Adira can bring out of him. He cannot allow him to lose that again. He can't allow anyone to take it away from his son. He can't let Adira go. So he waited for a chance, when Adira briefly parted with both Kasumi and Haisa to greet someone and get snacks for the child on the way. She wanted the child to get used with his father before she leaves. He approached him and lightly tapped Kasumi's shoulders. He needs to let Kasumi know of her decision. Maybe he can stop her. Even when it was practically his fault the lady was going away. Can I speak to you? And Kasumi nodded before instructing Heiser to go over to his silverous grandparents for a while and followed his father to an open balcony. What is it, father? When I lost your mother, I was so heartbroken I was not sure how I was able to move as routinely as possible. But I tried to cope up with the sadness, with the pain, with the emptiness she left behind, with the son she left to my care. I did my utmost best to be a good father to you and Stefan, especially to you even when you remind me of her the most. Even when every time my eye sees you, the pain resurfaces again and again. I'm sorry, no. You need not be. You are our most beloved first son. Her precious little crystal. She'd hate me if I hated you for that. The king gave a small pained smile as he turned to look at Kasumi and faced him head on. If you lost her. Kasumi, what would you do? Kasumi remained silent for a while as he tried to analyze why his father was asking him something so obvious and why did he feel nervous about this question. It couldn't be. Did he have something to do with Adira acting weird? That might be where we differ, father. Because I swear, I will not survive that. Notes. Hi tilde tilde tilde. I'm back. Yay. This week was hell. I could only hope to read your comments while doing my best at my exams. So thank you so much to those that participated in the poll and for your words. It made me very happy. So since I've been away for a week. Thank you. Sorry. This is not a new update. I'm just posting this up to express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone that reads and loves my story. She becomes a passive villainess not. I couldn't believe it when I saw the rankings for this story. So for everyone's information, we currently rank first in the following categories. Villainous, Reincarnation. Second Chance. Past Memories. Doting Love Interest. And 16th in the Magic category. Thank you so much. Very, very much. This is such a great honor and a very happy day for me. Not only did I not have a toxic duty earlier this dawn but I also had this surprise. 
Thank you so much guys. Let's keep this up and top all the other tags as well. Thank you everyone. I love you all. Poll. Delete this part before updating the next chapter. Keep this as a reminder for our accomplishment. Love the author. Heisa is the cutest. P.S. You can choose multiple. Thank you again Evian E tilde tilde tilde. Banza I tilde. Don't let her go. Anastasius watched the uncanny seriousness gleaming wonderfully on his son's eyes and that was when he was sure. Not even heaven and earth can ever separate him from Adira. He could only sigh in defeat and shrugged his shoulders. No matter what was said to this new Kasumi in front of him, nothing can ever change his mind about the lady he chose. Do you know what your fiancé answered me when I asked what she could give in exchange for you rejecting Latifolia's power? Don't get me wrong for asking this. I was just genuinely curious. She said that she doesn't have anything. She even said that she will eventually cause destruction upon this kingdom. Do you think I would allow her to be wed to you and pave the way for her to sit as the queen after knowing that? Anastasia said and he could feel the air getting chillier, that was enough to know Kasumi was very upset. He didn't need to look at him like that, a frosty rage cracking and nipping even him, the king. So before Kasumi could even utter or do anything else, he added, but, I was wrong. I could see heartbreaking sorrow in her beautiful eyes as she reluctantly told me that she was gonna give you up to the Latifolia lady. And that's when I was sure, she definitely was the perfect queen. To surrender what your heart wanted the most for the sake of the greater good is something that no power can ever defeat. Don't let her go, my son. Anastasia said and patted Casimir's shoulders to calm him down. It was bad enough that he misunderstood him and misinterpreted his words, perhaps Adira too. It wasn't that he didn't like Adira, nor felt she was lacking in anything or that Iris Latifolia was better anywhere. Heck, he wouldn't have forced that stingy idiotic Bakoya to tie his beloved daughter with his son if he was just gonna toss her aside just like that he really only wanted to. Know if his son's overwhelming love was returned. And it seems it really was. Kasumi calmed down as the bitter frost on his platinum eyes subsided and he smiled slightly. He was genuinely happy to hear how sad Adira felt thinking about giving him up to that Latifolia woman, not that he would even give her the leeway to do that. He would tie her to him even more tighter. He'll claim her future and spend it with her and their son and many more children to come. Of course, I won't. In fact, I'm marrying her tomorrow. Anastasius wasn't even surprised by now. Even though his son just raised a flag as calmly as that, he was too used to him doing such schemes that he doesn't really care what he does anymore. As long as the other party has agreed, then why not right? Kasumi always was one who liked to jump the gun and he was used to it by now. As long as the bride knows. Yes, father. I properly asked her yesterday. Well then, if there's nothing else, Please excuse me. Kasumi promptly removed himself from his father's presence to return to his own family, to his wife and son's side. And Anastasius just wistfully watched that broad back finally supporting not only their empire from such a young age, it made him terribly guilty, but also his very own family. Celia, our little crystal's shining brightly for someone else now. He's really grown up. Adira, while Kasumi was with the king and speaking with him, was at the buffet picking sweets for her little child when she felt a soft tap on her shoulder. She whipped her head towards the direction the tap came from when a finger suddenly poked at her cheeks coupled with a happy and deep chuckle. You never fail to fall for that trick. It has been a while since you did that. Of course, I'd fall for that prank of yours. What are you doing grabbing all of these sweets? You really need to control that sooner or later or else you'll grow into a fat pig. He joked which earned him an annoyed yet playful punch from the lady. How dare you? At my birthday even. And he just smiled at her lovingly. A smile he never once showed her from her past life. The smile that she would kill to see. He never gave it to her. But now, everything was different. She doesn't love him anymore and there's Kasumi now. She was loved as much as she loved him. She was happy and contented. And she was willing to do just about anything to keep her family safe. Even leaving them. May I talk to you privately, Adira? He spoke gently. His voice was brimming with loving soft warmth he didn't care to hide. 
might as well clear it out to him. She thought and so she nodded her head and followed him out. He navigated towards a garden, a little bit away from the hall, having a little quiet in their surroundings. He sat on the fountain's edges and reached out his hand to help her settle down comfortably. It was then that she saw the white lily flower that was booming in popularity in the capital amongst the young ladies right now. And, of course, Adira knew this. She once bought this for him back from her past life. Because there was a rumor that said, should you offer this to the person you love and they receive it, then your love will be reciprocated. And who maiden would not fall for a sham like that, right? Especially someone like Adira, who was madly in love with Triton. But now, things went the other way around. It wasn't her who fell for such a trick like that. Instead, it was the man she once offered that flower to only to be rejected and thrown away. So Adira chose to act as if she didn't notice and sat about a meter away from Triton to avoid what happened at Kasumi's birthday banquet to happen again. If the man does it again and her jealous great demon lord husband sees it, someone will definitely be murdered in her birthday banquet. And that is scary. Adira, do you love him? Triton spoke first. And as quickly as she could, without the slightest doubt in her heart, she answered, Yes, I do. Why can't it be me? You are a great man, Triton. You might just be every girl's dream, but you aren't mine. Adira spoke truthfully and turned to face Triton. She wanted him to see her heart reflect in her eyes. She wanted to show him that it wasn't possible now. That he was a lifetime too late. And Kasumi is, well, no, not really. That guy's practically emotionless most of the time and forceful, jealous and sly basically, your typical bastard. But he gave me what I wanted the most, Triton. All my life. All I wanted was to be loved back by the man I loved the most. She answered him for her poor pathetic past self, whose cries weren't heard by anyone, and for the her right now, who was blessed with so much love from the people around her, especially from the man who her heart chose this lifetime. Notes. I am giving you guys a double update tilde tilde. Yay! Banzo I. I hope this can make up for my absence this whole week. We fell behind our ranks a little bit because of that and I was so sad. But, we can do this and get it back again, right? Anyway, asterisk bakoya means stupid parent. It's basically what they call to those overdoting parents, especially a father to his daughter. P.S. It's good to be back. I missed you guys. In his every move, he devotes everything to me as honestly and as simply as he could. He never does anything that I wouldn't like. I can also rest assured he wouldn't be swayed by other women even when they're practically offering themselves to him. I also know that in every second, minute, hour in his every move he always thinks what would be good for me and our family. I only wanted to be loved even if not as much as Case is doing right now. I only wanted you to turn, even just once, and see your reflection in my eyes that couldn't see anyone but you. But, if I can love you like that, would you consider me then? Triton spoke after remaining silent as he listened to Adira's words, laying out her heart in the open. He can love her as much as even more than Kasumi. He only needed a chance to prove that to her. He looked straight into her astounded pretty ash-like eyes and tried to make her see his heart the heart that wanted no one but her. Adira was about to answer him when the dark night gradually brightened and drew her attention as the moon slowly took a peek behind the shadow casted over it giving it a Bloody red hue. Oh, I was wondering why it was so dark out. Turns out, it was a lunar eclipse. Huh? That's strange. I'm feeling heathier and lighter now than an hour ago. She thought and examined the growing strength sluggishly building up within her as she clenched her fists repeatedly. Her vigor was returning though she didn't know why she felt weak in the first place. Adira. I love you, you know? Ever since we were children. Ever since I saw you back when I went to your castle to propose an engagement, you have never left my mind. Adira couldn't react on time as Triton caught her in a tight embrace and kept her there. His minty perfume pervading her senses and his warm arms akin to the warmth of the sunrise as it hits your face a very comforting warmth. I'm sorry, Triton. BZZT. 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 
What is this noise? So loud. Annoying. Stop that. Whoever's making this noise. Stop it. Wait. What was I going to say again? Ah uh, yes, Triton. Triton, my love, when are you telling mother and father about our wedding tomorrow? Adira spoke that shocked Triton so much that he unconsciously pulled back from her, which made the latter pull an upset face and misunderstood his actions. Are you not telling them? No. No, wait. What's this? What's going on? What's wrong, darling? Adira asked worriedly and reached out her soft and beautiful hands to caress his face gently. She was awfully sweet and enchanting. Are you sick, my love? Are you hurting anywhere? Shall we go back inside now? The night is cold so we shouldn't stay outside for long. Triton couldn't believe what he was hearing. Adira's lovely and gentle voice as she fusses over him was making him go insane. It was making him think if he was dreaming right now. Am I? Am I inside a dream right now? Adira blinked her eyes in confusion before she giggled oh so beautifully and wonderfully and smiled at the man with love-filled eyes. Oh dear, my love you're not dreaming. I really am marrying you tomorrow. Oh Tilda my sweet and cute husband. Come here, you sweet thing. She said and opened up her arms to receive him. He hesitated no more and took the willing lady, who finally reciprocated his long unrequited love, into his arms. Oh how much had he dreamed of this moment? Do you want me to be the one who tells father and mother? I can tell them in your behalf. She offered in a sweet lovely voice he never once heard her use around him. She was always the serious, aloof, and strict lady of the Silverous household. But the woman inside his arms right now, was the lovely little wife persona of the cold lady. No. I will tell them. What kind of a man am I if I made you tell them, right? I'll be your husband tomorrow, so shouldn't I at least perform that part? Please don't take that away from me. Adira gave him a very sweet and happy smile before pecking him softly on his cheeks. Whatever you say, my dear. She blushed after kissing him and accidentally overheated that burned Triton as he flinched and abruptly pulled away. Ouch. Oh. I'm sorry. I told you I haven't been able to control it that well lately. I'm so sorry, darling. She apologized repeatedly and rubbed him all over his arms as she cutely blew on them trying to lessen the pain. And Triton paused. She never once told him about her magic or her attribute or anything at all. So who was she talking about? Is it? Kasimi? Am I his replacement right now? He thought and tried to piece out the puzzle in his head before shaking his head and ignored that glaring fact. The most important right now was it was him who Adira loves. It was him in her eyes. He was the man who was hearing her sweet little voice and feeling the warmth of her embrace and the one relishing her addicting kisses. Nothing else matters. It's okay. You can burn me as much as you want. I only need you and everything will definitely be fine. What's wrong with you, Triton? You're awfully emotional tonight. Adira commented while comfortingly rubbing the man's back till she could feel him relax a bit. I'm just happy. Super happy. I'm finally marrying you tomorrow, who wouldn't be happy? The woman felt a strange tug in her heart and figured that she must have been touched with the man's words and smiled happily. She was so lucky to be loved this much by the man she loved. That boy was right. I really am darn lucky to be the one chosen amidst the horde of girls gunning for you. Triton tensed up as soon as she heard her say that. Because he didn't know which boy told her such a thing. It couldn't have been said after Kasumi proposed marriage between their family. So it could only have been when they were children. Who told you that, my love? Hem. Now that you ask, I actually can't remember him anymore. Kasumi? Doesn't matter. You don't have to remember. What's important is that we're finally gonna be married tomorrow. Before Adira could even answer him, a bitter wintry cold voice resounded against the bright midnight as his figure stepped out from the shadows looking like his past. Demon Lord Self. Who's marrying who? Notes. Okai Tilda this isn't exactly the time to be sharing the good news to everyone but might as well, right? This chapter's pretty heavy, so. Well, I gained a lot of followers and I am thankful for that. So yay.
Clap your hands tilde tilde. Next is, we finally reached 242k readers and 14k votes. Banzo ai. So I am very happy. The ranks will be next so let's do our best and reach it. Thank you guys for all the love and support. Banzo ai. Ugly and dangerous. Kasimi. Triton proudly called the prince with his given name and shielded Adira away from his piercing eyes. What are you doing Dalriada? Crackles and a blue aura was swirling around Kasimi's intimidating figure and stalked closer to Triton. But the latter had no fear anymore. As long as Adira was with him, nothing scares him. Even this great demon lord of the empire. It didn't take Kasimi too many steps to stand and tower over the blonde man before he grabbed his collars and threw him over. The shock and surprise coupled with the impact when he hit the pillar momentarily took his breath away before he coughed heavily. Triton. Adira's worried voice filtered through Kasimi's ears before the woman passed by him, her hair flowing behind her, as she ran towards the bastard's side. Her actions were confusing him. Why is she running to his side? Why is she worried about him? What is going on? What did I miss? What? What? Kasimi's mind was plunging deeper into the abyss as his thoughts were turning redder, crazier, and deadlier. The mere sight of his wife running to another man's side was filling him with antipathy. Ugly and dangerous. Adira. His voice, as cold as the freezing winter, called her name and she felt an undeniable chill run down her spine. This man was ready to shed blood. Your Highness, what did Triton ever do to you? And yet, she was bravely facing him. She didn't know where she was pulling this much courage from but she knew that this man, even as dangerous and as murderous as he was looking right then, would never hurt a hair on her. What the hell is going on here? Why are you taking his side? Why are you on his side? Why shouldn't I be on my husband's side? And those simple words shocked the prince to his core. So much that he couldn't pull any words out of his tongue. He was just frozen there watching the woman he loves act like he was a complete stranger as she tended to the other man. Are you okay, Triton? She softly asked him. I'm fine, my love. Triton called her with an endearment on purpose to let this prince hear it loud and clear and let him know that Adira was his now. But it was just another fuse lit inside the man's head that was pushing him to erase Triton from his sight. He rushed forward and ripped the man out from his wife's arms and drove a punch straight to his torso. However, it didn't end there. Kasimi caught him by his collar and threw the bastard over his back. He then kept him there by placing his knee over the man's chest and kept a strong grip on his neck. He was ready to kill him. No. He will kill him. Your Highness, let him go. Adira, in a desperate attempt to pry the raging Kasimi off Triton, she pulled him by his shoulder and arms with searing hands that left a bent mark on it. She was so scared about what this prince may do to Triton. It was like she knew from the back of her mind that he was able to kill without a shred of mercy if provoked. You've been calling me Your Highness nonstop for a while now. What is wrong with you, Adira? What the hell happened? She successfully drew his attention, but abruptly regretted it the moment it happened. The great demon lord took large strides closer to her while she took small yet hurried steps away from him. My wife, why are you running away from me? Kasimi's voice was soft, melancholic, and hurt. His heart was clenching in undeniable pain as he watched the lady step away from him, as he watched his wife cower in fear from him. I'm sorry if I did you wrong. Please. Come to me, your highness. I am not your wife. Why are you calling me as such? There was genuine confusion and bewilderment in the woman's eyes that Kasimi didn't know what to do, think or feel. It couldn't be that his wife was doing this on purpose, right? Why would she need to go this far if it was? And that was when Kasimi remembered his father's words. About how he asked his wife something so misleading that it made the latter misunderstand his words. Is she mad about it? Is she leaving me? Adira, father did not mean anything about his words. You can't leave me just because of something like that. Your Highness, forgive me but. I don't remember ever talking with his majesty. Get away from him, Adira. Triton's voice came in between the pair and attracted the great demon lord's anger once again. 
Kasumi was about to start another onslaught of attack specifically targeting the man's solar plexus when Adira suddenly came in between them and received the attack. Instead, why? Do you hurt? My husband. She spoke softly before falling into the arms of the frozen prince, solidifying with icy coldness and bitterness. The Adira that was in front of them was just like the Adira of the first life, the Adira that could not see, love or care about anyone but Triton. The Adira that would literally throw her life on the line for Triton, the Adira that was madly in love with this lord. However, what differed her from her first life was the sense that something was wrong, the strange feeling she got when she saw this first prince in that moment when she should have been happy about finally marrying Triton, about him finally loving her back, but she wasn't. She wasn't. And it was all too confusing and weird. Like there was something amiss. And thus, the beast inside Kasumi broke free. His eyes turned red as he let his anger swallow him and directed it to the mongrel that dared to do something, he doesn't know what, to his precious woman. The ice crept rapidly towards the man that he was sure he would have been impaled a hundred times, bored holes through his body, if not for a person that went through a portal and pulled him in to extract him out of there. Adira. Notes. Hi. So we still have this heartaching chapters ahead of us. Bear with them and support them all the way, okay? Everything will definitely be okay. P.S. I'm really sorry if it seems as if I'm dragging them away more. They need to face hardships still. And I'm sure I noted it in the earlier chapters how our queen attracts trouble like a magnet it's almost impossible, right? LOL. I'm really just justifying why I am pulling them apart. But just sit tight and enjoy the roller coaster ride of emotions. Thank you. Banzo Ai. Nothing but fabrications. Let me go. I need to go to Adira. She's waiting for me. Let go of me. Triton cried as he continued to resist against the person's hold before he was flung onto a wall. A little bit of taste and you forget. That's quite absurd of you, Lord Dalriada. A familiar voice mocked Triton that made him look up to meet that man's eyes looking down at him with disgust and derision. The latter never wanted to help him out of Kasumi's attack, that without a doubt would have killed him, but he was necessary to get close to Adira and do what needs to be done. Things were beyond personal grudges now. It was high time that they strike Kasumi and the Empire where it hurt most. After, Adira will just be another spoil of war ripe for the taking. Until then, he just needs to sit tight, endure and wait. Leon? What the, you were imprisoned? That dummy? It's just another corpse I disguised as me. With dark power, nothing is impossible, Lord Dalriada. How else did you think Adira got smitten by you? You think those were true? You know very well those were nothing but fabrications. So don't get too cocky and start thinking that she actually chose you. Leon replied with intense hatred for this stupid lord who thought he could have Adira as easily as that. He wasn't going to let his dirty paws lay on her for an extended period of time. You. You're that mysterious man who gave me the flower? You. You embedded dark magic on it. To brainwash her? Oh it wasn't me, Lord Triton. But he's an ally so it's fine. You didn't think I was alone on this operation of taking down the Empire, right? Reese. To prevent Leon from talking too much, a voice similar to the one that talked to Triton, spoke from the shadows before he stepped out and revealed himself. I'm sorry for his coarse manhandling, Lord Dalriada. This lad never learned to calm down whenever it concerned his beloved. The man apologized smoothly and politely as he smiled at him. However, alarm bells were blaring inside Triton's head as he faced this man oozing with noisome darkness and that disgusting stench of death permeating from him. He was bad news. Like very, very bad news. Wait. Reese. Adira's butler. You are that Reese. Triton, who picked on that information out of all things, cried and turned to the man who was supposed to be a proud heir of the Ryona household. He didn't know that this man, as stuck up and as formal as a real noble, was actually that dirty boy Adira decided to adopt. So what? Adira's mine and only mine. Calm down, boy. Anyway, Lord Dalriada, 
Good job fulfilling the deed. I must say, I didn't really expect much from you but you really do come through when it matters, don't you? I'm sure as hell that the great demon lord is dying in his boots right now. How fun it would have been to actually see his reaction when the lady rejects him over and over again. The hooded man, the man that used Triton to hit Kasumi the hardest, chuckled darkly as he imagined Kasumi's face twisting in pain as the only woman he ever gave his heart to insults and refuses him to the best of her ability. Let's see how much you can take, O oh greatest crown prince. Let me go you monster. Where is Triton? What the hell are you doing? Lifa. Mother. Father. Help me. Adira continued to scream while chained up to her bed with Kasumi's ice. Of course he made sure it wouldn't hurt her but with her thrashing about like that, it would leave marks. Kasumi had already briefed the Duke and Duchess Silveris about Adira's condition as he asked them to leave it in his care with the promise that he will bring the old Adira back. So many things were stressing and upsetting him right now. He should have been marrying her right now, sharing a wonderful ceremony, exchanging their vows and sealing it with a kiss, and all those wonderful ritual of binding two souls. But that Dalriada bastard went and did something to his wife, now, she vehemently refuses him, and you wouldn't begin to imagine how painful it was, even for someone like Kasumi that was famous for being unfeeling. No. Especially Kasumi who can only ever feel anything when Adira is involved. The pain that was wrenching, stabbing, hammering his frozen solid heart felt like it was almost killing him. My wife. Why are you acting like this? Tell me please. Please help me see so I can help you out of it. Your Highness. You are holding me captive illegally. I should be the one asking you that. Why are you acting like this? What did we ever do to you? That bastard did something to you. Came an angry bellow from Kasumi that cracked all the breakable words inside the ladies room from the sheer pressure of the aura he accidentally emitted from his ire. And it only gave his wife all the more reason to fear and reject him as she obviously scooted back as much as she can even though her back was practically against the wall. I'm sorry. I'm. He trailed off as he saw the nervous apprehension gleaming dully on her ashen orbs, marring the beauty and warmth that used to hold whenever they gazed at his platinum ones. He couldn't take it in a more and removed himself from her sight. There was no use for him staying there if he would only cause her terror and anxiety and hate. Right now, his wife hated him to her core and he can't do anything but retreat with a bleeding heart. But, it was fine. As long as she was breathing and still with him then he was ready to bleed a sea of blood for her. As soon as he walked out of her room, he was met with worried sapphire orbs, looking up to him and silently asking how was his mother. She's fine but she can't remember anything. He spoke to the child softly and patted his head. He didn't let Heisa meet her for fear that if the child sees her and she doesn't recognizes him, then it won't only hurt the child but also the mother when she realizes what she's done. Just give her time. Mommy's a little sick right now. I wanna see her. A soft and gentle pleading voice came from the child with tears threatening to spill out. It didn't matter to him how sick she was. He needed to see her. He needed to see his mommy or else he'll go mad. Please, let me see her. Kasumi could only sigh. He only wanted to protect the both of them. But when the child pitifully pleads like that, who was he to stop him from seeing his mother, right? Besides, maybe by seeing their son, it might spark some memories back into her. I am warning you. She can't remember anything so she might also not remember you. But even so, do you still want to go? Kasumi asked although he didn't need to. He knew that even if the whole kingdom blocked this child, he'll just incinerate everyone that dared to stand between him and his mother. Himself included if he dared to do so. Hi sir. True to Kasumi's expectations, nodded at his father's question firmly and with conviction. No matter what happens, he must see his mother. Kasumi stood up and guided him inside where the woman was kept in chains. As soon as she saw the little child behind the prince, a painful squeezing clenched her heart that she unconsciously teared up a silent yet loud cry of a mother. You. Who are you? Notes. 
Hi Tilda I'm so tired Tilda Tilda I feel like melting and just fusing with my bed Tilda Tilda. Anyway, I'm sorry but the hardest part is yet to come Tilda or Tilda I was crying while I was writing this. I really hate hurting our dearest little Heiser but it must be done. Forgive your author Tilda. A weak banzai to us Tilda. Please mommy, mo. Mommy. The little child softly called for her as if afraid that she would push him away. Afraid that whatever he did, she would not recognize him. And more than anything he was hurt. It hurt to see his mother shed a tear like that. It hurt to see her chained up. It hurt to see her acting like they were complete strangers when she asked who he was. Mommy Tilda it's Heiser. Don't you remember Heiser? Don't call me your mother. I don't have a child. It struck the little child as deeply and as painfully as it could. He knew he'd be hurt if he saw her right now. He knew what he was getting himself into. But he cannot deny that it hurt too bad. To be repudiated by his own mother, the only human he loved and trusted, hurt too bad. Don't. Don't say that. Please mommy. Please remember Heiser. Please love Heiser again. Heiser will always be a good boy. He will listen to mommy always. Please, mommy. The child begged as rivers of tears fell from his sapphire orbs while trembling in his spot and garnered a reaction from Adira. St stop. Don't call me your mother. I don't have a child. I'm not your mother. Adira repeatedly cried while shaking her head as unreasonable tears spilled down her face like waterfalls. She didn't know why but she was itching to get out of the chains and wrap her arms around that child. To comfort him, love him, kiss him and be whoever he wanted her to be. She didn't understand why but his painful cries rang too loud in her ears. It was too deafening and heartrending. It didn't make any sense to her. She didn't know why but the way he cried for her brought this familiar feeling of misery in her heart. That it wasn't the first time she made this angel cry like that. That it wasn't the first time she hurt him like that. There was fear and pain in the woman's eyes while she stared at the child frozen in his spot turning pale from the shock. He didn't know what to do as he listens to his mother repeatedly tell him that she wasn't his mother, that he wasn't her baby. I hate you. I hate you mommy. You said Heiser was your only baby. I hate you. The child bawled and ran out of the room where the father lied in wait. He knew it but he hoped. If even Heiser couldn't bring her back, how was he supposed to? How can he bring Adira back? Days and weeks passed with Adira still not returning to her usual self. She continued to reject Kasumi and she went on a hunger strike. But even so, she doesn't forget to constantly ask Lai for how the little child was doing after he bolted out of her room that day. My lady, the child was deeply hurt. He refuses to eat and see anyone. Even his grandparents are getting concerned about his health. Please, my lady. Please return to the family that you loved so much. Why do you also say that, Lifer? Did his highness order you? Did he threaten you? Lifer, don't listen to him. Help me please. Help me out of here. I need to see, Triton. He is my family, Lifer, please. My lady, please stop this. Stop hurting your family. Lifer, for once, raised her voice against Adira. She couldn't sit by anymore. Not when she watches how her mistress, herself, destroys the family she tried so hard to protect, the people she'd willingly laid down her life for. She cannot let her do something she will definitely regret. Lifer. I need to be with Triton. No. Please, no. Please stop. And Lifer burst into tears at the hopelessness of things. No matter what people said to the Adira in front of them, she will only reply with that she needs to be with the Lord Dalriada. This wasn't their mistress. This wasn't what she wants. It was the second week of Adira's house arrest, the second week since she last saw the child and the first week since she started her hunger strike. Kasumi didn't lose hope and continued to visit her, tell her stories of how much they loved each other, recount the happy memories that they shared. Even the silliest ones were not spared. And each time, Adira would just gaze outside. Acting as if he wasn't there, as if she can't hear what he was saying. But every time Kasumi stops, 
she would then slowly turn to him with dead eyes and plead him over and over again to release her and allow her to be with Triton, to live, her life with the man she loved. However, as soon as Cassini hears that, he will just silently stand up and exit her room. No sound, no reply. Just nothing. It was a regular afternoon and everyone was weary. Mentally, physically and emotionally. Things weren't the same with how their mistress continues to reject an attempt to escape the first prince's claws. There was too much unrest that people couldn't find a chance to rest. That's why fatigue came unto them like a mad bull. The guards were the first ones down when an intoxicating sweet smell diffused in the air and filled their lungs, sending them into their dreams in a snap of a finger. Next were the servants. And just like with the guards, they fell like lifeless dolls after inhaling the sedating scent. A soft and silent squeak from Adira's doorknob caught her attention and expected silver locks to pop from there again so she paid it no mind. It was then pushed open slightly before a soft voice called her name. Adira? Triton. Triton, my love. Adira called happily, although a bit weirded out with the slight disappointment that she was wrong. I'm getting you out of here. Stay still. He said and hurriedly cut through Casimir's chains with his wind before pulling the lady up into his arms and facilitated their escape. It was all too easy, despite that the place he just broke into was the stronghold of the Silverist dukedom and the great demon lord was currently there. It felt as if they didn't plan to stop them all along. You're letting me go? Adira thought before her gaze drifted to the tall windows of her room that was too heavily tinted to show if someone was there or not. But even so, she knew he was there. She knew that he was watching all of these happen and he was letting it happen. Your Highness, you're letting Lord Dalriada take her away? If her current heart can only accommodate Dalriada, then I won't force it and hurt her. After all, I'm willing to bleed a million times for her smile. His coping mechanism. Adira, are you okay? Triton asked when he pulled the cart's curtain a little bit to take a peek and check on his wife's condition. Because she was a pampered noble lady her whole life, he figured that she would not be used to long-distance travels like these. We're almost there. It's just a little bit more ahead. We can take a break here if you want. He spoke and turned his head to check the empty road they were traveling on. This road wasn't frequented by merchants or people since it was the long and roundabout way towards a distant province. Triton was taking Adira away, somewhere far from Casimir's or anyone's reaches, far from the capital or the Silverus or Dalriada dukedom. They were eloping. He even made Adira wear this black long-sleeved dress with a brown leather corset binding her torso he bought from the first town they stopped over to make her less conspicuous. Her hair was also tousled messily so as to avoid people from recognizing her. Adira shook her head in response before smiling weakly. It's the third day since she left her home and in these three days, she couldn't think of anything or anyone but the little sapphire-eyed child and the silver-haired man. They were bothering her too much. Back in the palace, at the capital, inside a dark office with the curtains down, Kasumi was cooping himself up as always. He hasn't even so much as stepped a single foot outside that room ever since he came back from the Silverous Fief. A knock came and he stolidly replied, as monotonous and cold as ever. Your Highness, will you please eat something? Millimeter, put it there. The prince answered briefly while not stopping in whatever he was doing nor giving his aid that came in a simple glance. Roman, Alexander and William were lounging about without anything to work on as Kasumi hogged all the paperworks. He was using work as a distraction and it was all he ever did these past few days. Even though he was very efficient with it, it was abnormal, his coping mechanism worried them too much. He didn't sleep, or more precisely, he couldn't groom himself or eat. He was wasting away in his study doing even the most menial tasks of reorganizing the rotation of guards around the palace. Roman turned towards the table where his untouched lunch sat, now cold, and sighed. Ever since he let Adira go, he was deteriorating more and more each day, to the point that even he was afraid he'd suddenly succumb to the pain and loneliness and fall. And when he does, the empire falls along with him. Is? Casimir suddenly spoke and, finally, 
his writing stopped briefly. Is there a new report on her? Yes, he did let her go but that didn't mean he wouldn't care. There was not a single second when he didn't think of her, of how she was, if she already ate, if she was dressed warmly, or if she was comfortable enough, so many things ran through his mind at a faster rate than normal. And it was burning him out. But he can't stop. He can't help but constantly worry about his wife he chose to let go. Yes, they just passed the border town of Ertz. With the path that they took, I believe they're heading towards the Alinthi Kingdom's Brita province. Roman professionally supplied him the necessary information he knew what the man wanted. It was the other reason he came aside from reminding him of his meals which proved to be utterly useless. Is she healthy? Yes. She was made to change her clothes into a simpler one so as not to attract unnecessary attention. That's good. And Heiser. Still refusing to meet anyone. The child also hasn't touched his meals like you, you stubborn pair. And he also hasn't heard of the lady being kidnapped. Kasimi remained silent for a while before bobbing his head softly and went back to his work and started scribbling things on the paper again. He eventually stopped arguing with Roman's choice of words after a few times and let the latter rant as much as he wanted. He was far too jaded to even find the energy to refute and correct his aid. If there were moments when this prince stopped, it was spent on asking about Adira's and Heiser's whereabouts and statuses, basically reports. Will you please partake on your meal now? Roman tried to remind him once again. Millimeter later. Another few days passed, and they already entered the third week since Adira's been brainwashed. Heiser, who made up his mind on his course of action, traveled to the palace. If it was the only way for his family to remain complete, to bring back his mother, then he'll take the risk. No matter if it meant exposing himself and his mother to danger. Should it ever reach that stage, he was resolved to protect her to the bitter end. Upon arriving, the servants brought him first to his father's study, in hopes that maybe the child can convince him to take even just one meal. It has been a week since he neglected his health and the results were finally showing on his fatigued and flagging figure. Heiser softly knocked on the door and uncaring of whoever it was, Kasimi still monotonously replied, Come in. So he tottered close to his father's desk where the man was bending over, immersed in all of the papers around him, and didn't even spare him a glance. I want to see grandfather. Help me meet him, demanded the child, who, until now, refuses to address him as father. Surprised at the little and cute childish voice, different from the usual voices he heard every single day, he jolted and made a mistake on his writing. He finally looked up from the paper and his tired and dead platinum orbs met brilliant and firm sapphire eyes, the eyes that loudly proclaimed that he wasn't giving up, and that his bringing his mother back. The child only knew of his mother's disappearance a day before he decided to head down to the capital, and that was yesterday. Why do you need to see the king? I will make him utilize the army to bring mommy back. Son, doing that will only hurt your mother. No. Mommy's crying right now. I'm sure of it. She can only truly smile when I'm with her. She smiles the prettiest when she's here. And for the first time in a long while. A smile graced this iceberg's emaciated countenance and he nodded softly. Of course. How could I forget that? He mumbled before he finally stood up and walked close to tousle the little child's hair in a heap of mess. Mommy indeed is the prettiest when she's with her family. Let's go fetch her now. After a little bit of grooming up and fixing himself, Kasami took Heiser with him to face his father. Now. How to make the old man concede and mobilize the army to find Adira, he'll leave that up to his son's charms and skills. Grandfather, Heiser babbled before toddling closer to the man, who sat on his throne, with his arms wide open. Oh, my cute grandson, come to grandfather, the king coaxed in a soft voice and received the child, lifting him off the ground and made him sit on his lap. Grandfather, do you not want Heiser anymore? Heiser asked and looked up to him with beady tears pooled on the edges of his eyes, threatening to spill, looking very wronged and upset. Whoever told you such nonsense? Grandfather loves Heiser the most. Then do you not want mommy? 
The king faltered and paused at the child's question. It seems the misunderstanding ran deeper than he imagined. It seems he needs to explain it again and more properly so a child such as Heisa would understand. But before he could even speak, Heisa continued, Will you want her then if I told you that she's the maiden of light? What? Both Casimir and Anastasius reacted to the child's words. This prophesied queen didn't appear even after a millennia, heck. All their life they thought her existence was just a mere fantasy, a legend. And now the child says there's another one? Anastasius, after briefly reeling in his initial shock, thought that maybe the child was saying this thinking that he didn't want Adira because she wasn't this legendary queen that everyone coveted. And that picked at his heartstrings. I understand that you love your mother so much, my dearest child, but there cannot be two queens in one era, let alone in one kingdom. Anastasius gently explained to the little child but the latter only shook his head. Mommy really is the beloved daughter of the heavens. I'm sure of that because when I forged a contract with her, I coated her with my darkness to hide her thinking that she would be in danger if people found her. Hi sir, what are you talking about? Kasumi spoke and went closer to the child before squatting down so they were of eye level. I am the last divine dragon of darkness. A direct heir to the lineage of the black progenitors. Contrary to how humans use the darkness in hurting people, we, dragons, use it more as a defense against all kinds of magic. Mommy's not only a fire user. She's also a light. Casimir's mind was working faster than when he was minding all those tedious tasks about running the empire as he thought back to the barrier back at the great forest of Koth, to the phoenix and the black spot that it was protecting. It was Hysa. Hysa was the darkness the phoenix, Adira, was protecting. But, but if your darkness was protecting her, why was she brainwashed? Hysa looked sullen as he turned to his little hands that failed to protect his mother when it mattered the most the moment when he was at his weakest, the eclipse. Kasumi could see the pain and guilt vitiating the child's beautiful sapphire eyes and didn't press him for answers anymore. It wasn't only Adira who believed whatever this child told her. He also believed this spoiled son unconditionally. Mobilize the army, father. I will personally lead them. Kasumi proclaimed and the king, that short-circuited with the information overload, only nodded his head in acquiescence. His grandson was, in truth, a dragon. His daughter-in-law might be the maiden of light. And his son personally volunteered to lead the army to that foreign land. Goddesses, wouldn't this mean war? Something important. Good morning, Adira. A woman, hanging out her laundry, greeted the girl, with messy long ash-like locks passing by and smiled kindly to her. The girl, as if jolted out from a deep thought, flustered for a bit and shyly smiled back at the woman which oddly made her irresistibly cuter. Goddesses, if I were a man, I'd really steal this girl and marry her instead. But well, her husband is quite a looker too so they suit each other well. The woman thought to herself in while waving her hands at the girl. Are you off to shop? Um, yes. Oh. Where's your handsome husband then? That worrywart will turn this village upside down again if he can't find you in your home. The woman joked and remembered the first few days, when these two arrived and settled somewhere close to them, and the wife decided to stroll around. The husband came back and couldn't find her and he almost went insane looking for her everywhere. Like a mad dog. Poor lad. He knows, madam. He had something to do so he couldn't accompany me. Adira replied to their neighbor who introduced herself as Maria. If I were him, I really wouldn't let you off my sight. Ha ha! A girl as beautiful as you attracts too many eyes even when your hair is so unkempt. Truly, a royal's beauty shines through even with a disguise. So why use a disguise? Adira remembered herself saying something along those words while helping someone put on a disguise. But which royal was it? The first or the second prince? But even as she asked herself, she also thought to herself that she's never been close with any of them, so why would she remember something like that? Why would she say something like that? Something along that memory didn't make sense. It didn't fit anywhere in her memory lane. She can't remember how, why, and who it was. Adira? Oh.
I'm sorry. Were you saying something? She apologized as Maria snapped her out of her trance. Are you okay, dear? You're turning pale. I think it's better for you to return home for now. Or else, your husband will definitely worry about you. Adira clenched the basket in her hands as static noises rang in her ears again grating, annoying and irritating her. Ye yes, that may be best. She quietly replied while supporting her throbbing head. Why do I feel as if I'm forgetting something important? What is it? Kasimi, together with Hysa, was prepared to march towards the Alinthi kingdom donned in full armor. It wasn't that they were necessarily seeking for war, but as a precaution in the worst case that their kingdom refuses to surrender Triton and Adira, then, of course, he'll fight his way in. Iris Latifolia, who heard this news a little too late, rushed to catch up to him before they departed. She was perplexed why no one informed her when they were going to war. As the Maiden of Light, wasn't her power the desiderata? Your Highness, she called and the man acted as if he couldn't hear anything. Well, technically he could but his mind, soul and focus were somewhere else so nothing was really registering as of the moment. That or he just deemed her not worthy of his attention. Asterisk ad comitum trium, quidemi oblivascarius. Iris muttered while clutching the gem hanging on her neck. It glowed dimly that it attracted the prince's eyes not only that, but because he recognized the language Iris used. He was wondering what the woman was doing speaking a dead language and figured that she must be scheming something again. You really don't stop, even attempting to poison my mind. The stone encased inside her hands continued to glow dimly for three exact seconds before a sharp cracking sound invaded her ears as the gem shattered and fine dusts slipped through her fingers. What was that supposed to happen? Did I succeed? She mumbled under her breath and looked up to Kasami to test the waters. While somewhere, a man enshrouded with a hood, clicked his tongue and let out an exasperated sigh. Atilda it failed, huh? So she truly wasn't the Maiden of Light? Oh who Tilda what is she then? A fake born from a forbidden ritual, is it? How peculiar. Now, 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 where art thou Tilda? Oh Miss Beloved Child of the Heavens Tilda. Come out, come out wherever you are Tilda Tilda let's play Tilda. I wonder if you will you come out if I destroyed this empire Tilda hum Tilda. C.A. Casey. She softly called his name the name she heard only Adira uses. Kasimi stiffened as soon as he heard that name. He opened his mouth, about to reply to her, when loud booming sounds pervaded all throughout the capital alerting everyone. Kasimi's attention was immediately diverted to the scattered noises that came in rapid succession. Without much thought, he held Heiser, who was standing just beside him, and told him, My son, go high. Fly straight to your mother. Do not turn back no matter what happens or what you hear. I will catch up after I deal with things here. And the child, sensing that his father must have already formulated a plan inside his head, obeyed and nodded his head before running away and finding a secluded place where he could take off. Before Heise could get far though, Kasimi caught the child's shoulders and hugged him once before whispering, You've done well, my son. I'm leaving your mother in your care until I catch up with you. And he promptly let the child go before he turned to face his men. Heisa watched the broad and resilient back of his father before he, as well, turned around to go ahead first and reclaim his mother. Iris, who was left with Kasimi, felt joyous. It was the perfect moment to display and show to everyone her prowess as the Maiden of Light, and quite possibly capture Kasimi's heart that she reset. Your Highness, I can be of help. I am, after all, the Maiden of Light. She stated proudly and glowed golden before pulling a sword out from a portal. Kasimi just gave her a silent glance before barking his orders to the army, who was fortunately suited up and ready to go. The sounds came from three regions southward, westward and somewhere in between those two points. Squadron 1 and 2 will go with Alexander and William to check the one on the west side. Squadron 3 and 4 will go with Roman to the one next to it. Squadron 5, with me to the south. Each squadrons dispersed and proceeded to each of their assigned regions, firm and readying themselves to fight should they need to. 
It has been a while since they've been attacked in broad daylight. The last was a decade ago and they were taking orders from an eight-year-old boy, who seemed as if he was only playing a game of chess. But now, that eight-year-old boy is personally leading them this time. Notes. Asterisk at the count of three, you will forget all about me. Hi. So I used Latin as a dead language here so please don't pick on that and say mean things again. I love the language that's why I'm using it. I'm a bit busy so I won't linger long. Tomorrow again everyone. Banza i.e. tilde. P.S. I'm hoping to read more comments so I'll find my motivation and drive. As bright as sunshine. Heiser flew high up, to use the clouds as a cover, and was on his way to where his mother was when he heard another series of explosions from below that made him, momentarily halt. It wasn't that he was worried about his father or anything but he would hate it if, when his mother returned to the capital, she'll see nothing but debris and destruction left from the war that broke out prior. However, he remembered his father's words about not looking back or stopping no matter what he hears or what happens. Right now, he only had one mission. And that was to fly straight to his mother's side and reclaim her from the man who unlawfully took her away from them. Should this man dare to stop him, Heiser prayed his mother would forgive him for burning that bastard alive. Even though he was still upset and hurt about how his mother cannot remember him and even denied him a couple of times, his long reached the utmost limit of his tolerance of enduring the pain from the distance between him and his mother. Mommy, Heiser is coming to get you now. Don't push me away this time, please. Don't break my heart again. Heisa misses you, Mommy. Do you miss Heisa too? The dragon repeatedly prayed and begged his mother inside his heart hoping that his mother will receive him with warm and wide open arms again, to love and kiss him again. Heisa flew for two days straight and reached the border town of Erz, the town his father told him was the closest to where the man took his mother. He returned to his child form for the time being so as to conserve strength, and partly because he was hungry. The child walked around the town, in search for the path that connected this town to the place where his mother was currently staying at. Just a little bit more. A little bit more and I can see mommy again. And just the thought of seeing his mother's warm and happy smile, when she opens her arms to take him into her fold, was enough to dispel the hunger that he felt. He hurriedly and quite excitedly went on and walked towards that exit when he was suddenly pulled by his arm. Kid, don't go there. A gruffy man, a citizen of that town, worriedly warned the little child before he pulled Heisa with him. Let go of me. Don't you listen to your parents? I listen to mommy. I love my mommy. The child cried indignantly and strongly emphasized how he loves his mother. Then why are you going there? Don't you care what your mother would feel if you disobeyed her? The man spoke as he continued to pull Heiser along with him. He cannot just let the child go on his own like that. Especially with the electrifying friction between these two superpower kingdoms, the Alinthi kingdom and their very own Vasilis empire. I'm going to my mommy. Why are you stopping me? Your mother is at the next town. The man asked and raised a brow. He wondered what happened for his mother to be there while he was here. You should wait it out, Sonny. With the dissonance between the two kingdoms right now, I'm afraid your mother. The man wasn't able to finish when Heiser's sapphire eyes glinted dangerously while the child was practically easing with menace as he locked his eyes at the man that was wasting his time. Not only that, he was even jinxing his mother. I swear to God, I will come and find you if anything happens to mommy and roast you so slowly you'll beg me to kill you. The little dragon's heart was too small for such complicated emotions to even learn how to hide what he was feeling or thinking, so his face plainly shows them as it is, and it sent frightening shivers down this big and buffy man's spine. A little child managed to intimidate a man as large as him and yet he wasn't the least bit ashamed of it. He felt more grateful that the child did not linger for even a second and bolted out of there the moment he loosened his grip. What was that child? The man thought to himself while watching his little bat get farther and farther away. He felt so scared that he thought he saw a dark mist coating the boy's petty figure gradually disappearing. Adira was staring into space, sitting alone in a little makeshift sunroom Triton made for her so she could enjoy her tea there.
when a brief and sharp pricking pain stung her chest. She reflexively clutched her chest when a black mist suddenly caught her attention. The most peculiar thing about it was, it was coming from her. What is this? She whispered and watched the mist gradually dissipate and vanished as if it didn't even exist. My love, you said something? Triton, who was resting on the steps a short break from his laborious work and leaned back to take a peek of his wife. Millimeter. It's nothing, dear. Are you tired? Let me massage your shoulders for you. Adira shook her head, pushing it to the back of her mind, and smiled prettily for her weary husband, who was doing all the work for the both of them. It's okay. Your smile is enough to recharge me, but if you really want to quickly replenish me of my energy, come hug me please. The man grinned brightly, as bright as sunshine, and opened up his arms. That smile reminded her why she fell for him in the first place. However, there was this feeling in her heart that a smile much more prettier than that, once smiled for her. That it used to brighten her, and frankly everyone's, day. That it was a smile she grew to love. What in the world is this? What is it? What am I missing? Who are you? If it's not Triton, then who? Was the inner turmoil inside her heart? although she was embracing her husband and smiling happily in the outside, feeling incredibly bad about thinking about someone else even when she was facing her husband. I'll forget you. I only need Triton. So please, I beg you, please stop hurting my heart. Notes. Hi. So that part which was very very redundant, is, as always, on purpose. It's meant to emphasize things more. Anyway. Thank you so much for all the new followers and the subscribers and the commentators, I love you guys the most. Sure, and also the voters and especially everyone that gave this story so much love and support. I am very very thankful and honored my dears Tilda. Thank you so much. Banza A Tilda Tilda. P.S. I'm very proud to announce that we have topped the royalty tag. Thank you so much for all your love everyone. I love you all so much. Mommy is here. Heisa finally arrived at the place, after another two days of alternatively walking and flying low, which he cannot sustain that much since he was running low on energy, and finally managing to hitchhike, only to find a leveled village. There was not a soul on sight nor houses still standing. There was only smoke, fire, and destruction, and he hasn't seen a single glimpse of his mother yet. So fear was bubbling up and corrupting him inside as the man's words were replaying over and over again inside his head. Black mist was clouding around him swirling into this dangerous and ominous whirl. The only thing that was holding him back was the comfort of not seeing his mother yet. He walked around, turning and turning, trying to find even a single clue as to where his mother was or if she was alive or not. He was feeling very conflicted right then. He wanted to see his mother yet he didn't. He didn't want to see her corpse. He doesn't want to see his whole world under a pile of rubble, lifeless and broken. Mo. Mommy. Where are you? Heisa is here. Mommy. Please. Mommy. The child let out a woeful cry, falling down onto his knees as tears spilled from his eyes like heavy rains. Feeling hopeless, scared and heartbroken. The black mist that surrounded the child quickly crept throughout the area, seeming in attempt to swallow the whole place. A harrowing sight that was making him hopelessly think that he had indeed lost his mother. That he was too late. Mommy. The little boy sobbed. Little boy, it's not safe here. Came a voice that made everything stop, the mist, the rumbling, and his poor little heart a voice so beautiful it was instantly healing him and his broken world. He snapped up and stared at the girl offering her hands to him, with a worried look, before her eyes widened in surprise. Mommy. Mommy Tilda Tilda he continued to sob so painfully and ran into her arms. He missed his mother too much. He thought he'd never see her again. He feared she had left him for good. You. What are you doing here? This is a far place. I want to be with Mommy. Don't leave Heisa again please. I'll always be a good boy. I'll always listen to you. Just don't leave me please. And Adira couldn't help the pang of pain that attacked her heart while she listened to this little child's pleas. 
Such beautiful and magnificent sapphire eyes were being clouded by tears and it was heartbreaking, and it was all her fault. His cries and tears were scratching and ripping her heart apart so painfully. She wrapped her arms around the child and felt hot tears spilled down her cheeks. Her hold tightened when the child wailed after finally feeling his mother's arms around him again. It had been too long. Shush. Don't cry. She coaxed the child sweetly and gently, just like the way Heisa remembered it, which only made him cry more. It doesn't matter who you are or what you are to me. If you want me to be your mother, then I will be your mother. Mommy's here, baby. Mommy will always be here. She whispered before pecking the child on his forehead. Heisa's bawling and crying lasted a bit too long so Tritan had to go and find Adira since she's been gone for much too long. He only agreed to separate briefly to find and possibly help more survivors. But she still wasn't back and it was scaring him. He walked briskly and screamed for her name. When he found her though, a child he knew too well was latched onto her and sleeping peacefully. Oh, Triton. I'm sorry. I couldn't carry him so I... Let go of him, Adira. What? Let go of that child. Triton cried, already panicking, and stomped close to them when Adira suddenly brandished her sword at him ready to attack him any time. Looking at her like that, Triton's heart was already hammering at his chest. She looked as if she was back to her old self as she protected that little raven-haired child. Don't you dare. I don't know what's gotten into you but you're not taking this child away from me. But, Triton, my love, he walked miles and miles just to find me. Can't you just let him stay with us? I swear I won't let him bother you. Just please. But he's your son, Adira. He's yours and Kasumi's son. Please? I can't leave him alone. Please dear. This is the only thing that I ask. Don't take him away from me. Triton clenched his fists and swallowed everything that he wanted to say down into his chest. He'll have to deal with this child when Adira's not looking. He'll just have to endure him for a while. Okay. He finally agreed and Adira's sword went up in flames before they vanished and she smiled happily and beautifully, genuinely, for the first time in a while. And this didn't slip through Triton's eyes. Because, she didn't glow like that for the past weeks that they've been together. Sure, she was smiling and telling him she loved him and was happy. However, it was never as bright as that. Come on, we need to get out of here fast. It's not safe here anymore. Adira nodded her head before she remembered that she couldn't carry the child. He was a bit heavy for her. Give him here. Triton, who noticed that she wasn't getting up remembered the words she told him as soon as he found her. So he picked Heisa up in his arms and held her hands. I need to get rid of this child as soon as possible. He's a threat. And him being here means, he is coming. Thank you, my love. Thank you for allowing me this. Adira expressed her gratitude and hugged his arm with a peaceful and enchanting smile on her face. Her emotions were as genuine as they were before this whole thing happened, before he eliminated Kasumi from her life. Triton bent down and planted a lasting kiss on her lips before he gazed at her beautiful grey eyes and said, I love you, Adira. I love you so much, my wife. Millimeter. I love you too, my love. Notes. Hi. I'm a little late at updating in the usual time since I was spending some time just relaxing and being lazy. LOL. Anyway, I expect to hear from you my lovelies. Banza A tilde. P.S. Make sure I enjoy your comments and emotions. LOL. Though I always enjoy them anyway. The highest seat. Adira, Triton, and Heisa, together with a group of survivors from the village that they took refuge in. Walk deeper into the Alinthi Kingdom's territory to escape the ongoing war with the Vasilis Empire. So far, as things stood, the Vasilis army were pushing the Alinthi soldiers back which was why the fighting reached them. So in simple words, the Vasilis army was winning under the two princes' combined efforts. The first prince was personally leading their army so it was understandable why their forces were so strong. Come on! Kasumi Athanasius Rosen Vasilis is worth thousands more soldiers. So having him at the helm was like having thousands of elite grade soldiers rushing at you. Mommy Tilda Tilda Heiser wanna walk with mommy. 
The child, who was sitting on Triton's shoulders as stiffly as he could, finally let out a whine. He didn't come as far as this just to ride the man's, who took his mother away from him, shoulders. If he wanted this kind of humiliation, he had won back at the capital a shoulder he can ride as much as he wants. And hey, it's the highest seat in the whole empire to boot. No. You stay there, okay, come down. Adira, as lenient as she used to be with Hysa, agreed to the child's whines as she cut Triton's strict voice and opened up her arms to help him down. No. I will carry him, Adira. My love, the child's a bit heavy and we still have a bit of distance to walk to get to the next town. You must be tired now. So rest while you can, okay? Adira fluidly shut Triton down and successfully fulfilled the child's demands. Hysa was walking, quite happily and energetically, alongside his mother holding her hand. The girl was happier than she's been these past few days and she couldn't wrap her mind around it. Why? Is it because of the child? Did she want a child with Triton? As she was thinking those things, a loud growling sound reached her ears and she turned to her side, where an adorable child was blushing red because of the sound he made. Oh. Are you hungry? Adira, feeling her heart swell from an emotion she can't name, smiled sweetly and turned to Triton. Do we possibly have spares, dear? Yes. Here. Triton handed a triangle-shaped rice wrapped in a green seaweed strip to the little boy, but the latter refused it. Baby, Papa Triton won't bite you. It's okay. Adira giggled thinking that Hysa was only being shy to Triton. It seems her husband wasn't that popular with kids as he was with girls. He's not my daddy. And at the child's words, Triton shoved the food to Adira's hands and spoke of something totally random just to try and distract her away from this child's words. He really is trouble. So I think you should just give it to him. It seems as if I am not that popular with kids. Adira giggled at her husband's words as she was also thinking the same thing before patting him comfortingly on his shoulder already forgotten what the child last spoke of. I also thought the same, but it'll be fine. You can practice with Hysa for when we have our own, right? And her words were enough to calm him down. If she can still say such words to him, then she was still under that spell. He just needs her to remain that way forever. Cause if you learn what I did, I wonder what you will do to me, Adira. I wonder with what eyes will you look at me with. But, wait, Adira. How did you know his name? While back at Casimir's side, the Alinthi soldiers that came to take the capital were currently being chased back by Casimir and his team. This particular fraction just had the worst luck to be matched up with Casimir. What the hell? Who said that the demon lord would be weak now? Isn't he as lively as hell? The soldiers grumbled while trying to fend off the attacks from the 5th squadron led by Casimir. The reason why they were as brave as now at attacking the capital was because they received a tip that the great demon lord of the empire aka the crown prince was already weak and despondent. It was the chance of their lifetime to tip the scales of dominion while the beast was down. Oh, but they weren't entirely wrong though. If they had come a few days earlier then things might have been different. If they had arrived when Kasumi didn't care whether he lived or died since Adira wasn't with him and doesn't love him anymore, then they might have successfully tore down the empire. But Heiser got to him first. Heiser gave him a new hope. His son was able to pull him out of his rut and gave him a reason to chase his wife. Because, wasn't she truly happy while she stayed by his side? Didn't she dream of giving Heiser the perfect family? Wasn't she the prettiest? most beautiful and most enchanting when she's the happiest. And she was. She was when she's together with him and their son. So he will take her back. He will chase her again. If he has to do everything from scratch again then he doesn't care. He'll just have to repeat all the schemes that he did to tie her to him. If he did it once, who says he can't do it again? And Kasumi was brimming with life again. He needs to get this over with fast so he can catch up to them. He needs to see his wife in the flesh again, not only in his nightmares. He needs to feel her in his arms again. The crown prince was never weak you bastards. He's the strongest of them all. You better run back to your fortress with your tails in between your legs. 
A few of the Vasilis knights replied while waving their swords at their enemies. And that was when Kasimi came face to face with this hooded man that stood out like a sore thumb. He didn't seem like someone from the Alinthi kingdom but he was standing in their midst. So that means he is an ally, right? My, I didn't expect you to bounce right back, your highness. He chuckled with mockery and waved his hands as he brandished a black sword against Kasimi. Why don't you crawl back into your office now? Let's leave all these menial fights to the lower echelon. Who are you? Notes. Hi. I've been a little lazy this weekend. Go menasai? Anyway, I'll be waiting for your comments, okay? Banza A. Tilda. The boy's mother, um, I don't really need to answer you, do I? And I don't want to Tilda Tilda. So Tilda will you crawl back to your office now? The hooded man continued to mock Kasimi while languidly swinging his sword around, trying to provoke the man into action or mess up his focus. There was a sure way to that but he liked to play around with this almighty demon. The great demon lord thought that this clown greatly needed to be put in his place and he rushed at him before swinging his sword. He was confident that it should have cut this bastard in half but the latter was able to block it. As if he could see his moves. You know, you show too many mistakes when you're in a hurry. Is it the Lady Silverus perhaps? The man asked and Cassini visibly stiffened before leaping away to create some distance between them. He knew that it was just an attack on his psyche to distract him and destroy his concentration, but damn was it hard to ignore. He can't help but be affected especially if it's Adira. Bingo. The man whispered and smirked at the visible effect of the silverous woman's name on the prince's stance, form and pattern. He was too open. When you think about her, you have too many openings. He thought and, this time, rushed forward to deliver an attack of his own. Kasimi, although was able to defend against it, he just barely made it and so he still suffered a heavy blow to his torso. The hooded man retreated a few steps back and whistled in amusement at this prince's fast reflexes and sturdiness even when distracted. Shall I push you more? You can still dance, right? Adira and her group were still walking further north and it was starting to grow cold. Since Heiser was an unforeseen addition, there was not enough coat to spread around. It's okay. Give mine to Heiser. But mommy, Adira. Both Triton and Heisa complained at the same time. To the people around, it was just like a beautiful picture of a warm family with the father and son both worrying about the mother. But to the three of them especially to Triton and Heisa, the other was just an annoying bug buzzing vexingly around this pretty lady. Triton, it's okay. I'm a fire attribute, remember? I can handle the cold. Besides, I particularly love it. Cold water. Ice. You. He seemed very happy talking with a nice block like you. The cold and dangerous glint in his eyes. Dira? Adira. Triton snapped her out of her brief stupor as she jolted at his hold on her arm and retracted it harshly, as if his touch burns her. Are you okay? He asked. Oh. Um, yes. She replied before turning to the child whose clear and bright sapphire eyes stared at her. A hey, anyway. I'll be fine. But if you really worry, then I'll share it with Heisa. She suggested to which brightened the beautiful boy's world. It was the perfect idea. Now, he can sleep with his mommy again. And his happiness was obviously etched in those shining sapphire orbs and the cheer that he was desperately trying to hold in but could not when he jumped onto her arms and hugged her as much as he could. Adira giggled at this little one's liveliness despite the dropping temperature as they went further north. While Triton just eyed the pair and thought back to Adira's answer to his question. He said his name was Heisa. He calls himself in third person. Did you not notice that, my love? He passed his lips into a thin line as he started to panic whether Adira had regained her proper memories or if she was still under the influence of that dark spell. Adira, studying her husband's profile, wondered why he seemed listless and uneasy. She gingerly reached out and cupped his cheeks. He jolted lightly after feeling her soft and warm palms caressing his face, his focus returning into his ocean blue eyes. Are you okay, dear? Yes, my love. Everything's fine as long as you are near. 
He answered and peppered light and loving kisses over her hands and her cheeks to her luscious red lips. Oh how soft they felt against his. It was fine. Things were good. Adira still loves him. She is still his. Adira slept next to Hysa, her arms wrapped protectively around the child, and breathed peacefully. They were camping outside, amidst the woods, and Triton was one of the few men that kept watch for this shift. He periodically casted glances towards the mother and son, silently debating with himself whether he should get rid of this child before he creates an ever bigger problem for him. However, he knew that once he did that, he'll definitely lose Adira. Even now, when she doesn't have any memories of the boy, she was already too attached to him that she was practically back to herself as the boy's mother. He snapped the wood he held in his hands an outlet for his irritation before feeding it to the fire and decided to distract himself from his thoughts about Heiser. The boy, unnoticed by anyone, suddenly sat up before raising his gaze up to the dark night sky. The moon was hidden by some dark clouds before it came out almost as if on Q. His sapphire orbs glowed dimly before looking down to his mother and held her head. Come back to us, mommy. I swear, I'll protect you properly this time. Please come back to us. Heisa needs you. Daddy needs you. The child whispered while encasing her in his darkness, cause as they say, fight fire with fire and poison with poison. Now, he fights darkness with darkness. And with the bright moonlight, on the night of the first month since Adira's been brainwashed, a thin coating of dark mist slowly encased her slumbering figure, carefully casing her in to negate the dark spell casted on her. I am the last divine dragon of darkness. No dark arts can stand in my way as I protect my mother. Heisa thought while waiting and looking out for prying eyes. It was fortunate that they were a little ways away from the bunch so no one noticed him yet especially Triton. How dare you take my mother away from us? How dare you ruin my family? The child thought while trying real hard to keep his hatred for the man in check. He must not jeopardize his mother. They must not notice him. I'm taking my mother back now. Notes. And our baby rises up to protect his mother. Ho ho Tilda never take what belongs to this dragon lest you feel his might. Anywa Tilda I'm looking forward for more comments. Banza i.e. Tilda. Can't lie to me, Roman found these. I remembered that you loved Shamamal so you take it instead. The man coldly and uncaringly slid the box of teas, all Shamamal with slight twists, before he leisurely leaned back and returned to the paperworks that he brought with him on his third consecutive visit. Adira crunched her brows in confusion while wondering about these Shamamal teas that Roman found. She took the box and peered inside to check what kind of teas would a prince's aide choose when what she saw surprised her. These blends weren't at the market. These were specifically tailored to her tastes. He... He made these. When? Um... Roman found these? He found these? Adira repeated. Yes. And this cold man still fluidly lied in between his teeth without looking up from the papers. Wow. How can you lie as easily as, um? On second thought, you don't know how to lie, huh? I mean, who reads reports upside down like that? Pfft. How adorable. You really can't lie to me, can you? Casey. The sleeping woman whispered a name before opening her gray eyes and seeing her son's glowing sapphire eyes. Waiting to see if he succeeded or not. Babies should be asleep at this hour, you know? How will you grow big and protect mommy if you don't sleep properly? Adira spoke softly and smiled warmly at the little child that couldn't help but tear up as soon as he knew that his mother had finally remembered him. Mommy Tilda Tilda his voice broke before diving to his mother's chest, whose arms finally opened up to him willingly. Why is my baby crying? Did mommy do something wrong? Wait. Where are we? Why are we? Is that Triton? Where's Casey? What happened to the party? What's going on? She had a lot of questions running through her confused mind that missed a whole month's worth of memories. As she could not remember the things she did to both her husband and her child. She stood up in a hurry that attracted Triton's attention and he turned to them when he heard a rustle from their direction. Adira was up. What's wrong, dear? Dear? What did you just call me? Adira stomped close to the man 
unmindful of the other people that were still asleep. She needed answers. ASAP. Things weren't making any sense to her and it was driving her insane. Like why was she camping in the bitter cold outside? In commoners' clothes. With Heisa but without Casey? And why was Triton here instead and calling her dear? She grabbed his collars and pulled him down roughly. Her fiery ashen gray orbs, that was burning with rage, stared at his ocean blue eyes before she repeated her question eerily slow. What did you just call me? Ayadira. You. You're back? Mommy, we need to go. The capital is under attack. Daddy still hasn't come so he must be in danger. Heiser interrupted her. He didn't want to stay a moment longer here where he can see the bastard. Else, he might not hold back and really roast him in a never-ending fire. Casey. What did you do to me, Triton? Why am I here? Why is Casey not here? Casimi. Casimi. Will you please stop? Why do you always seek him? Why not me? The man finally retorted, fed up with hearing nothing but Casimi's name roll off her tongue. They were happy before. She was happy with him. She was his. I told you, dear child, it's not good to fight in front of your child. Marriage always comes with problems. Just talk and sort it out calmly by yourselves. A woman advised the young married couple and Adira was flabbergasted at her words. There were a lot of incongruities in her words. I am not yet married, madam. Oh dear. You've been living together for a while now. If he's not your husband then what is he, right? The woman said with a slight laugh at the silliness of Adira's tantrum from whatever this young couple was arguing about. And that's when Adira thought about this outlandish theory where Triton somehow brainwashed her into thinking that he was her husband and fell for him. Kind of like how she was from her first life head over heels for him. Then took advantage of this misfortune and whisked her away from the capital away from Kasumi. But that wasn't her Triton. That was not the Triton she fell in love with. Right? However, after thinking about it that way, she couldn't help the hate bubbling up inside her, making her unable to think about anything else and threw a loud and resounding slap across the man's cheeks. In her eyes were pure hatred for him hatred, disappointment, and pain. The Triton that she loved from her past life was gone. This was a different Triton now. Bastard. How dare you do this to me? Adira pivoted on her heels, hurrying to return to Kasumi's side via Heiser, when Triton caught her arm. Where are you going? And there was no response but only another loud slap on his other cheek before she materialized her sword and pointed it at him. Don't you dare touch me or, God forbid, I will slit your throat open. You were, are and will never be my husband. In this life, I will only have one husband no matter what happens and that is Kasumi. It will always be Kasumi. And with that she ran towards Heisa and pulled the child along with her back to where they came from. Triton, who could never let the woman go, ran, after collecting himself, to catch up with her. But who can ever catch up to a dragon, right? Back at the capital, where the war was still ongoing, the first prince, who fought at the front of the army, finally fell to his knees. It wasn't because he was lacking in any areas or anything. It wasn't because he was weaker than his enemy either. He simply just lost the will to fight. Oh Tilda what's this? The prince finally kneels down to me. How flattering. Is the beast ready to be tamed now? The man mockingly laughed followed by the Alinthai soldiers that could finally breathe well as they watched the great demon lord fall from his pedestal. And all it took was a simple news. About how this lady Silveris had married another man. As soon as Kasumi heard about it, he was too shocked he couldn't defend well nor attack properly anymore. He couldn't think nor move as well as he used to. There were no strength in his swings and blows anymore. He was just like a lifeless dummy now. Well Tilda Tilda she did leave you for another man, didn't she? How sad Tilda here you are, waiting for her return, fighting to get to her side even a second earlier. But what happened? She ended up marrying that Lord Dalriada guy, didn't she? So what are you still fighting for? Why are you still defending her home? She'll never come back here and you know that deep inside you, don't you? Surrender, Prince Kasumi. Surrender the empire to us. Let it burn. 
Heiser flew as fast as he could with Adira on his back. He was faster than he was when he was out looking for his mother and he can only attribute it to the fact that he was with his mother again and they are now returning, home. That and this time, he only had to go straight to one particular destination. So, he was feeling more strong and alive. I'm really sorry to ask you to fly faster, baby, but we don't have much time. Don't worry, mommy will also give you her mana, okay? Mommy will protect you. Adira said while she gripped on Heisa's spikes tightly so she didn't get blown away and lessen the child's worries about flying faster. She really had this nagging feeling in her chest that Kasumi was in danger. Not only that, she needed to give the man a piece of her mind. How dare he actually let her go? She was gonna show him what it meant to anger Adira Silveris. The Vasilis army looked onto Kasumi's pathetic figure. In his platinum eyes was a deep and endless chasm that could swallow a person with no hopes of turning back. That dim glow in his eyes clearly showed how he had lost his reason to live, to take up his sword and fight. There's no more reason to preserve this empire, is there? To him, a world without Adira was just an empty and desolate world damned for all eternity. There was no warmth, no light, no life. Just a hollow, cold and bitter world. So without her, what does he care what happens to the empire? He never cared about its citizens, that's for sure. He only protected and improved it to shape it into an empire that would give comfort to his wife. He want to build an empire that his wife would love an empire he could offer to her. That was the reason why he handled all the tedious tasks of governing this large empire because he knew his wife loved it, because Adira loved the people living in it. But she was gone. She had married Dalriada. She was not his anymore. Then let this empire crumble and fall. Let it burn with me. Please. Just kill me. He thought to himself before raising his empty gaze towards the man who was prattling about something he could not hear. Even his troops were saying something but he can't hear them. Ah. I wanna die. He then slowly raised his sword and his sudden movement alerted the man and the Alinthi soldiers, thinking that he was not done yet and gave false hopes to the Vasilis army. As he was about to drive his sword into his own chest, the hooded man, who was able to predict it and moved accordingly, blocked his sword before clicking his tongue disapprovingly. Who said you could go ahead and die? I still have use for you. It is such a waste to have you kill yourself. So why don't I offer you to the princess of the Alinthi kingdom, hm? I'm sure, she'd be delighted. You see, the lass has her eyes on you. So since your beloved Lady Silveris has gone off and married another man, why don't you go and marry another as well? Isn't that fun? You also get to get even with her on the process as well. Everything that was happening seemed too funny to this man as he continued to ridicule the crown prince who did not care what was said to him anymore. Nothing was getting to him anymore. He just let himself fall. And indeed, as Roman feared, with Casimir's fall was the empire's fall as the Vasilis soldiers also lost their will to fight. If their prince, the man who led them countless times and the person they were supposed to protect, gave up, why shouldn't they? What use was their not giving up? They'll just be subjugated by another force and live life like how they used to or worse, be forced to live like slaves. But none of those matter. Kasumi had given up. They cannot hope to turn this around anymore. When the sun rises in a few more hours, they'll be under another kingdom's rule. The scales of dominion had finally tipped into another kingdom's favor. The man, sensing Kasumi's lack of movements now, whistled sharply to get the Alinthi soldier's attention and smirked. Take whatever you like, boys. Money, women or what. They can't do anything now that the beast is down. And this elicited a roaring, loud and victorious cheer from the soldiers as the Vasilis knights dropped their swords one by one at the face of hopelessness. The soldiers rushed forward, all at once, and did whatever they wanted. Some pillaged stores and houses while some pulled women left and right to have the women serve them. Some wanted to either vent out pent-up stress or take revenge and started pummeling the dispirited soldiers, and they didn't fight back. Though there were some that tried to, they were only met with more pain as Alinthi soldiers ganged up on whoever fought back. 
while Kasumi just remained kneeling there unseeing, unaware, and unfeeling. The hooded man loved to watch this despairing empty face of Kasumi. But he wanted to, even just once, hear the great demon lord scream in pain. Thinking this, he pulled out his sword and pointed it at the man's chest, gently pushing it in and carving a deep enough wound, but the man wasn't reacting. Hum. He hummed and went lower. He can't drive it into his chest. That'll kill Kasumi. And if he dies, who will he offer to the princess? How will he suffer? He cannot give him the easy way out. So he buried the sword deep into the man's thighs until it practically pierced through, but he still wasn't reacting. Not a slight twitch or cry. What the heck? Did you faint while still kneeling and with open eyes? Why do you not react? He asked while knocking Kasumi's head roughly. And even then, the latter wasn't showing any reactions. The hours ticked by and the Alinthai soldiers were still drowning themselves in pleasure while being high in their festive mood before they heard the hooded man, who was the reason why they won, whistle again. Hey Tilda to those who had grudges with this prince Tilda Tilda you can rough him up, but don't hurt the face or else I can't sell him to your princess. He announced after getting bored with trying to make Kasumi scream with no results. And well, these soldiers, whether they had grudges with Kasumi or not, wanted the honor and experience of beating the crown prince of the Vasilis Empire widely known to be untouchable. So they all wanted to get a few punches in. They all surrounded this poor unresponsive man and charged all at once when a roar and a feminine cry that came from above them made them halt in their advance. KC, the phoenix, the woman landed with ease, her long ash locks flowing behind her enthrallingly, and before they could even react, the men closest to her suddenly fell down as showers of red liquid splattered everywhere while also drenching this newcomer with fresh and bright red blood. The men, Stunned with her agility and her beautiful form, couldn't move away in time as if they were caught in a spell, before the girl started to move fluidly, as if she was simply dancing, and slit their throats open or detached their heads from their shoulders. In just a few short seconds, almost twenty men had already fallen into this entrancing, blood-stained woman's hands. In her mesmerizing ash-like gray orbs, there was burning fury and death. She was out for blood. She, a lady of noble blood who didn't think twice or even wince as she went around slitting soldiers' throats, was dangerous. She may not be as strong as the first prince but she sure as hell ain't a simple foe as well. She was as dangerous as this demon lord. How dare you hurt what's mine? She spoke in a sinister and dark voice, oddly making her look more seductive than lovely and divine before a black dragon with big bright sapphire eyes landed on her side and with a slight whisk of his tail, sent countless soldiers flying away. She burned brightly as small streaks of fire crawled all over her body, giving her that ethereal look as if she had phoenix wings. I can hear Adira's voice. Is she back? Ah. Oh. It couldn't be. She married Dalriada. She's not coming back. Kasumi thought to himself but still risked lifting his gaze off the ground after he felt a slight tremor and saw that bright woman, ablaze, as she stood against the rising sun of dawn, looking like the very image of hope. Adira. The woman heard a weak voice from behind her and turned to see Kasumi looking at her with empty and devastated orbs. Her heart twinged painfully as she looked at how low her husband had fallen and reached out her arms. But instead of hugging this man and comforting him, she gave him one loud and strong slap, so strong the man could feel a stinging pain on his cheek where her palms, connected, and focus slowly returned to his eyes as he craned his head slowly to look at this crazy woman, who attacked him out of nowhere, with wide and shocked platinum eyes. This was not the reunion that he imagined them to have. How dare you, you bastard! How dare you let go of me! How dare you allow Triton to take me away! With your strength and prowess, I highly doubt he was able to successfully whisk me away without you putting up a fight. Is this how you treat your wife? Just because I act a little bit crazy, you decide to let me go. How dare you, you mad, selfish, arrogant bastard. You cold, unfeeling, demonic zombie. She started her raging tirade of complaints and her exploding furor while punching the man's chest to release her anger. 
she was letting him have a taste of a silverous woman's outrage and it was not pretty at all. She was nagging so much a normal person would have almost felt his ears go numb and fall off. She continued to rage and be livid before tears started cascading down from her smoldering ashen eyes. The next time you let me go, I will really come back to kill you, you bastard. You can't let go of me. Even when I act crazy. Even when I can't remember. Even when you don't want me anymore. You can't leave me. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't leave me you ungrateful bastard. Of course, you're right. You're always right. I can't let you go. I can't live without you. I can't forget you. I can't ever be myself without you. I can't. I can't. I really can't. The man finally spoke and pulled the woman into his tight embrace before placing a searing kiss on her lips, the lips he had missed so much. The ones he dreamed of whenever he falls asleep. He kissed her hungrily. As if he'll wake up any moment now and the woman will vanish again. As if everything wasn't real. As if his wounds were non-existent. He kissed her senseless. And the Alinthi soldiers, who had to witness this, though surrounding them couldn't come close. Part of it was because of that huge ass dragon and part of it was because they could feel that if they came a meter close to that couple and their life is forfeit. And as the couple parted, breathless and gasping, with flushed faces, Adira suddenly smiled. Who told you it was okay to kiss me? Oh. Yes, you married Dalriada. Adira, once again, annoyed with this talk about marrying Triton, gave the man another slap on the other cheek this time. While the latter was practically clueless why he deserved that slap, she started her nagging again. How could you? If you want me to marry Triton then I'll do just that. So you can go and marry whoever you want as well, the Talinthi princess perhaps. I'm breaking up with you. I'm annulling the engagement between us right now. You can't. The man, for the first time in his life, visibly panicked and held the woman's arms tightly refusing to let her go. You can't break up with me. I won't allow you. You can only marry me. Only me. That's the Kasumi that I know. Then pick up your lazy ass and help clean up. She mightily ordered this untamable, untouchable beast, who was reduced to acting like a little puppy wagging his tail for her. She pointed at the remaining soldiers, already shaking in fear, while some attempted to run away and Kasumi obeyed immediately. He didn't want another earful from her. But, the happy thing about having to clean these bastards up was the fact that his wife was joining him. Although he hasn't seen her fight, he knew she wasn't weak. These pair each went on their own side and cleaned up, and whether they surrendered or not, they left no survivors. Kasumi would steal glances at Adira's fight and watch her dance around the battlefield, slashing, stabbing and kicking soldiers left and right, like it was her own personal ballroom. She was soaked to the bone with the blood of the enemies that she killed as she basked with the exhilarating feeling of letting loose. But Kasumi could only see beautiful madness in those eyes. This man was already in too deep. Notes. For Adira's fight scene, if you want to try to see how I envisioned it, please refer to Liz's fight scene when she chose to pick up a sword to protect Sile. Yes, I loved that part so much. I updated earlier cause I've got an exam I need to study. Ciao tilde tilde. Wish me luck tilde. Banza i.e. tilde tilde. My only truth. Kasumi went around and mirrored Adira's movements. Completely forgetting some things like his wounds perhaps, or that there was still that guy hiding behind enemy lines or that there was an odd one mixed in them, who could only gape in wonder and envy at the woman who danced around the battlefield like she practically lived there her whole life. Where did she learn how to move like that? She whispered before gripping the hilt of her sword tightly and dashed forward. Taking advantage of the confusion and thrusting out her sword towards Adira's way, she pushed with all her strength. The latter, who sensed a malevolent intent directed at her, dodged and threw back an attack when she saw who it was that made her grit her teeth in annoyance. What the hell? Are you blind? Oh. Forgive me, Adira. I thought you were an enemy. She replied sarcastically. Try that again and I'll pierce through your eye socket, you bitch. 
Adira's blood was practically boiling while she stood at the middle of the battlefield and here was Iris trying to pick a nerve. I mean, it wasn't Adira's fault she had to forego her elegance and effort at trying to be polite and hide her irritation, for she was, after all, still a respectable noble lady, and practically swore at her. How very unbecoming of her for a woman of her status. But it was very refreshing. I swear to God, I will really call you collateral damage if you don't stop. She vowed inside her head before pivoting on her heel and resumed her killing spree. The other decided to leave her be for a while and work her way to Kasumi's heart for the second time after successfully erasing traces of her from his memory. If you're wondering why she can still make her way closer to the man despite him finally reuniting with his woman, she, unfortunately, did not witness how Kasumi almost devoured Adira's lips and kept her caged in his arms, keeping her incredibly close he wished they would eventually. Phew so they never get separated again. Your Highness, please withdraw for now. You're hurt. She worriedly called out to him when she saw the dark red blotches on his uniform and yet he still moved vigorously such as that. However, the man could hear nothing. He was so absorbed with his battle that there was nothing entering in his field of focus but enemies and that beautiful goddess bathed with blood. It's the Maiden of Light. Kasumi heard one of the enemy soldiers exclaim and thought that they must have somehow figured out Hadira's nature. That he automatically moved his hands and slit the man's throat, personally sending the man to the afterlife as soon as he heard his words. Anyone that knew what Adira was needs to die. Of course, except for the two and a half men who already knew it beforehand. Kasumi spun around to check if anyone else heard what the soldier said when a disgustingly light pink-haired woman finally entered his vision field and he saw the worry. In her small and delicate face. Could they be? It really is the maiden of light. Another soldier exclaimed and took a step back as he cowered in fear while staring at Iris. Oh. So it was this woman that they spoke of. That's good. Yes. Now that you see that the Maiden of Light is on our side, do you think I'll allow you to live? You all saw how Adira slapped me. Twice. So all of you must die. And Iris, who listened to Kasumi's words, felt her heart give an extra loud thump and her cheeks flushed like ripened tomatoes. It was the first time she felt as such, the first time she felt her heart leap in joy. The first she felt butterflies soar in her stomach and the first that she felt such charring heat spread throughout her body. Kasumi brought up his sword and let his aura take the form of a blue dragon snaking around him very much like how Adira was with her fire and wing-like aura. And suddenly, a black mist surrounded him too, acting like a barrier, and he didn't fret nor even bat an eye. He knew whose work it was, and he could only smile proudly for his son willingly covering his back. My, so you finally acknowledge me, huh? Don't get cocky. I still don't like you. The dragon, who returned to his child form after exhausting himself, chatted while he watched the smug smack spreading across his father's beaten, yet still handsome, face. If his mother would not cry should anything happen to him, he would not cover for him or anything at all. Right? But I love you, little Heisa. Kasumi chuckled as he watched the child cringe uncontrollably and looked as if all he wanted was to vomit while repeatedly chanting you softly. Kasumi then promptly went back to slicing heads off and returned to his errand for his wife. He still needed to clean up. Although he was bearing the pain, he was still very much lively and raring to go that the enemy soldiers regretted why they did not kill him when they had the chance. Adira's appearance wasn't within their expectations. They didn't know that a noble lady such as her, a duke's spoiled daughter, no less, would jump right off the battlefield and swing a sword around. Women were meant for tea parties. So her presence here was an aberrant. They most especially didn't expect him to be revived the moment she arrived. How much control does this woman have on him anyway? But Kasumi had a miscalculation. By hiding his presence within Heisa's darkness, through coating himself with his dark aura as well, the hooded enemy was able to get close to Kasumi undetected and plunged a sword from the back and out his torso. Kasumi coughed out blood and finally felt the heavy backlash of all his wounds and profuse bleeding when his movements finally stopped and his adrenaline rush died down. The pains were hitting him all at once. 
You're getting way too ahead of yourself, aren't you Prince Casimir? Do you honestly believe what Lady Silveris said about not marrying Lord Dalriada? She could be baiting you for all you know. She could be lying to get you to move. She could be tied already to someone else. He tried to mess him up a second time. But such tricks don't work too well after having seen and experienced it once, especially not when he felt Adira kiss him back as passionately as he did. Gah. Her words are. My only truth. Whatever she says, I will believe. So if she tells me to jump then I will jump. If she tells me to die, then I'll kill myself. If she tells me that she didn't marry Dalriada, then she didn't marry him. Casimir's platinum orbs glistened with a dangerous light. He was still spry despite the numerous wounds he suffered that the hooded man could only choose his last resort, kill Casimir. He pulled a hidden dagger out from his back and brought it down to stab the man to death when he was stopped by Iris Blade. Let Casey go. She cried. Notes. This was a little late since I was so exhausted with all the exams I had to take today. So if I get the chance tomorrow, maybe I'll edit this a little bit. I just didn't want to miss a day where I can't give you my lovely babies an update. Praise me tilde tilde banza i.e. tilde tilde. I hope you all enjoy it. Adira's light. What's this? Did bugs enter your brain and chewed on it that you forgot what I did for you, Lady Latifolia? The man grimaced and glared at Iris, who was playing heroine for the first prince, before he pushed her off and threw Casimir aside while he pulled the sword out. I did not but that didn't mean I will allow you to kill him. She exclaimed and attacked the man. Iris lured the man away from Casimir so he doesn't get caught up in their fight and possibly suffer more injury or worst, die. Heisa, who was watching and making sure his mother and father were well protected while they worked together to kill the enemies, saw everything and immediately called for his mother. Mommy. He cried and pointed at Casimir's fallen form. Adira, in a heap of panic, let one powerful heat burst to shake the soldiers off her back and rush to Casimir's side. He was defenseless and bleeding too much. Casey. Eh, Adira. He coughed out her name as well as blood. Things were not looking good with him looking like that, with all those wounds and that blood. Sure. It'll be fine. Everything will be fine. Trust me. She said. But to her ears, it sounded more like she was talking to herself. She was repeating it in a soft whisper to calm herself. That everything was going to be fine and Casimir will live. My. Wife. Don't cry. I'm not crying. You're just seeing things. So shut up and behave. She roared with tears streaming down her face and Casimir smiled softly at her. She was still stubborn, it seems. Adira turned left and right and searched for someone that can help Casimir. Someone who can heal him. But as they were in the middle of war, and a little ways out the town now, they cannot bring in a healer as soon as possible. Iris. She's the Maiden of Light. She can help Casey. She searched for the particular lady. But when her eyes found the girl, she was locked in a sword fight with a formidable foe who wore a hood and did not look like he belonged to the Olynthi's people. Hi sir. Come. So she called for her son, to let him take Kasami back to the palace to be fixed. And the latter did not even think twice before coming out from his hiding place and to his mother's side. Take your father and go. Find someone who can heal him. But mommy you can. Cause your. Heisa halted when Kasimi took hold of his arm and he looked over to his father, who was enduring the pain from all of his wounds, and saw him lightly shake his head. His father didn't want him to tell his mother. What is it, baby? Your. Your fire. You can use the blue fire, right? I can help you hone it so we can close his wounds for the time being. Heisa. Deciding to follow his father for now, changed what he wanted to say. He'll have to ask him why after this so he cannot die. He cannot leave his mother and him. I might be able to trigger mommy's light attribute by unraveling the darkness I covered her with. But she'll be vulnerable and in plain sight at that moment. Should anything happen, please trust Heisa, mommy. The little child suddenly spoke before pulling his mother's hand to place it over Casimir's largest wound before placing his over hers. 
Adira watched the bright and clear eyes of her son and without further doubt or question, she nodded her head. Hysa searched for Adira's call with his mind's eye and found two. One was her phoenix fire call while the other was a dark and dim one, it was her light call that he covered with his darkness. He carefully and slowly unraveled his darkness over it and told Adira, Please start, mommy. Adira summoned her fire. She didn't know if she can summon the blue one but if Hysa says so, then maybe she can. She trusts him as much as she trusts her family and Kasumi and he was part of that family. She was about to start when a loud thudding rushed over to them that when she looked up, instead of seeing enemy soldiers rushing in to kill them, she saw the Vasilis knight surrounding them like a barrier. Princess, please take this. It was something my grandmother, a healer, gave me when she heard about me marching to battle, but I don't know how well it'll work. A soldier came close to Adira and gave her a white crystal. It was clear, almost like a glass, and she took it gratefully. She needed all the help she can get, after all. Thank you. She let her sentence hand to ask the man his name and he gladly gave it to her with flushed cheeks. It's Theodore, princess. Please call me, Theo. Thank you, Theo. Adira smiled kindly before turning back to Kasumi, who was not liking what he sees. Stop that. Here you are with wounds as large as this and you still have the time to be jealous. She scolded him again and Kasumi couldn't, doesn't want to argue with her. Else he'll just have another earful and he's had enough. Heiser looked at the crystal and had a eureka moment. His mother's light could amplify this crystal's effect to its maximum capacity and heal his father's wounds in one go. It was just perfect timing. This father really has the best luck, huh? Not only was he lucky for snatching mommy, he even got lucky and avoided his death. Or was it mommy's luck? Put it over his wounds, mommy. The little child exclaimed excitedly, like a child that found his hope to save his father, and Adira listened and immediately placed the crystal over Kasumi's wounds. She was happy that Heisa finally warmed up to Kasumi. However, she did not know how to activate it. Um, repeat after me, mommy. Oh Lux Media Contritus. Heisa spoke and Adira followed suit, not even questioning what it meant and how the child knew such language. She recited the exact same words and the crystal in her hands glowed brightly, almost blinding everyone that watched and had to turn or shield their eyes from it. When the light died down, Kasumi's wounds had all vanished and Adira stared at all of the crystal's healing effects. Wow. Theo, your grandmother's a great healer. She cheered and looked towards the confused knight with an amazed, relieved, and happy expression on her beautiful face. But how? That was just an ordinary mid-grade healing crystal that is the cheapest in the market. How can it have that kind of effect? The knight was asking himself before he felt eyes on him and he turned to both Kasumi and Heisa strangely staring at him sharply. Why are they looking at me like that? Scary tilde tilde tilde. The poor lad could only cry in his confused heart after being threatened for some unknown reason by the prince and his son, while some distance away, still engaged in his fight with Iris. The hooded man's attention was captured by the bright light in the middle of that ring the Vasilis army made and an evil grin spread across his face. There you are tilde tilde, notes. I'm so lazuai tilde tilde asterisk sob asterisk. I enjoyed everyone's comments and thank you so much. Thank you for the cheers and for always patiently waiting for the updates. And not pressuring your author. P.S. I did well on my exam. Banzai Tilda. As his wife, after having his focus directed somewhere else, Iris took the chance and pierced through the man's heart. Unfortunately, he was able to push her sword slightly and instead it stabbed through his abdomen. He smirked at Iris before bending closer to her ear to whisper. You've got some use after all. Thank you for leading me to the real one. Till our next alliance, Lady Latifolia. And he promptly facilitated his escape. After the Vasilis knights got their fighting spirit revived by watching Adira and their crown prince fight side by side, the Alinthi soldiers did not last long and were defeated thoroughly. Iris, who saw the unconscious just sleeping real man in the middle of that ring ran to his side in a ball of worry that she unconsciously pushed the little raven-haired child to the side with more strength. 
The mother's eyes, who was shocked to see this kind of rudeness to her cute little child, reddened in anger and landed a very strong slap stronger than the one she gave to her husband on the lady's face, which successfully made the other woman halt in her actions. To say that it surprised everyone might be an understatement, but they all understood why their princess flared like that. She just went full throttle angry mama bird on the other woman. Who do you think you are to push my son like that? Adira's voice was too sinister and dangerous that everyone even these strong and buffy knights felt cold chills run down their spine as they looked at that fiery, lividity burning in her ashen eyes. After witnessing her strength at this battle, they'd either be an idiot or an even bigger idiot to not be afraid of that anger. She was able to kill hundreds of Alinthi soldiers single-handedly. What is one noble lady to her? They all prayed for this maiden of lights or whatever soul when faced with this demoness. She looked like she could swallow her whole. Even if she was this rumored maiden of light, she was nothing in front of the ash demoness of the battlefield and the goddess of the empire. Why did you have to go and light the ash demoness fuse? They all commonly thought while silently watching things unfold not daring to step in the princess's way and be murdered instead. I mean, why should they risk their lives for her? I, I didn't see him. I was just too worried about Casey. And another strong slap landed on the other cheek. And who allowed you to call his highness with that name? Iris was speechless after taking the second slap which strength did not even weaken after the first one. What was wrong with her calling Kasimi with that name? Adira calls him Casey. So why can't she? And who allowed you to call him that way? She shamelessly blurted out which only incited another slap. Damn, this is fun and refreshing. I never got my past life's worth of slap so I'm giving it now. My husband did. As his wife, I have every right to call him whatever I want to. Even my dog should I want to. Adira spoke eerily calm while saying such ridiculous things that the men had this sudden urge to pray that they won't get caught up in this princess's fury. He hasn't married you yet. How dare you claim him as your husband? Oh dear, you're too late to the latest gossips, huh? I married him. Just now. And the woman, with a victorious smirk on her face, lifted her pretty white hands and flaunted a silver ring on her left fourth finger. So don't test my patience, Lady Latifolia. Adira started as she took nice and careful yet intimidating steps closer to Iris before she leaned closer and whispered, Or oh, I might bury a bitch very soon. And all the hairs on Iris' body stood like straight pins after hearing Adira's minatory and dark threatening voice filter through her ears. It was gradually filling her with immense fear. But, she wasn't a Latifolia if she backed down as easily as that. She was raised as the maiden of light the strongest, bravest and most powerful woman in this era. Not even Adira Silveris can scare her. You don't even know that he's done loving you. In the month that you were gone, he has loved me. To the words that this woman just spoke of, Adira could only snort mockingly and drew back. She wanted Iris to see just how high she stood right now. They weren't on the same level anymore like how they were on her past life when she successfully seduced Triton. This time, she stood way above her as Prince Casimir's fiancé. But she decided to humor that very ridiculous and funny notion of Casimir loving her. Granting, he may love you as impossible as that may sound but at the end of the day, Lady Latifolia, he still worships me. Oh how perfect Adira looked at that moment. Looking like the queen and the wife that she was, she leered and turned to leave the boiling speechless woman behind commanding the knights to help transport Kasumi back to the palace. She made sure it was very clear to Iris' eyes who held the power now who the people were submitting to and who was standing beside Kasumi. You won't be taking my spot, Iris. Not in this lifetime. She thought to herself and continued walking on. While Heiser, who walked while clutching his mother's hand, looked up to her and asked the one thing everyone's been curious about. Mommy. When did you marry daddy, right? Everyone thought commonly though they did not dare turn to face the lady, afraid that they may instead receive some residual furor from her bicker with the lady Latifolia just now. The woman giggled and brought a finger up to her lips before answering, shush, baby, that was just to keep her away. 
and Heiser, understanding what his mother meant although not really that much formed an O with his lips before giggling as well. It seems his mother was sly as well. Notes. I'm updating twice cause why not? I passed my exam so I'm happy. Anyway, there you go. I'm waiting for your comments people tilde 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 banza i.e. tilde. Phoenix Queen. As soon as Adira was sure that Kasumi was back in the palace and was already tended to, she turned on her heel and walked away. Haisa, who will go wherever she went, ran to catch up with her when they were stopped by a loud cry that called for the girl's name. Adira. The pair both turned around to see the distraught king, who hurriedly ran down the steps and practically almost flew to engulf both mother and child in his embrace. I'm sorry, dear child. This all happened because I said some misleading things. Please forgive this old man. Don't leave my son and grandson please. The king, who sat at the highest seat in the entire empire, begged for a duke's daughter's forgiveness. Not only that, he even begged in behalf of his son to not leave him. Your majesty, I'll give you anything you want. Anything. Just don't leave my son and cause him even more pain. Your majesty. Please calm down. Adira cried and patted the old man's back comfortingly. It seems as though Kasumi's tendency to headily jump to conclusions came from his father. And that brought a small smile to the girl's face. After making sure that the king was already calm enough to listen to her words, she spoke. Your majesty, I'm sorry but, I've long changed my mind about leaving your son. From the moment I last spoke to you. I've been constantly thinking about how to change your mind. Like making plans to conquer all neighboring kingdoms or giving myself to your son to hold him accountable for me and thus you won't be able to separate us. I was ready to carry his child to tie him to me but your son didn't want to. A shame, really. In the end, he let me go and allowed Triton to whisk me away. Adira confessed the thoughts she had as soon as she heard about the king's doubts on her that he mistakenly conveyed as him having second thoughts about tying Kasumi to someone like her. She understood though. If Iris really was the maiden of light then it would be a waste not to have her as queen, right? However, Adira didn't plan on backing down without a fight. In the end, she decided not to give up Kasumi to Iris. In the end, she chose to be selfish for the family that she loves. She can be queen for all Adira cared, however, that didn't mean she'll allow her to be Casimir's queen. Anastasius, who took Adira's words and tone differently, panicked. He really messed up this time, and he'll cause his own son's unhappiness. Please Adira, just stay for tonight. I'm sorry, your majesty, but I will not. I've been gone for far too long. My father and mother must be deeply worried about me right now. So I'll be going home now. Adira curtsied smoothly and deeply finally regaining her noble elegance and etiquette despite looking as messy as she looked right then. Are you planning on going home like that? Anastasius, desperate to get the girl to stay for a while and earn her trust and comfort again, pointed out the way she looked bloody and messy. Indeed. It would send her father or mother into an immediate cardiac arrest the moment they see her and it'll be bad. Especially her overprotective brother who blows his fuse and runs berserk even at the slightest paper cut. He'll probably bury the whole mansion underground as soon as he sees her appearance. The king, noticing her hesitation, immediately offered a warm bath and a fresh change of clothes without waiting for her words of approval or what. Of course, he also had the servants prepare some for his beloved grandchild. Come, hi sir. Grandfather will help you. He coaxed the child softly and gestured for hi sir to approach him. However, the child refuses to leave his mother. Not that you could blame him. The last he let go of his mother's hands and she was out of his sight, she came back not remembering him and denied him. The poor little boy was scared that if he lets go of her again, then something bad might happen again. And he cannot take such heartache anymore. No more. Baby, mommy will be quick, okay? Let grandpa take care of you and then mommy promises that we'll go home together. Okay. Adira, deciding to help the king, bent down to be of eye level to the child and cajoled him sweetly. Hi sir, who was very against this idea of separating from her again, wanted to shake his head and scream no. 
But he didn't want his mother to hate him if he acted like that. So he, with such difficulty, nodded his head. That's my good boy. Mommy will always be here. I'll pick you up when you're done, okay? The woman said and left the child a sweet kiss on his forehead before the king was able to peel him away. And to Heisa's relief and happiness, she stuck to her word. Triton, who managed to procure a horse and raced back to the capital, arrived after four tiresome and restless days and noticed the ruined houses being rebuilt slowly. It made him curious as to what transpired and asked a passerby, What happened here? Triton, wearing a hood over his head and wearing commoner's clothes, wasn't recognized by the passerby and the latter answered, The capital was under siege a few days ago and the first prince drove them off. Although he almost lost, luckily the Phoenix Queen arrived soon and fought back the invaders. Phoenix Queen? Yes, it's the Lady Silverus. Ash Demonis didn't fit her so the people changed it. Anyway, she was so damn powerful that she single-handedly fought off half of the invaders by herself. Phoenix Queen? Queen? What the hell? She's not your queen. She's not a queen. Triton thought to himself and turned around. He clenched his fists so tight, feeling the anger boil inside him, and threw a fist to the wall, unnecessarily causing damage. If you want to be a queen that bad, then I'll give it to you. I'll make you my queen. The Silverous Castle. Adira was lounging on her greenhouse with Hysa and Lypha playing on the side, while the latter fed the child sweets of his liking every now and then. It was the second day since they returned and the gloomy Silverous Castle had regained its radiance and life again. It was brimming with energy, happiness, and vivacity again now that their princess was back. She sipped on her afternoon tea as she remembered what transpired as soon as she stepped through the Silverous Castle gates. M.M. my lady, and Lord Hysa. The guards stood in attention with beaming happy smiles upon laying their teary eyes on this mother and son pair that finally returned home. Together, Adira only smiled and lightly bobbed her head in acknowledgement while Hysa waved his cute and chubby little hands at them with an adorable, genuine, happy smile on his face making his popularity among the servants and guards of the Silverous Castle skyrocket even more, spreading his territory and capturing even more hearts. This time, it took no effort. The pair walked on and was met with a haggard-looking Rami, with disheveled hair and clothes and panting heavily, as he looked like he just ran a mile. After he was informed of his little sister's return, before encasing her in a tight embrace, I'm so glad you're back. I'm very, very glad you're home. I'm sorry for worrying you, brother. Adira comforted the man while patting his back softly and patiently. She really shaves a few years off his life over and over again as she makes him worry relentlessly. It's okay as long as you're fine. You don't know how much and often you attract trouble. I think I'm close to losing my mind from the constant worry. I've gotten used to it, but that doesn't mean I condone your usual reckless behavior. The man inserted his woes that his sister couldn't help but laugh. He was her favorite out of everyone. He was her very kind, lovable, adorable and honest to a fault big brother. Uncle. Heiser wants upsy.